In Thessaloniki, Greece, several people consider a certain house to be very haunted. The house was said to have been the mansion of its previous owner, and today it has not been inhabited since it's dilapidated and the surrounding area has been transformed into a warehouse for building materials. It's rumored that those who have stayed there at night have heard terrible noises from ghosts roaming in the rooms, making them flee in terror. It is also said that the previous owner's building is accompanied by a curse that he put on it, and that anyone who lives there is in danger of going mad and anyone who tries to demolish it is in danger of dying. In the past, two contractors decided to demolish it, but on the day of the planned demolition, they suddenly died. One died from a heart attack, and the other was killed in a traffic accident in Athens. I don't have any personal experience with this house, but I don't think I want any. This is another story from my haunted house. This is about my youngest brother that I mentioned in part one. He's 10 years younger than me and has Asperger's syndrome. Everyone in my immediate family is 100% convinced that he's a medium. I think that's why our house is haunted, because I had a dream about that. I think they're drawn to him. Anyway, when he was maybe three or four, he was pretty developmentally delayed. He could speak, but he chose what he spoke about very carefully, and that was usually only his two special interests, Toy Story and the aliens that came to talk to him at night. There was a nursing home being converted into an antique mall in my hometown, and one afternoon, my mom went down there with my brother in tow to see about renting a space. The second they walked in the door, my almost nonverbal brother said, this place is haunted and was totally fascinated. He wasn't scared at all. He took off running through the halls while my mom spoke with the owner about rates. He eventually found his way back to my mom and would not stop tugging on her until she acknowledged him. When she spoke to him, he started telling her and the owner about all the ghosts that were there. He said that they were all old people and that they were really bored. He said one old man was quite weird. The owner actually verified this by saying multiple contractors had quit because they said it was haunted. Another example. My mom loves yard sales and would sometimes have estate sales for people for a profit. She had trouble finding a daycare that would accommodate my brother so he was usually with her. She had an estate sale for a lady that was referred to her by an acquaintance. While preparing for the sale, she purchased a gorgeous bedroom set that ended up being my bedroom set. After their sale, she met with whom she thought was the homeowner to pick up the bedroom suite. They were standing in the bedroom chatting when the husbands were disassembling the furniture, and my then seven-ish year old brother comes running in, saying that the sweet old lady in the kitchen gave him some cookies and that they were very delicious. My mom looked at the lady, who then burst into tears. She said that this was her mom's house, and that her mom had recently passed. The neighborhood kids always called her the cookie lady, and would often ring her doorbell in hopes of receiving a cookie, which she was always happy to provide. Such a sweet little quip. There are also darker stories from this house, but always nice to end on a bright note once in a while. I grew up in a haunted house. I have so many stories, but this one was on my mind today. Sidebar. Most of the encounters revolve around my brothers. I believe that my middle brother has abilities, and I believe that my youngest brother, who is also autistic, is a medium. I'm a little sensitive, but nothing like them. One particular evening, my teenaged brother and two of his buddies were hanging out at my parents' house and nobody was there but them. My brother got a phone call from a girl, so he went upstairs to his room, 
leaving the two friends downstairs. When he came back down about 15 minutes later, he found the house completely quiet and totally dark. The TV had been turned off and the lights as well. He said that the only light was the last little bit of dwindling daylight trickling through the windows and the glass on the front door. He started laughing and calling for his friends, thinking that they were hiding from him and playing a joke. He walked through the downstairs room by room, but couldn't find them. He started feeling really nervous, so he began trying to call his friends, but they weren't answering, and he couldn't hear their phones ringing from where he was. He went and checked upstairs to see if maybe they'd snuck past him and were hiding, but they were nowhere. By now, he said the entire vibe of the whole house had changed. He was feeling very anxious. He ran down the stairs and exited the front door directly across from the steps on the front porch, leaving the front door slightly open. As soon as he stepped outside, the front door slammed, and something from the inside of the house started banging on the door with great force and intensity. It really scared him, and he was also getting irritated, so he opened the door to confront his friends. He was laughing, saying, Oh, ha ha, okay, y'all got me. But inside, the house was silent and still. It was at that point that he heard a car door shut in the cul-de-sac, and he turned around only to see his friends arriving at the house. They told him that they had left when he took that phone call and ran to the gas station. They swore on their lives that they knew nothing about the door. So, I've never been the kind of person to believe in ghosts. I'm a non-religious guy, but I've seen some odd things in my 26 years. Nothing to convince me 100% that the paranormal is legit. However, I have one interesting experience that tends to get interest every time I tell it, and honestly, has made me question my stance on the paranormal ever since. About six years ago, I was a 20-year-old student living in London. My latest flat contract had run out, and I needed a place to live ASAP. I had very little money, and felt guilty needing my parents to be a guarantor, so, as any broke Londoner would do, I googled the cheapest place possible, somewhere I could move into that day or the next. That's how last minute this was. I was fortunate, or in actual fact, misfortunate, to find a place available to move in that day contract signed, I had a place to live. I moved into this detached house with all my stuff the following day. It was a dirty house, but the flat occupants were all 20 to 30 year olds, four of them, and very friendly. The area was quiet, and I felt reasonably comfortable. The house was always damp and cold. It was autumn, so it's not surprising, but it was always an unpleasant atmosphere. The garden was overgrown and creepy. The windows that faced it were scratched, cracked, and looked very dirty. The hallway lights didn't work, so the entire interior of the living room and hallways connecting to the rooms were pitch black at night. The bathroom was just something else. On my first night after speaking to one of my new flatmates, I was told that they have all experienced weird noises, especially scratching on the blackened window in the bathroom. I laughed this off as utter nonsense. Probably just a tree brushing it when it gets windy outside, I thought. So after a couple of weeks, I finally started noticing weird occurrences in the building. My room's window faced the driveway, and I liked to keep my curtains closed, just because it was west-facing and I didn't like the sunlight pouring in and blinding me every morning. So I would close the curtains in the morning, head to class, come home, and find the curtains opened more than halfway. This wasn't a one-time occurrence. This happened every day. In fact, I could come home from class, close them again, go out to work or see friends, and come home to open curtains. Yet when I was in the room for hours on end, 
they never moved. A bit weird, but whatever. My windows were closed and locked, and so was the bedroom door when I wasn't there, and I was the only one with the key, I hope. Above me was an attic, nobody lived up there. It was a locked storage room. But at night, I could hear what sounded like feet stomping, two people walking around, kids running, and sometimes whispers. Bit freaky, but I thought maybe someone in the house had access to this room and was using it at night, for who knows what. But no one was up there. The room was locked. I would sometimes go up at night and go to the door and try to get a sense of who the hell was in there, but no luck. I never saw anything, but I could always hear these footsteps. One of my flatmates was a very religious man. I could hear him praying at least five times a day, and he was always very friendly and open to talk about his faith, and to listen to me stress out about the awful state of the house. But he himself didn't hear or notice anything weird, other than the unhygienic state of the place. He decided at one point to head home to Algeria for a few months, with his room locked. After six to seven weeks of living there, one of the other occupants moved out, and a room was available there. I told a friend of mine that was as desperate as I had been weeks prior, and he moved in within a few days. Things were great. We worked and went to the same uni, so it was cool hanging out with a friend. I told him the stories. Due to his religious beliefs, he wasn't a believer in ghosts. And like me, he wasn't phased by the stories. But he began to notice oddities too. The same stomping noises upstairs. The scratching windows. My curtains opening on their own. He felt like he was being watched all the time. He noticed the shed in the garden had a broken panel and could easily imagine someone being inside sometimes watching us in the kitchen when we made food. Routine pest control opened the shed during a visit one day and found half a dozen dead rats and a pile of hollowed out bees in there. Creepy, but no monsters, right? My friend and I were eating dinner after work in the kitchen one night. I was facing him and the door to the hallway, while Steve was facing myself and the sliding glass door that gave access to the overgrown jungle garden behind. I remember him turning pale, jumping to his feet, and asking me in a very frightened tone, Can you come into my room? I laugh and asked why. He said, Seriously, can you please just come to my fucking room? It's not a joke. Then he bolted to his room like he was running away from something. I finished my sandwich with the last bite, didn't even think to turn around to see what he was so spooked about, got to his room, and he locked the door sat on its bed and turned on his PlayStation. After a few minutes, he calmed down, and as he started playing, he told me that he saw something in the garden. A woman in a white dress. She walked across the garden, half a meter from the glass, almost floated past, he said, and then she vanished. He kept repeating, we have to leave, we have to leave and that the noises were one thing, but that when you see something, everything changes. My room scarred him, and everyone else, the most. Another flatmate told us they thought they'd seen me in my room peering at them on the driveway through a 20 centimeter gap in my curtains one night. They said they saw the shape of a person's head. The only thing was, I wasn't there that night, or on any of those occasions mentioned, and I certainly don't peer at people through my window. After that, things got worse. Two nights after the kitchen incident, I'm woken up at around three or four in the morning. My friend is banging on my door in the pitch blackness of the hallway. I open it and he comes in shaking with fear, saying his bed was vibrating and moving and that he can't stay here any longer. The next day he speaks to a friend, he has a place to stay, so he packs up most of his stuff and he's gone. Within a few days, another person left, a little creeped out, but mostly annoyed with the poor state of the house. At this point, the remaining occupants and I are all looking for alternative living arrangements. Remember the religious guy that went back to Algeria? Well, he's been gone for months now and hasn't returned. 
the landlord makes a visit once a day, and he has a spare key, so he decides to inspect the room to make sure all is okay. So he opens it up and we go in. His room was amazing. It was warm, cozy, not damp or cold. It was honestly like a different house altogether. It was really nice, and I really don't know how to explain that. Finally, I had decided to move in with my partner, who had avoided this house the entire time I lived there, maybe visiting once or twice. She hated it, hated being there, and always felt uncomfortable. On my last night, I again heard weird noises, but this time in the hall. I was aware that I was home alone that night, as the only other flatmate left was on holiday. It was, as it always was, very dark when I opened the door. Nobody was there. I walked into the living room, and the window at the back that faced the side of the house was making weird scratching noises. I needed to use the bathroom, and as a necessity, I had to carry a flashlight to do the job during these hours. I walked into the bathroom, did my business, and as I'm zipping up my pants, my flashlight briefly shines over the window. For some reason, I looked, almost as if I was expecting to see something. I didn't. I walked out of the room, and I don't know why, but I decided to look at that window once more without the light. I saw the shape of a large man. I went back to my room and locked the door. All night, I heard feet stomping upstairs in the attic. I couldn't sleep, so I moved all my things into a pile in the middle of the room, sat on the bed, and waited for sunrise. I got a taxi first thing in the morning, and finally got the hell out of there. And whether I believe in anything paranormal still or not, you couldn't pay me to go back. I love haunted walks. I've been on at least six or seven that immediately come to mind. I come from a long line of, let's say, paranormally sensitive women, so I've been experiencing the unexplained my entire life. Not constantly, but often enough that, hey, it happens. So when I go on a haunted walk, usually the people I'm with are watching me as much as they're watching the dark corners of the room. A few years ago, I used to run a hotel. It was a vintage building that had been around since the 1800s, but I'm sad to report that nothing paranormal ever happened in the hotel. Despite its age and unique history, I checked every single room of that building every single day, completely alone, and I never saw any evidence of the paranormal at all. No guest ever reported anything weirder than the crappy AC not working, because the owner was too cheap to replace it. Once we had a maid claim that the largest suite was haunted, and she refused to ever set foot back in there, but I honestly think she just wanted to permanently get out of having to clean the biggest room we had. So I'm sorry to say it guys, but I have zero scary stories about the hotel. The point is that I used to run a hotel, and as a hotel manager, I would often get free or discounted tickets to events and tourist attractions around the city. These tickets were meant to be used by myself and our front desk staff, so that if a guest ever asked what fun activities in the city should I make sure to see during my stay, the staff could honestly recommend places that they'd definitely been to and give them a genuine account of how they enjoyed their experience. One October, I received tickets to the haunted tour that always appears during the few weeks leading up to Halloween. My front desk manager and I were the only two who were brave enough to go. I had already been on several haunted walks across our country, and she had heard a few of my spooky experiences, so she was very eager to come too. Plus, we had become best friends. It was great to hang out together outside of work. We'll call her Allie. My husband, of course, came as well, as he's always my sidekick during haunted walks. 
The tour we decided to take included a walking tour of haunted locations in town, and finished with an internal tour of the most famously haunted house in our city, possibly in our country. To protect privacy, I won't tell you the name of the house, but we'll call it the Governor's House. The walking tour before the big event was, as always, very awesome. Very interesting stories, but since we didn't actually go into any of the reportedly haunted houses, nothing truly exceptional happened. I do remember that I had the growing urge to pee. At one point, I actually swallowed my pride and asked our tour guide if we'd be seeing any haunted coffee shops so I could pop in to use the washroom. But much to my horror, she said, Oh, sorry, no, but uh, there's a bathroom in the governor's house and the plumbing still works, so you can use that. I don't think the caretakers will mind. With a blank stare on my face, I looked at her and hesitantly replied, uh, That's okay, I'll hold it. But by the time we got to the house, holding it wasn't an option. She gave us a brief history of the house and a retelling of the reported paranormal events. Apparently, the governor and his wife lived in the house. They ran the city, until one day, an angry mob of townsfolk broke in, ransacked the place, and murdered them both. Since then, the caretakers who used to reside in the house have experienced a lot of unexplained noises, objects moving on their own, and, worst of all, being violently shaken or slapped awake in the middle of the night, but then opening their eyes to see nobody there. Needless to say, they no longer live in the house. Absolutely bursting with urgency, the first thing I did when we got into the house was lock myself in the first bathroom I saw. It was absolutely tiny, very dark, and definitely the last creepy place I wanted to be without pants on. Not to my surprise, there was no line to use it. Half jokingly, I said, Okay, ghosts, just hold off for a few minutes, let me have my privacy, and then you can do whatever you want after. I should really know better than to offer spirits a deal. When I emerged from the bathroom, everyone on the tour looked at me like I was crazy for going in there alone. Apparently, each of them would have gladly chosen to pee their pants. The guide gave us permission to walk around the house freely, as long as we were careful not to break or take anything. Allie was eager to have her first ever ghost encounter so the first thing she did was make us go down into the basement. One of the stories that the guide told us about was a rocking chair that was known to rock on its own, so Allie was determined to find it. And, since nobody else was willing to go down into the basement, we had it completely to ourselves. Once we were downstairs, we saw three rooms. One was just a closet of mops and other cleaning supplies, to the left of it was an archway leading into a pitch black room. I thought it strange that this was the only room in the house that didn't have its lights on. And to our immediate left at the foot of the stairs was a kitchen, which also had its own archway to the dark room. We decided to explore the kitchen first since we could clearly see in there. I loved all the vintage plates, but Allie was fixated on finding a ghost and made a dash, alone, straight into the dark room. I sighed and followed behind her. The room was so dark that as soon as you entered it, you couldn't see your hand right in front of your face, which was weird because it was right next to the brightly lit kitchen through a large open doorway, but no light dripped in. You could turn around and see the entire kitchen, and you could see the faint street lights through the window but the actual room itself was pitch black. Not wanting to accidentally bump into and break any priceless antiques, I took out my camera and started to aimlessly snap photos to get the light from the flash. It didn't occur to me until this moment that I probably should have used the flashlight app on my phone, but during creepy moments, you're prone to make quick and odd decisions. Every time I snapped a photo, I got a blink into the room. It was a dining room with a large wooden table dead center. But it wasn't really the furniture that caught my eye. 
It was footprints. It's hard for me to really explain it, but every time I took another photo, I could see large, bright blue footprints on the floor, two at a time, making their way around the table, coming closer. After about four or five photos, I was pretty sure that I saw what I saw, so I backed up, back into the kitchen, back into the light. My husband and Allie looked at me. I never noticed Allie pass me to go back into the kitchen. They said my face was pale, and they asked me what happened. All I said was, I'll trick him, and I dashed to the other archway that led into the dark room from the hallway, expecting to snap a photo of the full body of the entity waiting for me near the kitchen. But I was so wrong. The only one that was about to be tricked was me, because when I took that last picture and the camera flashed, all I could see was a bright blue flashing right up in my eyes, only an inch from my face. He was right there, right in front of me, and he was smarter than I was and wanted to make sure that I knew it. I stumbled back and went straight up the stairs, repeating, I'm sorry, you win, I'm sorry, you win. Allie and my husband quickly followed. Despite the weird encounter seconds earlier, we still wanted to see the rest of the house. So after I had had a chance to catch my breath and tell them what had just happened, we made our way upstairs to the bedrooms. Upstairs was uneventful. They were small rooms that were chained off to stop visitors from breaking anything. After that, we left and stood out under a streetlight out front of the house to recount our experience. While my husband and Ali chatted, I decided to take one last photo at the property, this time from outside. I didn't notice it at first, but while we were in the house, every light in the house was on, except for the dark room in the basement. But now, not two seconds later, looking into the house from the outside, it was reversed. Every light in the house was off, except for the dark room in the basement, where I could clearly see the rocking chair on the other side of the dining room table by the window. Another strange thing that happened that night was that absolutely none of the photos I took in that house were actually saved on my camera, not a single one. My husband had even worse luck, as he told me that the moment he walked into his house, his fully charged camera just completely died. A flat, empty battery the moment he crossed the threshold. But the most terrifying thing I saw that night was that picture I took from outside the house. If you had looked up to the second story window in the master bedroom, there are two distinct bright yellow eyes floating in the darkness of the house, staring directly at us down on the street below. When I showed this picture to my husband, he was so freaked out by it that he asked me to delete it immediately because he didn't want it in our house. Being sneaky, I remember saving it on Facebook before I deleted the photo from my phone so that I could share it with my friends. But after Halloween that year, I haven't been able to find that photo since. It's completely vanished and no one I know can find the copies that they saved of it either. Before this, I had never experienced anything ghostly, except some chills and some shadows, before I moved into this house with my cousin. We were both going through divorces, and she needed a house with rooms for her kids, and I couldn't afford anything on my own. We found a 100-year-old house to rent, with four bedrooms. It had a yard, and a garage, and it was perfect, and affordable. We moved in the day after the eclipse, and it was full of bright summer light, and I was excited. We couldn't get my cousin's bed up the stairs, so she spent the first night with her friend, and I was alone in the house. I couldn't sleep. I was paranoid somebody would break in. It wasn't in a great neighborhood, and the house had several entry points. I got up around midnight for a drink of water. I was looking through the kitchen window and could see a basement window. I saw a light flick on in the basement. 
and I froze. I locked the door to the basement stairs and I called the cops. Clearly, somebody was in the basement. The cops came, guns out of the holsters, apparently there was a nearby robbery, and searched the entire house. They found nobody. I wasn't too spooked at that point because it's a really old house, you know? Stuff creaks and cracks and shoddy electrical work was probably the culprit. The next week, I could hear my cousin upstairs when I woke up. My cousin was getting ready. I made some extra coffee and left for work without seeing her. I mentioned that she left the coffee pot on and she acted surprised. Turns out she wasn't home. I would constantly hear footsteps upstairs when nobody was there. I hear them so clearly on the staircase that I think for sure I'll see somebody walking down it, but I never do. It was manageable during the day, it didn't seem that scary, but at night I was terrified. I would often be in the house alone, trying to sleep. I could hear all kinds of sounds, kitchen cabinets shutting, doors opening and closing, footsteps. Also just that intense feeling of being watched. About twice a week I would experience sleep paralysis. I would feel like somebody was standing next to my bed and I couldn't move to look at them. Then I would snap out of it after what felt like hours and I would just be drenched in sweat. This would happen to my cousin too. I had my friend stay the night with me because eventually I just couldn't handle it. My friend had sleep paralysis and felt like somebody was next to her that she couldn't see. We got up and checked the house after we heard footsteps around 3am and again found nothing. One night after getting home late, I worked two jobs. I walked in and my hair stood on end. It was a full blood supermoon that night and my cousin was at her full moon circle so the house was empty. I hear something move behind me, and then a man's voice said, Hello. I know it sounds horribly cliche, but that's what I heard, and it was like somebody was in the room with me. I jumped out of my skin and ran from the house. It took me a while to go back. I spent a few nights at my boyfriend's house. My cousin was in the kitchen when a cabinet slammed shut right next to her. She couldn't recreate it. She heard something call her name while she was in her bedroom, and one night she heard her daughter talking to someone, begging them to let her sleep. When she asked who her daughter was talking to, she said, the spirit. The sleep paralysis, the footsteps, the doors, the intense vibes all continued. The activity picked up with the moon cycle. I never believed in anything really, but after this house I have realized that ghosts are real, and I believe they feed off energy. I never experienced sleep paralysis before living in that house, and I haven't since. This sounds insane, but I believe that somehow the trauma we experienced during our divorces opened up some kind of door. I feel like I was constantly seeping out anger and fear in that house, and that I fueled something. I feel like I have figured out how to close that door. I'm aware of spirits now, but I don't acknowledge them. I just shut my door and let them pass. I had night terrors from age 3 to 11. I feel like the theory that the Insidious movie laid out is really not that far off. I'm an empath. I can feel other people's emotions in the room with me. Most people can, on some level, they just don't usually think that much about it. I feel like all of these things play together somehow. I know some of my friends don't believe me at all, and I don't blame them, but I am a little bit offended if I'm honest. I'm usually the planner, the one who's organizing everything, and I always have my shit together. I'm just wondering if anyone has ever experienced anything like this, or knows what I'm talking about. My name is Jordan. I was a young kid of seven years old when this all started. I have an older sister by one year. I'll call her Jess. We were both being raised by my mother. She began a relationship with her boyfriend that we'll name Derek. 
we moved into a house in West Bountiful, Utah. The house sat near a horse farm, which sat north from the house, away from the road about 50 yards from the back door. The house had two wagon wheels buried into the ground halfway for decoration, sitting near the street. We had an elderly lady as a neighbor who lived to the east of us. The next house east was my friend Brian's house. The house was kind of old, but still in good shape. Walking into the front door led you into the living room. The stairs to the right led upstairs, where the bathroom was first on the left, followed by my sister's room to the right, then my mom's room on the left, and my room on the right at the very end of the hall. Past the living room was a kitchen that to the left led to the driveway and to the right led downstairs to another living room. This was adapted into a place where I had my Nintendo 64 set up on a tiny TV. While going down the stairs, there was a crawl space to the right next to the furnace. Since I was seven, I can't recall how long we lived in this house before things started becoming strange. But to my mom and sister's recollections, the first oddities we noticed was that deep into the night, the toilet would flush randomly. I never noticed this since my room was farthest from the bathroom, but my sister and mom were both convinced that I was being mischievous and doing it. I do remember them asking me if I really needed to pee last night, but I said that I didn't know what they were talking about as I hadn't left my room. Weeks later, the toilet flushing became a common occurrence at night. I heard it happen as I was walking to the bathroom one night, so I turned around and went back to bed, obviously nervous. The next day, Derek said it had to be pressure in the sewer causing our toilets to flush. I took his word strongly since I thought he knew all things about plumbing. But the toilet flushing started to become boring, I assume, for after a pause in the activity, the faucets in both the bathroom and the kitchen were both suddenly blasting water out of them. The knobs opened up completely. Derek sprang awake to the sound of rushing faucets and quickly shut them off. After he turned off the kitchen faucet and was walking back upstairs, the toilet flushed as he passed by the bathroom. I slept through this entire ordeal, but my mom said that it pissed him off so much he actually kicked the bathroom door. The faucets joined the toilet in becoming a common plaything at night, and all of us felt pretty uneasy about it. I'm not sure in which order the next parts of the story should go, but all of this happened in the span of about a year, six months into living in that house. My friend Brian came over, and we were playing Smash Bros on my Nintendo 64 in the basement. After several matches, he needed to use the bathroom, so he got up and ran up the stairs. I kept playing. He came running down the stairs. I thought he was excited to keep playing, but he stood there next to me, breathing heavily. His eyes were as wide as dinner plates. He stumbled over his words and asked if there was something wrong with my bathroom. Before I could say anything, he starts frantically explaining that the toilet flushed right before he got to the door, and that as he was done and was leaving, the faucet turned on full power right behind him. I told him that that's happened many times before, but only at night. Brian wanted to go back home after that. He didn't even look back as he walked down the street. I was sad. I was sure that Brian wouldn't want to hang out anymore after the house had scared him. This was, from what I recall, the first time that somebody from outside the house experienced its oddities. I told my mom about it, and she said that it was strange it had happened in the daytime. There were other times that my sister and I would stay weekends with our dad, every other weekend usually. On one of these weekends, my mother and Derek were in bed. She can't recall what time at night it was, but out of her sleep, she could hear the soft sobbing of a woman. She laid there half asleep, wondering if she had left the TV on in the living room. But the sound wasn't coming from downstairs. It seemed to be coming from the room they were sleeping in. The sobbing became more pained and louder. 
Derek bolted awake, thinking that my mom was hurt. But then they both just sat there in silence as the sobbing turned into a cry of unimaginable pain, as if the woman was either being tortured or in pain of losing a child. Derek quickly got dressed, saying that the neighbor lady next door might be hurt and might need help. He ran out the front door and over to the neighbor's house, but by the time he got to her door, there was no screaming or crying. He slowly walked toward the house and the crying got louder. There was no mistake that it was coming from our house. Derek checked every square inch of the house when he got back, but there was no one in it except for him and my mother. As soon as it had appeared, it stopped. My mom says that that was one of the hardest nights sleep in her entire life. One that I was present for happened about a month after the night of the crying woman. It is, of course, the dead of night, and we're all sleeping in our rooms. Suddenly, my mom and Derek were awoken by a blinding light, as bright as a lighthouse. My mother and Derek sprang up and tried to find the light switch in the house, but as they flipped it on, the light stayed. Derek thought it was a semi-truck shining its brights through their window, but as he opened the window, he realized that their window faced the horse farm. They had no window facing the streets at all. As soon as he spun back around from looking outside, the light died out. I remember the commotion afterward. Derek was running all over the house in a panic. He checked the fuse box, grabbed his tools, and tore apart their light fixture at 3 a.m., trying to find any logical explanation and shouting in frustration the entire time. My mother would stay up late most nights. She loved her horror movies and crime shows, so she'd watch them while we were asleep. It wasn't far from midnight when my mom heard the voices of children giggling. The only light on in the house was the TV. She assumed that my sister and I were trying to scare her, so she pointed at the stairs and said, both of you go to bed now. The giggling continued for a little longer before my mom stood up and marched up the stairs, but no one was there. The giggling, though, was getting louder. She finished climbing the stairs and opened my sister's door, only to find her fast asleep in her bed. She checked into my room and found me the same way. After she went down the stairs again, the giggling finally stopped. My mom claims that afterward, she sat there and thought of the woman crying for a while before this occurrence and thought that these children giggling had some morbid connection. My mom caught the elderly neighbor one morning in her driveway and asked if she knew anything about our house. The lady said she lived on that street for half of her life and never heard or saw anything bad happen inside of the home. Just families moving in and out over the years. We never looked further into this theory. The time passes and we now refer to our ghostly friends as the kids and the lady. The kids loved to play around in mine and my sister's rooms. They'd open and close our closets, slam my sister's hope chest to startle us, and still loved to play with the toilet at night. Of course, now being eight years old, I had a constant uneasy feeling in that house. My mother would assure me that our ghosts were a happy family that needed a place to stay, but this didn't settle my fears at all. I had grown accustomed to having multiple light sources in my room, a lava lamp, two plasma balls, and a fiber optic light. All of them were on the headboard of my bed, and I needed these on at all times to feel comfortable enough to sleep. When they were on, I never had anything bad happen in that room. My mom and Derek understood that I needed them on and never touched them while I slept. But from time to time, I would wake up and find that some, if not all of my lights had been switched off. Not just the power strip they were plugged into, but the little manual clicky knobs on the wires themselves had been turned off. I'd usually wake up late into the night to pitch darkness and scramble out of fear to get all of my lights back up and working. One night, after turning them all back on, I noticed the closet door, which had been closed when I went to sleep. 
it was wide open, but that was all. The next part is rather hard for me. Even as I tell this story now, I have goosebumps all over. I had a very gruesome dream that I could only describe as a horror that no young boy could ever dream of on his own. I was sitting in a room in the house in dress clothes, and I was crying. Loud bangs to the door of the room, and a hellish scream echoed through the empty room, and I huddled into a corner and screamed. The room went dark with a shadow as the door opened. I couldn't see what was in the doorway, but I kept screaming for whatever it was to stay away. Silence fell. For what seemed like an hour, I sat there in the corner, staring at the blackness of the door. Suddenly, people came walking through the shadows. They were all of my family, from my mom and dad to my sister and even a couple of cousins. I didn't leave the corner to greet them. They all just stood there, staring at me with pale faces and glazed eyes. My sister smiled eerily at me and would take stiff steps toward me. I would scream, and she would step back and giggle. My dad walked up to me, towering over me. As he knelt down to my level, his eyes went from glazed and dull to being a void of darkness with small glints of light for pupils. I cowered in fear, turning my head from him. He then grabbed the top of my head and forced me to stare him in the face. Then he said, you have to say your goodbyes, or they're going to be lonely in heaven. Jess screamed in a shrieking voice as my dad grabbed me by my ankle and held me upside down. I was equal height to his face now, and I could see all of the faces of my relatives at that moment. They all had the same eyes as my dad, but had gaping and bleeding mouths, almost like their jaws had been nearly torn off. They all chanted the word, Heaven over and over as they carried me into a living room where a bed was set up. In the bed was a corpse. It was my sister. Still held by the ankle, they held me above her corpse. I remember every detail of her face. Her skin was olive green and white. It was cracking in places, and her eyes were cold and cloudy and lifeless. I stared at her face in shock and disbelief. One of her eyes moved and stared back at me before she suddenly sprang from the bed and wrapped her arms around me, pulling me into the bed. She screamed and shrieked as she wrapped her rotting fingers around my neck and began to choke me. I screamed with my last breath for somebody to come to my rescue, but at the last moment I saw my sister placing her thumbs over my eyes and pressing in. I felt the pain of my eyes popping, and all I could do was scream. I was suddenly woken by my mother. I was apparently shouting in my sleep and flailing uncontrollably for several minutes before she got me to open my eyes. Not to my surprise, my lights were all off. I could barely see my mom's face as she held my head in her arms. I was in complete shock. I was shaking violently, unable to speak starting my gaze over every inch of the room, looking for the demons that nearly had me. I struggled to grab my mom's arm and stuttered, asking where Jess was. At that moment, Jess, who had been awoken by the noise I was making, flipped on the light as she walked in. Upon seeing her, I broke into a nervous breakdown. I tried to crawl away from her, still choking on absolute terror and unable to scream. I grunted and wheezed at her, tears pouring down my face like a waterfall. My mom told Jess to go back to bed. Jess left the room, and my mom asked me if I wanted to stay the night in her bed. I couldn't answer. I was still in shock. She picked me up out of the bed and took me into her room and put me in the spot next to her. She threw blankets over me and said to try to get some sleep. I laid there, shaking like a leaf the dream playing on repeat through my head as I trembled. Not even being near my mom made me feel safe at that point. I remember being like that for hours afterward. The exhaustion finally caught up to me, and I fell asleep once again. My mother says that when she looked at me the next morning, 
she noticed that I had slept through the remainder of the night with my eyes open. I woke up a couple of hours later in a haze. My entire body felt heavy and weak. I made my way downstairs to where my mom and sister were. They asked me what I dreamt about. It all flooded into my head again, and I started crying hysterically. It would be several years later when I finally told them what the dream had been about. My mother called my school and let me stay home that day. She asked if I was hungry, but food was the last thing on my mind. She led me to my room and said I should have a nap since it's daytime and things will be more peaceful. I laid in my bed under the covers and wept. A chill ran through my spine, and I stopped crying. Listening carefully, I could hear the whisper of a child. Shh, don't worry, it'll be okay. I laid there frozen. I slowly pulled the blanket from over my eyes, only to witness my closet door slowly closing itself. I stared at it quietly for some time before hopping out of bed and running down to the living room. I didn't tell my mom about the closet or the whisper. I knew she would just blame them on the dream I'd had. So I kept that one a secret for a couple of years. My mother believes me now, though, now that I've told her everything while we were sharing our experiences. Weeks later, my Aunt Dana stayed with us for a week. It was a weekend where we were going to my dad's house. My mom and aunt were alone in the house while Derek was at work. My mom was watching General Hospital, and my aunt was using the shower. My aunt came running down the stairs out of nowhere, pale as a ghost. She asked my mom if she had walked into the bathroom a moment ago. My mom said no, of course not. My aunt described looking through the foggy shower door and seeing a woman with blonde hair in the bathroom staring at the mirror. My mother has brown hair. She then turned and walked out without making a sound or speaking a word. My aunt stared back up at the bathroom and said, There's something very wrong with this house. She's not the only one who's ever said those words. I got my friend Brian to stay the night at my house with the promise of late night gaming. He remembers the incident from before and asked how it was living in a haunted house. I said it's not all that bad, jokingly, of course. I didn't tell Brian about any of my personal stories in fear that he might end our friendship over it. The night hit about 11 p.m., and we switched from games to cartoons. We both fell asleep with the glow of my tiny TV upon us. Everything was fine, until I was shaken awake by Brian. He was hysterical. He grabbed me and pulled me close and said, I hear them. They giggle at me when I'm sleeping. There's something wrong with this house. I want to go home. Please let me go home. His scream woke up my mom, and she ran down the stairs to find Brian hyperventilating. She grabbed all of his belongings and walked him out of the house after he calmed down and down the street to his own house. She came back and said that Brian's dad didn't want his son to come over anymore just to get scared to death. I don't really blame him. He still came over sometimes, but he never stayed the night again and he especially avoided the basement from that time on. There were a couple more parts to the story, but they played out in similar fashion to most of the other activity. My mom's relationship with Derek came to an end, and we were packing up stuff to move to a different city. After all of our belongings were removed, we walked slowly through parts of the house, talking about our stories of creepy happenings. My sister and I, feeling a bit brave due to us leaving and never coming back, had a surge of courage to ask the kids if they liked playing with us. It was dead silent in the house. My sister and I giggled to each other and said they probably hated playing with us because we were annoying. My mom says she felt something a bit different, almost like there were a couple of people who were sad to see us go. Derek also felt the same vibe. But after two years in the house in West Bountiful, we left. My mom and I still bring up the stories from time to time. We both get goosebumps from the blinding light story, and she's blown away by how terrible my dream was. I recently revisited that dream a month ago, not to my choosing, of course. Played out the exact same as that night when I was eight years old. 
Only this time I woke up calmly and shook it off. It was after that dream that I decided to write about what I can only describe as a ghost story. It may appear as fiction to many, but to us, it was a living reality. It saddens me that we didn't do more research into the house to see if there was ever a problem or a tragedy there. I don't live far from there currently, but there's a good chance that the house and many others were demolished in a housing project. Either way, I feel it's best left as it is, a creepy story. I'm 26 now and I have a love of horror movies and creepy places. Maybe my exposure to these terrifying events flipped a couple of adrenaline switches in my head. I still don't have a definite answer as to whether ghosts really do exist, but I can't deny what we went through in the West Bountiful House. My parents bought a home when I was just two years old, and they owned it until I was 13. From the ages of two to seven, I had countless experiences of the paranormal. Figures, noises, things being moved, people whispering my name, singing, and in true Annabelle style, toys moving on their own while being surrounded in a strange blue light. The experiences above have nothing, and I mean nothing, on those I had later on in life. For a while, my parents were divorced, during which time I rarely stayed in the house, and I always dreaded going there. To my distress, when I was ten, my parents reconciled, and we returned to the home. This is when the true nightmares began. For those who have experienced the paranormal, there's something truly unsettling about feeling like you're not alone, but it's another thing to be touched. Yes, physical contact from something you cannot see, hear, or comprehend has to be the most terrifying thing. Not long after moving back to the house, I was home alone and practicing the piano. The house was a split level and I was in one of four downstairs rooms. The door to the guest room where our keyboard was, was closed and there was a window that was near the ceiling. The window was at the ground level of the outside, so if I stood up on the opposite side of the room, I could see the front lawn. The piano was directly under the window, and there I sat playing some mindless scales to warm up. Not long after I started to play, I felt a sense of unease that, ironically, I was rather used to. Figuring it was just that eerie, home alone feeling that every kid experiences, I kept playing and I didn't stop. Until I felt something touch my back. Too scared to turn around, I looked up to the reflection of the window, which I couldn't see much of from my angle, and I saw nothing. It was dark out, so the window was acting as my mirror, ensuring me that there was nothing there. My mind was clearly playing tricks on me, right? I kept playing. Then, as if I were at the barber, I felt all of my hair be lifted up and sectioned. I looked up again to the window to see the reflection of the tips of my hair floating. At this point, I'm completely frozen and ready to just succumb to my fate. I closed my eyes tight and kept my hands on the piano keys. Almost as quickly as the moment started, it stopped. Although I never felt cold, the room instantly began to get warmer, as if the temperature had been lower, and I reached my hands behind my head. At this point, I felt alone. I felt nobody behind me either, so I was starting to feel better. But when I touched my hair, my heart dropped. My hair was completely braided. Safe to say I dashed out of that room into my neighbor's house until my parents came back. That wasn't the last experience I had there, but it was definitely one of the most visceral.
I have a pretty interesting story to tell about my childhood house. I lived in this house when I was around 5 through 14 years old. It was quite an old house in the Cornish town of Falmouth. I believe it was called the Tregenver House. I'm getting a little bit off topic, but I'll tell you what happened and why we moved. For around the first four years we lived there, we never experienced anything paranormal or weird, apart from stuff which everyone experiences, like creaking floorboards at night, things like that. I remember that it was a few weeks until my 10th birthday, and I was really excited, as every little kid is when it's their birthday. So one night I'm staying up thinking about the toys that I'm going to get. This was a while ago, so I mainly wanted Pokemon related things. I heard some creaking and heavy footsteps outside of my room. I stepped out to see what was going on, presuming that my parents had gone to get something to eat, and I also wanted something to eat, so I wasn't suspicious of anything. When I opened my door, it's right in front of the flight of stairs connecting the first floor to the second, the sounds completely disappear, so I run into my parents' room to see if they're there, and they're both fast asleep in their bed. At this point, I'm scared out of my wits. I step out of their room, and at the end of the hall, to which all the rooms on the second floor are connected, I look down to the end where there's a spare room next to one of the bathrooms. The door is swinging slightly ajar. I bolt into my room and pulled out my Swiss army knife. I buried myself in my covers, preparing to defend myself from whatever the hell was in my house. Every Wednesday on the lead up to my birthday, I'd hear the same footsteps coming up the hall at the same time, give or take a half an hour. But after my first experience, I never went out again. I know this doesn't explain the reason for moving in and of itself, but many other things happened in that house, and we ended up moving because of it. Every town has its own creepy stories and urban legends. My small Midwest town had the Salem House. The story was that in the 1800s, a Civil War veteran and his family lived there. One night, he just snapped and killed his entire family before hanging himself in the barn. People who visited always talked about getting cold chills, seeing shadowy figures, having car troubles, the list goes on and on. My friends and I, being big into the paranormal, decided to check it out one night. I knew it was a creepy area of town, but I don't think I could have ever prepared myself for what happened that night. The whole road that is home to the Salem House is pretty creepy. It's in the middle of the country and very dark. About halfway down the road, the whole area becomes surrounded by woods. The night we visited, as soon as we got to the wooded area, I was overcome by fear. I tried to convince my friends to turn around and go back, but they told me that we were already too far along and I couldn't chicken out now. Soon after driving out of the wooded area of the road, we turned onto a long dirt driveway, the driveway to the Salem house. My boyfriend, Kyle, stayed in the car with me while Haley, Mike, and Lily went out to explore the barn. Kyle and I sat in silence for a bit and just watched them head out. Once they disappeared into the barn, I got that overwhelming fear again. This time it came with a sharp pain though, as if somebody was scratching my back very hard. Kyle asked me what was wrong and I told him what was happening. He lifted up the back of my shirt and told me that there was nothing there. Moments later, I hear the loud scream of Haley as she, Lily, and Mike come running back to the car as if they were being chased. We start the car, and just before pulling away, several handprints of different sizes created smudges on the windshield. We stayed silent the entire way home. I finally told them all about how I felt like I was getting scratched, and to my surprise, this time when they checked, my back was covered in scratches. 
Although this was about three years ago, we never really bring up our experiences at the Salem house, though I have asked several times what spooked my friends so badly. They never would answer me, and thinking about it now, I think that's for the best. When I was around nine, a few of my cousins came to sleep over at my house. Since we couldn't all fit on my bed, we decided to sleep on the floor near the door to my bedroom and all share one giant blanket. Sometime during the night, I woke up to somebody tucking in the covers around me. I thought maybe my dad had seen us while on the way to the bathroom and maybe we had kicked off the covers as I was prone to do at the time. I opened my eyes to say something to my dad, and although I could still feel the tucking in of the blankets, there was nobody there. Nobody was tucking us in, yet I could very clearly feel the hands pushing the blanket in around me. I was in the middle of the pack, and I looked to see if any of my cousins were awake or fidgeting, and also to see if they were observing what was going on. But they were all sound asleep and motionless. My little kid logic told me to close my eyes and whatever it was would never know that I had woken up. So that's what I did. I laid there silent and still for what seemed like 10 minutes or so while I felt the blanket move as invisible hands went down the line and tucked each and every one of us in that night. It wasn't the most exciting brush with the paranormal, but since I don't remember much of my life before I was 10, it's my very first memory of anything weird like that. What's interesting is that my dad believes that there's a spirit too. He even credits it with saving my life. Something shoved him really hard once while he was standing in the yard. It shoved him so hard that he fell over. When he looked back to see who had pushed him, nobody else was in the yard. But that's when he saw me desperately trying to get his attention from the window on the second floor. I was three years old and I was having my very first asthma attack. If he hadn't looked behind him to see what had shoved him, who knows what would have happened. Whatever it was, it eventually moved on. We lived out of the state for a few years and rented the house to one of my aunts and her family. She also saw this thing regularly while they lived there and so did my uncle. When we moved back and they got a new place and it started appearing at their new house, it was never seen in mine again. When I was in my teens, my father bought a house in the country. A newer house built in the 70s, I believe. Neighbors weren't too close by except for a house right at the end of the driveway. A little background. The previous owners were a husband and a wife. The house at the end of the driveway was the mother of one of them, I can't remember which. The husband found out that he had cancer. He kept spiraling further and further into depression as the disease progressed. One day, he decided that he was done. And, as the story goes, he set up tarps in the dining room right in front of the patio and the patio door. He shot himself. The wife proceeded to move out and the house was put up for sale. Enter my father. He buys said house. It was quite big, roomy, nice finished basement. My room was upstairs, first bedroom of three down the hallway. It was enjoyable at first. I got to decorate my new room, yay. As a teenager, I had an obscene amount of posters, pictures, and drawings that I did as decorations. I stuck them all to the wall. It didn't take very long for things to start getting weird. Now mind you, at this stage, I had no knowledge of the previous owner or the story. I would wake up like clockwork every night at about 2 a.m. Strange, but I would just roll over and go back to sleep. Then, in the mornings when I would wake up, my posters on one wall, the wall with the closet, would be crooked. 
As a typical teenager, I would leave them crooked for a few days, and then finally straighten them, retack them, and give up. Then I started to notice that all the posters were tilted to the same exact angle in the same direction. Definitely weird. So I ended up taping them all four corners with some pretty good tape and still the posters would fall and end up crooked the same exact way. Eventually I just gave up and left them that way. Remember how I said I started waking up every night at 2 a.m.? Well, it started to freak me out once I realized that it just kept happening. So I would take longer and longer to fall asleep. Then the real fun started. I started hearing footsteps. They would start at the basement stairs. I heard them come up, open the basement door, walk through the kitchen, down the hallway, past my door, turn around at the end of the hallway, and proceed back the way it had come into the basement. The first time I heard this, I figured it was dad, but no, it wasn't dad because I could hear him snoring in his room. Then I panicked. In a good old fashioned way, my blankets went up over my head and I hyperventilated. I seriously thought that at some point my door would open, but it didn't. I didn't die or see any ghostly matter, but man, was I ever freaked out. I didn't sleep much the rest of the night the first time it happened, and it was hard to get much sleep at all after that. The next morning, as soon, and I mean as soon, as my father woke up, I told him what I heard. He laughed and said, okay, well you must have been sleeping and dreamed it. He has zero belief of the paranormal, and here I am, still not having a clue about the history of the house. Okay, okay, maybe I was dreaming. I still woke up most nights, but no footsteps. It's all right, right? Wrong. They sure did come back. At least once or twice a month I would hear those footsteps, and I'd damn near die of a panic attack each time. But knowing that telling my father was futile after the first four to five times I tried, I gave up telling him. Mystery feet never tried to enter my room, so believe me, I was more than happy if it stayed that way. We were there maybe five to six months when my father came inside one day. The lady who lives at the end of the driveway picked blackberries in the backyard, so he was out talking with her. He came in and said, Okay, I have something to tell you. I was like, Okay? Little old lady wanted me to go make pies with her or something like that? But no. He proceeded to tell me about the history of the house. He said that the lady had seen lights come on in the dining room a few times, but it was when nobody was home. She's convinced it's her deceased family member still lingering. I was thinking, yes, he finally accepted that something weird is going on here, but nope. Then he went up and checked the wiring and everything was fine, so he laughed at me and the lady for having really good imaginations. Now, no lights ever went on and off by themselves while I was home but random doors would open and close on their own. Drafts, right? My father thought so too. Me? Not so much. The laundry room was in the basement. I hated it down there. Always got some serious heebie-jeebies and felt like somebody was always watching me. Then it felt like somebody was pushing or nudging me down the stairs while I was walking down them and I really started to dislike it there. Flash forward a year or so, I had a boyfriend after a while who started staying the night. Curious, after a while, my boyfriend said, hey, how come all your posters are crooked? I sighed and said, because no matter what I do, they always end up crooked in the morning, so I just leave them that way. He said, no way. So, me being me, I went out and got the best packing tape I could find. I told him to start helping me tape every single corner of every single picture and to make sure they're straight. I told him to make sure he was satisfied that there's no way they could fall off. We got it done. Our mission was complete. I asked him to make sure to remember that these pictures were straight before we went to bed. He said, yep, they're straight. And when we woke up, they weren't. He damn near shit himself. He couldn't believe it, but alas, Teen picture-hating ghosty struck again. 
So finally realizing that I've got someone who half-assed thinks something weird is going on, I fill him in on everything else that's happened there. He said I absolutely had to wake him up when I heard these footsteps. Well, oddly enough, every time I did hear them, I tried. Oh, how I tried to wake him. But no way was he waking up. No matter what I did, he wouldn't wake. I even bit him once just to see if that would work. Still kept sleeping, like nothing had ever happened. One day, he and I were sitting in the living room. We had these big wooden basement doors that were underneath the patio, and they opened up to a little garage big enough to park your car in. They shook so hard that we could feel it vibrating the living room floor. It was loud. It sounded like two people at least were banging and shaking these doors. A pheasant even took off flying at the same time because it was scared. We jumped up, obviously thinking that somebody was trying to break into the house. We ran outside to look, but there was no one, and I mean no one there, except two freaked out teenagers and a pheasant that I'm pretty sure had a heart attack. It was a wide open field. There was nobody anywhere. We would have seen them somewhere trying to make their escape. And keep in mind, the shaking was still going on while we were out there. So we would have seen who was doing it. Obviously, we told my dad when he got home, and it was more, ah, you guys are crazy, statements. My dad had this old wooden rocking chair in the corner of the dining room. After a while, this thing started rocking on its own. I told dad. He bought a rug for underneath it and said it was those darn drafts again. Nope. That thing would still rock. But of course, it never did it when my father was around. Not too long after that, my boyfriend and I got an apartment of our own and moved out. But trust me, that's not where the story ends. The boyfriend and I moved out. Eventually, my father got a new girlfriend who moved in. She has two kids. One is my father's and one by another man. They were young at this time, the girl being around five and the boy being about two. After a while, the girlfriend started talking to me and saying that there was something off with the house. She did know the story about the previous owner. Her daughter stayed in my old room. You know, the one with the posters. Also, the one with the closet. Her daughter started talking about an old man named Zabu that lived in the closet. She described him as an old man with a long beard and said that he glowed green. She said that she'd seen him a few times and that she didn't like him or the closet. One time, the boy was sitting on the living room floor, looking up at the ceiling. And just randomly, out of nowhere, he says, I don't want to talk to you right now. Nobody was speaking with him, or even close to him. I'm sure there was more involving them, but I can't remember all of it right now. Weird things kept happening, though. At the time, I'd even asked a paranormal investigation team if they would be interested in looking at the house. Of course, they were all for it, but we first had to get permission from the owner of the house, which would be my dad. When my dad's girlfriend brought it up to him, he declined, saying that there's no such thing as ghosts and he didn't want a bunch of strangers staying in the house. So, regretfully, I had to inform the team of this decision. Flash forward to a few years later. She and my father broke up and she moved out. He got a new job where he was rarely home. I have two children by now, so I decided, you know what, I'll rent the house while he's gone. My boyfriend and I and our two kids moved in. The first thing that happened was later one night. I was in the basement, and the lights were quite dim down there, and I heard something rustling around in one of the two bedrooms. I opened the door, and the light wouldn't come on. Nothing strange, just a blown light bulb. But as I was looking around the room for possible rodents, I looked up at the ceiling, and there was a flashing green and reddish-orange light. Then, I realized that they were everywhere. 
The closest thing I can compare it to is the flashing light you might see on a smoke alarm. There were hundreds of these lights all over the ceiling. So I backed right out and closed the door as quickly as I could and vacated the basement altogether. Those lights started to randomly appear on the ceiling in the main part of the basement too. My sister and her boyfriend came to visit. Once again, we were in the basement. We smoked down there instead of upstairs. It was getting late. Her boyfriend went and opened the car bay door from inside the house. He was going to go outside to use the bathroom as it was much easier for him and he didn't want to go upstairs and wake my kids unnecessarily. So as he's heading through the car bay, we hear, what the f He turned around and hightailed it back out of there, slamming the door. Obviously panicked, he then proceeded to tell us that he had just seen a little girl running across the room from one end to the other. We opened up the door and checked things out, but nothing was there. One night after dark, I was in a bedroom upstairs, not my old room. Nobody was staying in that one. In my daughter's room, the one adjacent to my old room, I was putting some laundry away. When out of the blue, my daughter, who was about three or four at the time, pointed at the window. She said, Mom, who's the man standing outside? I looked at the window. She's still pointing and looking at it. Trying my best not to panic, I said, Babe, there's no man out there. I didn't see anything. No man. It was completely dark. There also wasn't a man inside the room, nor in the reflection of the inside of the room on the darkened window. But if she could see it, I sure couldn't. As calmly as I could, with a racing heart and clammy hands, I picked her up and left the laundry. I brought her out to the living room, where I then asked her about the man she saw. She said he was really tall and had a beard. Remember Zabu? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I made sure to have the curtains closed and her bedroom door opened at all times after that. Another day, I was in the living room, playing Guitar Hero, sitting in a chair not too far from the television. It was night and my kids were in bed. So, while I was into the game and focused on all the colors and playing, I saw a little girl out of the corner of my eye, standing a few feet away from me. I assumed it was my daughter who had gotten out of bed to use the bathroom. So I then proceeded to talk to her and ask her why she was up. I asked her if she could go back to bed, or if she was thirsty or hungry, but I got no replies. My song was over and I could still see this girl out of the corner of my eye. So I looked directly at her, and there was nobody there. The daughter I thought I'd been carrying on a one-sided conversation with was still in her bed, completely sound asleep. I was in shock. There was no way. But, alas, apparently now we have a Zabu and a little girl hanging around. One morning, it was early. I was in the basement doing laundry. My children's dad, at the time, was sitting on the couch with our daughter. The couch was in front of a built-in bar area, 70s style. There was fluorescent lighting all over it, but it didn't work, so we had a small table lamp on top of the bar for lighting. The plug was behind the bar area. I had forgotten some laundry upstairs, and I ran up to grab it. On my way back down the stairs, I yelled to the kid's father, Watch out! Get up! The lamp that was on the bar was literally sliding across the bar and was about to fall off the edge right onto the heads of the two people sitting under it, which happened to be my family. As soon as they got up, it stopped moving and stayed where it was, hovering at the edge of the bar. My father also had an old phone that was screwed into the wall in the basement. It was very old, probably put in when the house was originally built. He just never bothered to take it out. It had a rotary dial, too. For all the young ones, that's a phone where you actually have to turn the dial to the number you want. No touch numbers here. We didn't have a landline hooked up, as seven to eight years ago, cell phones were much more convenient. When we would be upstairs, that phone would randomly start ringing. Of course, it's been years since there was a landline hooked to the house. 
and it would only ring a couple of times before stopping, and never while anybody was downstairs. We would randomly hear scratching on the carport door, almost like a cat. This would happen when we were downstairs. It was on the inside door heading to the carport, but on the car bay side. And of course, upon investigation, there was never anything there and nothing was ever disturbed. We stayed there maybe six to seven months and moved. I'd had enough. I told my father what had been happening and once again he said I was foolish, that there's no such thing as ghosts. Fine, to each their own. He can believe whatever he wants to or not. A few months after I moved out, I got a phone call from my father. He was kind of frantic, which was unusual. He said, I believe you now. I said, what are you talking about? I mean, it's kind of a weird way to start a phone call. He said, about the ghosts. There's, there's something in that house. I said, really? Finally, you believe me. What happened? He said that he was laying on the couch at night. He's the only one living there now, and he said that the cupboard doors one night started opening and slamming shut on their own. Another night, a mug had fallen out of the cupboard on its own. The taps would turn on and off on their own. He swears he saw somebody walking around outside at night, but when he turned the outside lights on and went to investigate, there was never anybody there. As a total non-believer, he shook off everything that has happened over the years as a coincidence or the product of an active imagination, right up until he saw and heard those cupboards with his own eyes and ears. He was quite shaken up. He left again for work, and he did rent the house out to a few different people. He even warned them about the house, and there was only one of the renters out of the two who admitted to him that they too had heard and seen some pretty weird stuff. He never elaborated on what happened with the renters, but after the second one, he put the house up for sale. This was about five years ago, and I've always wondered what has happened in the house since. I also wonder about the stories the current owners could share. I don't know who they are, and I'm not about to drive up and tell them my story and ask them if anything has ever happened to them, no matter how curious I am. Although I have to admit, it's mighty tempting. This isn't about one creepy thing that happened. I didn't physically see an apparition, but promise me that you'll pretend to be in my shoes in each situation. I'm not telling this story to impress anyone. Rather, I just need to get these experiences off my chest. It's happened for years, ever since I can remember. The first thing I remember was me watching TV in the living room, probably in elementary school and I had just finished my bowl of chips. I placed it in the sink and went back to sit on the couch, and it was completely silent. I then heard the bowl tapping against my metal sink, like it was unbalanced, so I went to adjust it. When I got to the kitchen, it stopped, so I went to sit back down, but the noise started again. I shrugged it off and told my mom about it, but she said it was a coincidence. Moving on, I'm in middle school now and I've looked into the paranormal. I had to. I would hear footsteps on the stairs at night, but I chose to believe it was the house settling. It always had a creepy feeling of being watched and I would hear random knocks or bangs. I'm doing my homework in my bed with the door closed. All of a sudden, the doorknob viciously began shaking as if somebody was trying to open a locked door, but it wasn't locked. I jumped out of bed when it stopped and ran to my brother's room, which is right next door to mine, and swung his door open. I accused him of shaking my handle, but he was extremely confused and asked, why would I do something so stupid when I'm doing my homework? Still freaked out, I just went to finish my homework, but I was distracted glancing at the doorknob every so often. 
Some short points that didn't happen to me. My parents' closet is always closed, but one morning my dad found a small puddle of blood on a pair of new shoes that he had never wears, but neither of them found cuts on themselves. My brother just saw the first Paranormal Activity movie, but my mom didn't because she hates that stuff. But a couple of nights later, she walks into his room and stands by his bed just staring at him. He freaks out and tells her to leave, but she stays there for five minutes and then walks back to her room. The next morning, she had no recollection. I know how fake this sounds, but trust me, I only wish I was making it up. After that, my mom was home alone and decided to take a shower. In the middle of her shower, the bathroom door flies open and hits the wall. She throws a robe on and runs out, thinking, of course, that there was an intruder. But nobody was found. I'm now a teenager, watching YouTube in my bedroom, when I hear a loud bang outside my door. I think my brother fell in the bathroom, which is next to his room. So I ran out into the hallway to laugh at him, but he's in his room, so I asked if he just fell, to which he replied no. Instead, he said, I thought you fell. We search around for something that has fallen, but to no avail. A couple months later in December, we're going into our attic to get the Christmas decorations. Our attic has all of our boxes lined up along the perimeter. When we peeked up there, there was a box on its side right in the middle. I think it's important to note that our attic is right above the bathroom. Nothing crazy has happened after that except for me and my friend hearing a car start in our garage, but no car was running. We just thought we were crazy. But one day after school of senior year, I'm home alone and my boyfriend lives 10 houses down the street. So I planned on walking there soon. I'm sitting on my living room floor with our family dog and cat. I then hear the loudest, most distinct noise I've ever heard. Imagine having a two-story house with a very tall living room and dining room ceiling. I heard someone stomping and running in my room. I'm telling you, I heard it. My cat runs away, my dog jumps up defensive. I ran outside to look on my roof, but nobody was there. I ran around the whole house looking up there, but there was just the roof. I ran back in the house, grabbed my phone and my keys, and then ran to my car. I cried to my boyfriend and his family about it for an hour, but I still don't know if they believe me. At this point, I'm 19 years old, and my parents have divorced. I'm living with my mom in a small apartment with a tiny washer and dryer. My dad left for town on a business trip, so I asked if I could wash my clothes at his house and he agreed. I'm terrified of being there alone, so I brought my boyfriend and his older friend, Devante. Devante is 24. I told them the things that have happened and Devante says it's all in my head. I laughed and I said, I hope something paranormal happens to you tonight so you'll believe me. The dryer says it'll take 74 minutes, so my boyfriend and I go to play a board game, and since it's 10 p.m., Devante wants to take a nap. I told him he can go up to my brother's old room since my brother has moved out and nobody uses it, so he does. Ten minutes later, we hear a bang, and we thought he dropped his phone between the bed and the wall. The bed is pressed against the wall, connected to the hallway, so it makes sense that it would be so loud. About ten more minutes go by, and we hear Devante saying something upstairs, but we figured he was talking on the phone. Then he gets louder. My boyfriend and I look at each other, confused. Devante yells, Holly, come get your man. Now, more confused, I tell my boyfriend Anthony to run up there and see what's wrong. When he gets to the room, Devante asks, Wait, what? He's staring at him, wide-eyed. Devante says, No, did you just run up those stairs? Devante got up and exited the room and ran down to where I was waiting. He said, 
Tell me you didn't just run up there when I called you. Anthony and I were super confused, and Devante began freaking out and pacing. He said he heard somebody whispering, Get out, get out, get out. And it slowly got louder until they were yelling at him to get out. He thought my boyfriend was just messing with him. That's why we heard Devante talking. He was saying things like, Anthony, F off. And Anthony, stop it, I'm trying to sleep. Devante was so freaked out that we left that night, not finishing the laundry. We had to pick it up the next day. I laugh at this because it's such a stereotypical thing to have a ghost say get out in movies and on YouTube videos, but I've never seen him teary-eyed and so genuinely terrified as he was that night. That's the end of it all, I think. My boyfriend and I and my mom moved halfway across the country for other reasons. I think all of my paranormal struggles are over. Well, maybe. In our new house, a bang was heard in the sunroom, which freaked both of our dogs out. The puppy wouldn't even re-enter the room. Just tonight, we got Chipotle and ate in our bedroom. And that's when I heard the foil with the tortillas in it being dragged on my nightstand table. Yes, the fans were going, but not strong enough to pull the heavy tortilla and foil with it. I'm spooked out and decided to write down all of my experiences to make myself feel better. Again, it's not a one-time story, and it's probably not as entertaining as other ghostly things that you'll read here. But I needed this off my chest. If any of you have experienced these things, please let me know. It would make me feel so much better to know that I'm not alone. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt that the house was haunted, that she could sense a presence there. She said that she heard someone call her name, and that she felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time, she woke up with someone holding her feet down, and she couldn't shake whatever it was and started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things of our own. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, and it wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I heard very heavy footsteps right outside of my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover that the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, and at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house with the driveway when somebody was pulling up to the house, as if they were trying to see who had arrived. It was almost cool in the daytime, but at night, it was terrifying. There was something always clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night. I always tried to convince myself that it was the air vents. However, all of the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed. I would only ever see this if my head was covered with a sheet. When I pulled the sheet off, Nobody was there. I heard sighs, as if somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper say, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I'd also ask them to quiet down, and that seemed to help as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement. We heard the garage door open, and the voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, just to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house. He slept in the living room. 
In the morning, he asked if we were playing a joke on him last night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor, and in the kitchen, but every time he got up to see what was going on, nobody was there. I don't think we even owned a ball, and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby cry outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb, and there was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. One day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker, it was just a regular lid and a pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at some ungodly hour of 5 a.m. or something, and I had never gotten around to it. He said that at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck. He kept turning around to find that nobody was there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under the bed. He got freaked out and ran out. He refused to enter the house again and just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. My sister woke up one night to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars or anything else. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. Also, our cat disappeared without a trace one day. I'm not sure if it was related, but it seemed worth mentioning. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could have been a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins as they disturb his sleep, even the numbers on the clock. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night. I slept in my sister's room instead. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house. A boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child which now was also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house now and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after, I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as the creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house, and I don't know what happened after that. I grew up in southern Idaho, and I moved to Eugene, Oregon around age 20. We moved into our newly built home in the countryside at the start of the millennium, literally months after my grandma on my mom's side, who I call Nana. I was about eight or nine at the time, and I lived there until I was 17 when my dad kicked me out of the house. After that, I went and lived with my grandparents about five miles away whose house was also haunted. They too had built their own home. To put things into perspective for some things that happened, our house was set five miles from any town in the middle of fields with only a few houses about a half mile away. One of those houses was my cousin's, 
My uncle had built his family's house there, and my dad was really close to him, part of why we built there. It too had some weird things that happened that my cousins and I experienced. The first thing that was odd happened when we were moving our stuff from my dad's parents, the grandparents that I later lived with, into our new home. We lived in their basement, but it was a one-story house. I'm obsessed with Star Wars and had little ships that I played with as a kid. My favorite one was a TIE fighter. I was playing with it one day while the movers and my parents packed and moved things. At one point, I set it on a chair in my parents' room while I was alone downstairs. I ran out of the room, turned the corner, ran up the stairs, realized that I had left it on the chair and immediately ran back. When I got there, it was gone. I had only been gone about 10 seconds, if that, and no one had gone by me at any point. It was a small, narrow basement, so I would have had to have passed anybody who went to move it. I looked everywhere and even emptied the entire room, but I never found it. The setting of our house was a two-story, three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath with an unfinished basement. My room sat directly above the garage, my parents' room above the living room, and the house was surrounded by one and a half acres of lawn and about three acres of woods on one side, with fields on the other. My cousin's house sat between the fields and the forest, with a path leading between our houses. Growing up in our new home, we had some weird things happen every now and then that we all experienced at one point or another. Lights would turn on by themselves. We had security cameras and caught that several times. All of us would often hear the garage door open, a car drive in, and the garage door close. Then we would hear the door to the house open and close often when somebody was gone. Sometimes only one of us would hear that. Other times, two of us in different rooms would hear it. My parents were very rarely home, so it was always pretty much impossible that somebody was in the garage. I like to joke that I was an only child raised by five cats. My dad would often hear loud music with a strong bass line when home alone. He would come out of the room thinking it was me playing music, and sometimes the stereo would be playing music, and other times it wouldn't but every time he was home alone. When I was around 12 or 13, I used to spend the night in our guest bedroom that we had set up as an exercise room for fun and watch movies all night. That ended one night when I woke up sometime in the night to the TV turning off and on rapidly, even though it didn't have a remote. I immediately ran to my parents' bedroom and I barely slept that night. Later that year, I went to a summer camp at a martial arts studio with just a few friends. We played hide and seek, but got freaked out after two different TVs started rapidly turning on and off on their own, even while we held the remote to both of them with the batteries taken out. Since our basement was unfinished, we stored things down there. My dad is a slight bit of a hoarder and had kept a lot of his art from art school downstairs. I admittedly went through boxes downstairs often, still looking for that Star Wars ship for years, but I never did find it. One time, my mom and I went to visit her dad in California. When we came back, my dad scolded me for taking all of his art out downstairs. I told him that I hadn't touched his art at all and actually didn't know that he had art down there, which was true at the time, as it was really buried under a lot of stuff. He said he'd gone down one night to find a lot of his paintings, drawings, and even a sculpture laying on top of boxes around one of the unfinished rooms, as though somebody had been looking at them. Even creepier was that while one sculpture was laying on boxes, another, mind you these were heavy plaster sculptures, was smashed in two on the floor. The downstairs always had a weird vibe, and after that, if you stood at the top of the stairs, it felt like you were being watched from the bottom. We had a few weird things that would happen outside our house too. Since we had a massive lawn, we had a big sprinkler system that could run off the canal for the farms or off of our well water. One summer, our pump was sabotaged at the standpipe by the canal. At the time, we thought it was a farm's kids playing a prank and we just switched over to well water. 
A few nights later, though, we went outside for some reason, and we heard splashing water, almost like a geyser, coming from out of the dark. My dad went to investigate and found the test tap for our well full open, which was hard to do. We got it shut off, but for some reason our well pump seemed to be still running, so we needed to shut it off via a valve box in the ground. When we opened it, it was completely filled with dirt, and we had to dig it out. We asked around, but never figured out what happened. My cousin's house, like I said, was about a half a mile away, and I would often play with them. They said that they would hear screaming from their basement on occasion, and often heard footsteps coming up from the basement when no one was down there. On a couple of occasions, I would be at their house and see what looked exactly like a red laser pointer on the wall, as though someone far away was pointing it through the window. But then it would go up the stairs, which was far above the window. Later, they moved out of the state, and it sat empty for a number of years. I would still wander around their house on occasion, and several times I saw this laser pointer. Mind you, like I said, we were out in the middle of fields and forest, with the next closest house at least a mile away. At night, lights in their house would be on randomly, and then off the next day or night. Growing up, we'd often visit my grandpa in Eugene, Oregon. He'd built his house as well, but it was a massive house that looked and smelled old. We'd stay on the second story in the bedrooms my mom, her sister, and brothers used to live in. I stayed in a small bedroom that had a walk-in closet with its own locking door. Weird, too, because it was locked on the bedroom side, and even had a latch for a padlock in addition. On occasion, I would wake up to find the door open, and then go back to sleep, and then it would be closed in the morning. Often, I had nightmares in that room, and would run to sleep in my parents' room. That stopped, though, because I would then have very vivid night terrors about their closet and wake up screaming. After that, I just put up with the weird walk-in closet in the other bedroom. I'm pretty sure my grandpa's house was haunted because my grandma was an avid antique collector for the entire time she was alive. A lot of stuff gave off weird vibes. My dad says that he often felt a cat jump into the bed, even after the cat died in that house. Lots of people have heard footsteps and felt cold spots throughout the house, and sometimes you can hear whispering somewhere in the house but never pinpoint where. The weirdest thing that ever happened to me, though, was right before my dad kicked me out of the house. Keep in mind, I get really dehydrated super easily, and I can easily drink at least a gallon of water a day. It's always been that way, too. I don't know why. One night I had a dream that was actually very pleasant, at one point, though, I became extremely thirsty in the dream. I kept looking for something to drink, but I couldn't find anything. Then this really kind, beautiful lady showed up and offered me some Skittles. I know that sounds really dumb, but I really liked Skittles at the time. I started eating them, thinking that it somehow might quench my thirst. But I was still just so thirsty. Seeing this, the lady seemed concerned, so she kept giving me Skittles and I would take them and eat them while just standing there smiling. She would give me more. This went on for a bit, but then I realized my hand was hitting something in real life, which started to wake me up. I woke up with my hand hitting the wall because it was reaching off to the side of the bed for the Skittles and hitting the wall instead. When I realized this, I looked up involuntarily, and standing there smiling down at me with a white glow was the same lady. I just sat there for a moment, shocked, and then I bolted out of the room, ran downstairs, and drank some orange juice, and when I came back, she was gone. Over the years, I have felt bad for running out of the room, since it seems like she genuinely wanted to help, and she didn't seem malevolent at all. She looked to be maybe in her late 30s or 40s. I never saw her again, either. There were lots of little things, like stuff moving around and hearing it move at night. I would think it was my cats, but then I would find all of them asleep downstairs. Lights we thought we'd turned off when we left the house would be on once again when we returned, and doors would be opened that we thought we had closed. One cat that I truly considered mine and was close to had some strange occurrences around my parents. 
He would constantly try to get into my parents' bedroom, where one of our cats took up permanent residence the entirety of her life. All of our doors were round knobs, and my parents would lock their door at night. My dad has OCD and checks all of the doors and windows every night, so there's no way that a door isn't locked after he checks it. He'd often come back multiple times too, and find them unlocked again even when my mom and I were both out of town. Anyway, my dad would often wake up in the middle of the night to see the door open, and my cat standing there as though he'd opened the locked, round knob door handle. It happened more than once, too. I never figured that out. My cat would also turn on faucets and flush toilets randomly. He was really smart. My cat died earlier this year, at the old age of about 20. On the night he died, I was asleep and felt a cat jump into my bed. I'm now living in Southern California, no pets, just a girlfriend that lives with me, and immediately come and cuddle up familiarly next to me. I even felt the warmth and was very happy. After a bit, it faded away and I came to my senses. I called my dad and said, he didn't die, Daddy. My dad said he had died just a few hours earlier. It hasn't just been houses that I've had stuff happen in either. On two separate occasions in two different apartments in two different states, I've been asleep and had an experience that I can only describe as attempted demonic possession. I grew up in an overly religious family, Mormons to be specific, but was never welcomed there. And I was often bullied for being the weird kid for, of all things, liking Star Wars and video games. Welcome to Farmtown USA, I guess. Around age 14, though, I stopped going to church, really, and became a staunch atheist. Around age 19 after college, I was still living in southern Idaho in my own apartment. One night, I woke up sweating, unable to get my body to move, but with my limbs shaking and flailing rapidly, almost inhumanly. It was extremely dark, and I couldn't open my eyes, but a slight slit before they'd close really tightly again. While all of this was happening, all hope and happiness seemed to drain, and I felt like I just wanted to die. Even being an atheist, I started to pray like when I was a kid. Within moments of starting to pray, everything went back to normal, and I was able to open my eyes. I let out a gasp like I hadn't breathed for minutes, and was sweating profusely. I got up and watched funny Netflix shows for the rest of the night. I experienced the same thing, but even more forcefully again years later. But this time in Eugene, Oregon. Once again I started praying, and again it receded after a few minutes. It's been five years since then, and it was shortly after that that my current girlfriend moved in with me. The last one I remember was at a work friend's house when I was 18. I'd gone over to fix her computer and was removing some viruses when I noticed that she was just standing at the door to her garage, staring intently at the door at the back of her garage. I asked her what she was looking at, and she told me that sometimes she gets weirded out by the door at the back of the garage. I went to look, and the moment I saw it, I felt like my spine had a current of electricity running down it. Having grown up with weird stuff in my house, I decided to investigate. The closer I got, the more intense the feeling. Standing in the frame of the door, it felt surreal. Almost like I was standing in some sort of otherworldly portal. Then the moment I stepped onto the other side of the door frame, everything returned to normal and felt boring. I looked back through at my friend watching me, feeling kind of bored like nothing had really happened. The moment I stepped back through, though, the feeling of electricity flowing through me returned until I left the garage. These are all the experiences I can remember. I don't know if all of these houses are haunted, or my family's haunted, or I'm haunted. But what I do know, or at least what I think is interesting, is that everybody in my family built their own homes, yet they were all haunted. Maybe one of those things, or several of those things, followed me. I don't know, but these are my experiences.
I have so many spooky things that have happened to my family and I that it's not even funny, but by this thing I was the most creeped out. I used to live in a haunted house for two years. I moved to another city for school and moved in with my best friend as a roommate. The whole apartment building was built in the 1800s, and as far as I know, we lived in the servant side of the apartment building. That also kind of explains why there were always things happening there. Especially if we left a mess in the apartment. I really can't even detail all of the things, you would need a whole book for that, but I'll mention a few things that happened here. One thing that happened quite early on living there was that both of our tweezers went missing. We bought new ones the next day and they're absolutely nowhere to be found. Of course, we argued about this, blaming each other for the missing tweezers, but went on to buy one pair to share, and the next day they were also gone. A few days went by and we were out shopping for a few hours. When we got home, the freaking five pairs of tweezers that by now we had bought and lost were lined up on our kitchen table, right down the middle of it. We slept in the same bed that night, we were so scared. My cat used to hate that place. He became very stressed out and had a lot of hair loss issues, which never happened before or after moving in or out of there. He would also wake up from a deep sleep to hiss at the same spot, many times. That spot was in a hallway in front of every door, and it was sometimes cold there. My roommate's clock would drop from the sofa or from the table right in front of us, or completely turn around. We both saw that happen. One time, we were at the line to a bar, and my roommate noticed that she'd left her phone at home. We lived in the middle of the center of the city, so she went to grab it. She came back really quickly and was white as a sheet. She had an automatic lock on her phone, so that after like two minutes of nobody touching it, it would lock up. At that point, we'd been gone for about 15 to 20 minutes, and you would also need a password to enter her phone. She went home, and in the dark living room, her phone was sitting there, unlocked. Needless to say, we also shared the bed that night as well. We had numerous accounts of waking up at night to what sounded like somebody washing dishes, or walking upstairs. We also heard sawing upstairs, and we lived on the top floor. Above us was only the attic. There were many things, and I really wish I'd written them all down, but I was just trying to live there while I was scared as hell. I'm very sensitive to things like this, and I never slept there alone. Not even one night. I was too scared. I had sleep paralysis there so many times. And, interestingly, that never happened before I moved in or after I moved out. I'm sure that we were never there alone. And for everyone wondering, no one had a key to the apartment except my roommate and I. We only had one neighbor, a young couple who lived next door, and there were only business spaces in the apartments below. To this day, we don't have any explanation for the things that happened there. This happened a few years ago. I still remember it pretty clearly, because it's so strange, and I never really found an answer to what it was. It was during a visit to my grandmother in a small village in Mexico. To give some context, my parents and I visited for about a week, and during that week, my mother's cousin also passed. He was in a car crash, which I'll use the term loosely, the local government was deeply involved. Months later, it turned out that he was actually murdered by the local cartel there. That really is a whole other story in and of itself, but I decided to mention it because it did happen the same week that we were visiting. As you can probably tell overall, that entire week was tragic, and also extremely odd. Some background. It happened about a night before we got the news about the passing. My uncle lives on the same plot of land that my grandmother does, and he owns a farm of chickens and roosters. My grandma's sister, the mother of the guy who passed, is technically their next door neighbor. They own a plot of land right next to my grandmother's. 
My grandmother's plot of land is actually adjacent to the local elementary school there. So her house isn't in the middle of nowhere. However, she does have a good sized plot of land that's surrounded by concrete walls for protection. The streets around her land only really get foot traffic when school is in session. Given the climate at the time, any kind of foot traffic stops by sunset. The village itself is pretty poor, and everyone is familiar with each other there. They have a few rich, but no middle class. Most houses are about equivalent to shacks. My grandmother owns a concrete house that is decently sized, but otherwise plain. It was during the summer when my parents and I visited. I was on summer break, and so were the schools there. My parents and I were the only people there visiting my grandmother at the time. Every night, time is taken to make sure that all the doors are completely locked before heading to bed. There are three doors that lead to the outside. All are made of metal, with also a mesh frame door to keep the bugs out. That night, I distinctly remember asking my mom to help me lock the front door. It's a heavy metal door with a secured lock that I was having difficulties closing. We also checked to make sure the other doors were secured and locked. I'm going to mention the layout of my grandmother's house briefly since it is somewhat important. The first room you enter, which is the door I was having a hard time closing, is basically a room with a bunch of beds. To the right is what is referred to as the middle room, which is just another bedroom. It connects the first room to my grandmother's room. You can look into the middle room and also see the first room when both doors are left open. These two doors usually are left open because they're heavy and they scrape against the concrete floor very loudly. Before heading to bed, I plugged my phone in the middle room to charge, which is where my dad was going to sleep. My mom and I were sleeping in the same room with my grandmother. My mom and I shared a bed that was right next to the door that leads to that middle room. Right before falling asleep, I could see into the first room because the two doors were left open, like always. I had no recollection of any nightmares or dreams. I basically slept in pitch black until I woke up at an unknown time, completely terrified. My eyes basically shot open and I had this indescribable sense of fear. The first thing that I noticed was that the door next to me was completely shut. I didn't want to move, even in the slightest. I didn't really know what to think. I felt too scared to even close my eyes. I just laid there, completely still, for an unknown amount of time. I came to the conclusion that I would rather wait for the sun to come up than to close my eyes again. I was that scared. Eventually, I heard the chickens starting to make noise, so I figured the sun was going to come up in the next couple of hours or so. However, I noticed that the chickens were actually going crazy. It almost sounded as if they were afraid of something. This deepened my fear, but I was still too afraid to move. At this point, I was wondering why it hadn't woken up my mother or my grandmother, who were both extremely light sleepers. I was the heaviest sleeper in the family, yet the chickens weren't waking either of them up. Eventually, they all settled down, and there was no sign of any sunlight. I occupied my time just listening to the air conditioner in the middle room. It's pretty old, the kind that you have to use a hose to water down. It makes a continuous noise, and then occasionally sputters, but its noises are almost a routine, so they're somewhat comforting. I could also hear the bed in the middle room creaking around, which I figured was my dad moving around in his bed. Again, I couldn't see into the middle room. I found it odd that the door was closed. I'm a heavy sleeper, so I figured that there was a possibility that I remained asleep when somebody closed them. I remained still for who knows how long. But then I heard a noise that I had never heard before. It was extremely loud and it came from the middle room. The volume was just as loud as a large bird, but didn't sound anything like a bird. I was petrified and had no idea why it didn't wake anybody up. Again, I can't even really describe the noise. It's like nothing I've ever heard before or since. I still laid there, completely still, long enough to listen to this noise over 
and over. I wanted to think that it was the air conditioner, until that noise happened at the same time as this other one, and I knew it couldn't be. I wanted to think it was the creaking of the bed, but eventually those noises happened at the same time too. I didn't find it odd until later exactly how much the bed was creaking. Nobody moves around that much in their sleep. At this point, I felt like I was just going crazy. I still laid completely still, just stuck, listening to this noise. Eventually, a second noise started to emerge. It sounded about the same as the first noise. However, it was distinguishable, like when two people speak. It was as if they were conversing back and forth. I started to move my arm against my mom while whispering, Mom, Mom, over and over, trying to wake her up. Like I said before, she's an extremely light sleeper, but it looked like she was in a deep sleep. It got to the point that I was basically shaking her and moving her around. Finally, her eyes shot open, and in that moment, she actually heard the last noise that came from the middle room. She looked petrified, looked at me, and the first thing she said was, that noise isn't from this world. After that, the noises completely stopped. My mom got up and tried to open the door leading to the middle room as slowly as possible, but it still made a lot of noise. The door opening woke my grandmother up. When we got into the middle room, there was nothing in there, and my dad was still fast asleep. I checked the time on my phone, and it was around 3 a.m. Apparently, both doors in the middle room were completely shut. When we started checking around the house, we noticed that all the doors were left open. My grandmother said she opened them during the night, which explains that. It was extremely odd that she would do something like that, to say the least, but she's old and can sometimes be unreasonable. We looked around and checked out the outside, but aside from the doors, nothing was out of place. All we could really do was close them again and go back to bed. The next morning, I woke up to my mom talking about the event to my uncle and some other family friends who came over to have breakfast. She concluded on her own that it was a brujera, or witch. I don't really know what it was. I only ever bring it up when a close friend talks about odd occurrences or aliens. There have been a few more unexplained events, but this one was the last and strangest thing to happen to me. And otherwise, my life has been pretty normal. At 16, I was responsible for getting my seven-year-old sister on the bus for school. I always had to get her dressed, feed her, and tie her hair up in a ponytail. One morning, I was sick, but I got her up as usual and got her off to school. I was super nauseated and laid on the couch with a trash can next to me. The TV was playing some cartoon on Disney, and I had my arm covering my eyes as I laid there. I was dozing off as I heard my sister come into the living room and say, Sissy, will you tie my hair up? Not really thinking about it, my eyes still covered. I held out my hand, waiting for her to place her hair tie in my palm. Whatever this thing actually was, must have realized that it couldn't give me what I was asking for. And right around that time, I realized that I had already gotten my sister up and on the bus that morning. So whatever was standing next to me, wasn't my sister at all. As I sat up, spooked as hell, the thing ran off. I could hear its footsteps running through the kitchen and down the hallway. I didn't see anything, no apparition, just sounds. I walked to my grandmother's house about a block away, and shortly after that I moved in with her because my mother and I couldn't get along. Weird things like that happened all the time on that property. What I didn't expect was for it to follow me to my grandmother's. Two weeks after moving in, I was in the room with the door cracked. I was home alone and it was late. My brother, who was 15 at the time, 
was always at the neighbor's house and would stop in to shower, eat, and sleep. I heard him come in, go into his room and fiddle around. I could hear him talking, like he was on the phone with someone. I called for him and he didn't respond, so I assumed he was just pranking me. I got up and left my room, and his bedroom door across the hall was closed and locked. I stuck my thumbnail into the keyhole and popped it open, planning to scare him. When I opened the door, his lights were off. His room was dark, and it was empty. I flipped the light on and started investigating. I opened the closet, looked under his desk, and assumed that he'd gone out the window and was going to come back in and scare me or something. When I checked the window, it was bolted down, something my grandmother had done to keep him from sneaking out. I was perplexed, and then spooked. I left his room to go check the rest of the house, and as I was walking down the hallway and into the living room, I heard someone running hard behind me. As I turned around, this nothing of a presence ran right through me and took my breath away. I fell to the floor, feeling like I'd just gotten socked in the gut. When I came to, I ran next door to find my brother passed out on the couch with his friends. It was an absolutely terrifying experience, and one that I will always remember. I don't know what that thing was, but it mimicked my siblings perfectly. Their voices, their footsteps, their actions, everything. My wife and I have been house shopping for several months now, so it's become a normal weekend tradition for us to meet up with our realtor and walk through houses. This past Saturday, a place popped up that was in a nice area and for a decent price, so we decided to see it the following day. We drove out to this place and met up with our realtor at about 10 a.m. on Sunday. We started our walk through, and as soon as we walked in, it was obvious that the place had been inhabited by somebody very elderly. Not only were there dated wallpapers and strange color choices, but there was also a stair chair, those powered chairs on a track, leading to the basement. We walked through the kitchen and bedrooms, and everything seemed pretty nice. Then we came to a room that appeared to be an old craft room, with built-in shelving and a desk. Once we'd seen all of the first floor, we decided to check out the basement. It's important to know that the lights in the basement did not turn on. I think there may have been some breakers flipped because some other room lights didn't work either. The basement layout is such that once you descend the stairs, you must either go left or right. Left leads into an older finished portion of the basement and right leads to an unfinished utility area. The realtor, my wife, and I all go to the right initially. I'm checking out the water softener system and the shelving and storage when my wife decides to go check out the finished portion. After a second, I hear her commenting about how she just could not go into that room. I chuckled to myself, assuming she was just being cheeky because it was a dark old room. The realtor decided she would go check it out, but immediately turned around and made a similar comment. I was amused because I just assumed they were playing off of each other's fears and getting freaked out because it was a dark, creepy room. Armed with my phone flashlight turned up as bright as it would go, I decided that I would check out the room since they didn't want to go in. I walked in confidently, but only made it about a couple of steps before being frozen in my tracks by paralyzing anxiety. I felt chilled to the core and I physically tensed up and recoiled at the sensations I was feeling. I felt no apprehensions about going into this room prior to stepping in. Although my wife and the realtor had felt uncomfortable going in, I honestly had no reservations. I simply wanted to see the space. But in an instant, I knew that I was not welcome in that room. I had stepped into a place occupied by someone or something else and it did not want me there. I looked left and right into the darkness, 
a darkness that my phone light could not seem to penetrate save for the small window at the far end of the room, gently glowing from the overcast day outside. It seemed that no light could get into this room. I started to feel sick and decided to get out of there, quickly. I stepped back out of the room to the base of the stairs and suggested that we all head back up. As we walked outside to the backyard, we all felt the need to discuss what had just happened to us. My wife divulged that she actually felt a physical force push on her shoulders as she tried to walk in, as though keeping her out. As in, she literally felt something push her as she tried to enter, which is why she made the comment about not being able to go in. The realtor seemed to have a more similar experience to mine, with extreme anxiety and a feeling of not being welcomed. We walked the lot and headed back up to the house to close the shades and turn off the lights and all those things. As my wife walked up the stairs, our realtor noticed that she had a piece of yellow lace hanging off of her sweater. Normally, this wouldn't be alarming and admittedly, it's very likely just a result of static cling. But given the experience we had had, it just seemed more sinister. We went back into the house and our realtor grabbed the piece of lace and left it in the old craft room. We didn't want to take anything from that house home with us. We all left the house, locked up, and talked a bit more about it in the driveway. Later that night as I laid down for bed, I was in that space between sleeping and waking, and I had a brief dream. I was back in that house, but at night. I stood at the top of those stairs and looked down them when the electric stair chair started to descend by itself. I felt as though I was being baited back into the basement. I woke up pretty quickly, and thankfully I didn't dream about it again. I'm obviously open to the paranormal, but am generally a skeptic. I believe that most things have a reasonable explanation, and this may well have one too. But after reflecting on it for a couple of days, I'll suspend my reasoning and just talk about what I feel. I feel like there were actually two entities in that house, an old man and an old woman. I assume the former residents. The upper floor was her space and she made it feel welcoming and light. I think she's the reason for the yellow lace on my wife's sweater. I think the basement room was his domain and he did not appreciate the unannounced company. Not that he meant any harm, but more of a get out of my house type of reaction. No matter the reality of what happened, nor the intentions of any entities there, I don't think we'll be putting in an offer. My parents bought the house we're currently living in two years ago. It has four levels. Not stories, just levels. When you enter the house or main floor, to your left are the stairs that lead to upstairs, quote unquote. Next to those stairs are the ones that take you downstairs, and to the left of those are the basement stairs. We live in Arlington, Texas. We moved into this house in the summer of 2017. Before we moved in, we would stay the weekends and paint the house. We stayed in Fort Worth on the weekdays so we could continue school. After our first night of staying here, I had a nightmare that a little boy was in our house. He would follow me wherever I went and pushed me off a chair I was standing on. That's when all the nightmares began. After several weeks of living there, I was in the dining room cleaning. My back was facing the staircase that led to the upstairs. Once you go up the stairs, it's like a little balcony. I suddenly had the feeling that I should turn around. I slowly turned my head and in the corner of my eye, I could see what looked like a little boy. He was dangling his legs between the railing. I quickly turned my head all the way to see who was there, but nobody was. It was just an empty staircase. My whole family was downstairs in the living room too, so it wasn't any of them. I thought I was just seeing things, so I didn't mention it to anyone. The location where I saw this little boy is right outside my bedroom door. 
Some time had passed and I hadn't seen anything else. Out of the blue, my older sister had admitted to me that she saw what looked like a little kid standing at the top of the staircase close to where I saw him. My mom overheard what we were talking about and told us that she too had seen something. One day she was heading down to the basement. The basement is dark and the lights take a few seconds to turn on. It's also dark down there because there's only one window. She saw what looked like a hunched over man run past the stairs and out of her view. There are closets on both sides of the stairs, so they block your view of seeing the whole basement. You can only see straight ahead. If you stood looking down the stairs, you would see the closet with some metal tank thing inside. I think it's for the air conditioner. You can't go in there. Although, in the closet there is a hole that leads to under the stairs. You can't reach the hole because half of it is blocked off with wood. She saw this hunched over man run into that closet. After seeing that, she was too scared to go downstairs for the rest of the day. In our basement is also our laundry room. All the lights in the basement have a delay. My older sister told me that when she walked into the laundry room, she could see the outline of a man standing in the corner. She froze for a few seconds and then the lights turned on and there was absolutely nothing there. She was looking at the shadow when she turned the light on and it just disappeared. Nothing to make a shadow look like a man was there either. My mother also said that she saw a man walk past our back door. He was tall and all she could make out was his silhouette. We have a big sliding glass door. She went to investigate and nobody was in our backyard. Our yard is pretty long and our fences are tall. We also had our dog in the back at the time. He didn't like strangers being in our backyard and he would bark like crazy and jump on them. One night while I was sleeping, my mom woke me up frantically. She asked me if I was humming. I told her that I wasn't humming, I was sleeping, and that I wanted to go back to sleep because I had school the next day. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking up the stairs to go to her room, which is right across from mine, she heard humming. It was soft, slow humming, and it sounded like it was coming from my room. She thought she had caught me staying up late, so my mom slowly opened my door. She could make out what looked like a small child kneeling at the foot of my bed, watching me sleep. The humming stopped when she turned on the lights, and the figure disappeared too. I told her that I didn't hear any humming, but after that I was too scared to go back to sleep. I don't remember when this happened, but my brother-in-law and my older sister's bedroom is downstairs. He told me that one night, he randomly woke up and didn't know why. That's when he noticed the silhouette of a really tall man standing at the foot of his bed. He didn't really care though and went back to sleep. He told my sister in the morning what he saw and she freaked out. One night when my mom was in her room alone, she heard knocking on her bedroom window. Our rooms are on the second floor. Her window faces the front of the house. The front lawn is on a steep hill. She opened the curtains, but nobody was there. Sometimes, out of the corner of my eye, I can see the silhouette of a tall man standing at the stairs that lead upstairs. But when you turn to look, no one is there. Heavy footsteps can be heard coming upstairs from the basement, but no one is ever there either. The kitchen faucet has turned on by itself twice now. Small things disappear, like utensils. What really scared me the most was when my baby sister, who was three or four at the time, randomly told me one night that there was a man under our bed. Not a monster, a full-grown man. Almost every single night I have a nightmare, and I'm always dying in them. My death is different in every single one. Sometimes I'm murdered, sometimes it's an accident, a natural disaster, natural causes, the list goes on and on. We have smudged the house numerous times. We put cinnamon sticks at every single window and circle the house with salt. The little boy has seemed to disappear. But now we see or hear the man more and more. 
We've asked our neighbors who have lived here previously, but they don't know. We're all new to the neighborhood. I've tried finding stuff online about our house, but I can never find anything. What should we do? Everybody is too afraid to be home alone. No one likes the basement. I'm scared to leave my room at night. I have a feeling that something is under the stairs, but I know that nothing can get under there. Nobody can fit, except of course for maybe a child. This story takes place around 2004 to 2006. I was a really young kid at the time. My friend, who I'll refer to as Lance, lived with his mother, stepfather, two brothers, and younger sister. His family ended up moving into a nice, spacious home, which was actually in a pretty nice neighborhood. It was an exciting time for Lance and his family. Prior to this move, he and his family only lived in apartment complexes, so this was a real change of pace, a great transition. Initially, all seemed well within the first few weeks. That is, until one day, we all decided to play hide and seek throughout the house. While I was hiding in a room, I got a really strange and eerie feeling, like somebody was watching me. I then felt like something brushed across the top of my hair, and the whole room got really cold, and all of my hair was standing on end. Classic signs of a ghostly presence, I guess. When I told Lance, his family, and my friends about the experience, nobody believed me. Fast forward a few weeks later, Lance's mom was laying in bed. Her husband, Lance's stepfather, was at work. She was all alone. Everyone else was away at the time. It was late at night, and suddenly she heard the bedroom door open and it felt like someone crawled into bed with her. At first, she assumed that it was her husband, but when she turned over, nobody was there. The entire room felt ice cold, and then she heard what sounded like a female voice right next to her. This voice called her name, and that's when she saw the shadow figure standing in the corner of the room she said she ran out of the room as fast as she could, screaming like crazy, and went onto the front porch, waiting for her husband to return home. After that experience, Lance's mom believed me. Many other bizarre things started occurring around the home. Eventually, everyone started experiencing things that they couldn't explain, so at this point, everyone believed me. One of the spookiest places in the house was the basement. I had a really bad habit of leaving my shoes down there. Lance and I used to spend a lot of time down there because they had a small pool table. Whenever I had to go down there by myself to get my shoes, I always felt like I was being watched. It was such a creepy feeling. I actually just refused to retrieve my shoes a few times because it was that bad. The incident that really amplified everything was one night when Lance and his siblings were all asleep. Lance's stepfather and his buddies were in the living room watching a football game. Suddenly, a lamp in the living room straight up levitated off the table and smashed into a nearby wall. Everybody in the living room freaked out. Moments later, a speaker straight up fell over in Lance's upstairs bedroom for no apparent reason. That's two different poltergeist activities occurring in two opposite parts of the home at the same time. That incident got everyone's attention. One experience that truly creeped me out is when Lance and I were in his room playing video games. This was during the middle of the day. Lance went downstairs to get something while I stayed in his room playing GTA Vice City. I then heard a creaking sound coming down the hallway. The door to the bedroom was wide open. I then spotted a shadow of what looked like a little girl on the wall. 
At first, I honestly thought it was Lance's younger sister's shadow, so I called out her name, but there was no answer. Then the entire room got super cold, and I heard what sounded like a whisper right next to me. I straight up dropped the controller and ran as fast as I could out of that room. Shadow figures were a common occurrence within the home. That, along with moving objects, cold spots, unexplained voices, and constant footsteps. The upstairs level of the home was beyond scary. I felt bad for Lance that he had to sleep up there. If I lived there, there's no way I could sleep in that room. I never slept over at that house, by the way. I mean, sure, I would stay for hours on end, but I never fell asleep there. Ever. Lance's mom ended up going through family photos that were taken in the house. There were tons of pictures that had orbs, unexplained faces, and shadowy beings. She was absolutely horrified upon seeing those pictures. At that point, she seriously considered moving. One time, she called in a realtor to discuss selling the home. Out of curiosity and with an odd look on his face, he asked, Have you ever experienced anything unusual here? He was clearly aware of the activity in the home. Lance's mom told him briefly what they had experienced, and he then pulled out some documents detailing the history and previous owners of the home. Turns out there were a total of four deaths in the house. The first death occurred in the 1960s. Some guy was apparently drunk and fell down the basement stairs and broke his neck. The second death was an old lady who had a heart attack in Lance's mother's bedroom. The third death occurred in Lance's bedroom. Apparently, a lady lived there who was heavily involved with witchcraft. She used to conduct rituals in her home. Her death was a bit unclear. She apparently suffocated or experienced some random health problem, but it was pretty much still inconclusive. The fourth death, or deaths for that matter, occurred in another upstairs bedroom. Apparently, there was a violent domestic occurrence between a husband and a wife. The husband killed his wife and then shot himself. So at this point, Lance's mom felt confirmed that it was time to move. Another terrifying incident involved Lance's younger brother. His brother supposedly spotted a man standing at the top of the stairs, covered in blood, and who had dark blue skin and solid black eyes. His younger brother constantly claimed to see people and figures around the home. As a last ditch effort, Lance's mom called in a priest to bless the home. This was by far the scariest and most paranormal event I've ever personally witnessed. When the priest entered the home, he immediately got a bad feeling, especially in Lance's bedroom. When conducting the blessing, things got intense. Objects around the home started flying all over the place, like something out of a movie. And then suddenly, a bright flashing orb reflected off of Lance's mom's wedding picture and hit her in the chest. She fainted upon contact with this orb. The entire night of the blessing was terrifying. The priest actually stayed the night. When he returned home, he claimed that the spirit followed him. So in conclusion, Lance and his family eventually moved out. The blessing was a total failure. The house was too creepy to stay in. I get chills just telling the story. To this day, I still drive past the house every now and again, and it still gives me the creeps. Someone else lives there now. I guess you could say I took a piece of the house with me, because I actually do own an original object from the home. They were found in the attic. There were three miniature statues, along with a book about the occult that Lance's mom found up there. She was about to throw all the items out. She threw away the book, but I took the statues. To this day, they're still in my possession, on a shelf, in my bedroom. Although, I've never experienced anything paranormal from them. Not yet. So, this took place around 2009, 
when I was around three years old, so it might be a little bit blurry, but here goes. When I was little, my mom and dad moved around a lot, about seven times in three years, but this house really stuck out from the rest. It was an old Victorian house, which we found out later was a workhouse and an old cottage. It wasn't long until the paranormal activity began happening. I never slept in my room because the blinds would constantly shake with all the windows shut tight. The same thing happened in all the rooms, too. Like someone just went past and pushed them all forward and was gone. But the scariest moment was when my dad was sitting downstairs late one night. My mom and I were upstairs sleeping. My dad got the feeling that he was being watched, so he turned around and saw a tall, dark, smoke-like figure, as tall as the doorway it was standing in. So we're talking about six feet here. My dad thought he was seeing things, so he looked away, and then looked back, but the thing was still there, just standing and watching. My dad, obviously shaken, turned off the TV and got up, and that's when the figure vanished in front of him. My dad ran upstairs and didn't speak of it until later. My mom had a weird encounter when she went to use the bathroom one night. She heard somebody breathe directly into her ear. She screamed and thought it was my dad being a jerk, but when she got out, he wasn't there. So she ran upstairs, and my dad was next to me sleeping. I had a few weird things happen too, like the time, according to my dad, that I would point out a ghost of a little boy that nobody else could see except from the time that my cousin came down and swore that he saw a little boy peek around the curtain in the window when he was outside, and as soon as he looked, the boy disappeared. We would also hear childlike running on the stairs and the landing of the house, but we were never upstairs when we heard it. There was also a constant and strong smell of whiskey. When we had done our research, we found that a man who lived there previously and had died there drank cans and cans of whiskey, all day, every day. My dad went up to the attic and saw a dusty box in the corner. When he opened it up, tons of old Victorian battered shoes came tumbling out, so delicate that they apparently broke into a couple of pieces, such as the soles and the inside of the shoes. We later moved out, because when we called a priest over, he was so shaken up that he walked out telling us to get out of there immediately, because whatever was there was pure evil. The house is still up, but it's constantly up for rent or sale. I can't stop thinking about that little boy. He always seemed so sad, which is all I could remember about him. I hope he finds some peace. I used to live in the Philippines, and the house that I lived in was built when the Philippines was being occupied by Japan during World War II. It had two small walkways, one at the side of the house and one at the back. At the corner where the two walkways met is where my dog's huge wooden doghouse was. I say huge because I could literally go in and sleep in it comfortably, and I was a pretty big kid of 12 years old. One night, my uncle told me to go feed Casper. Yes, that really is my dog's name. Of course, I said yes right away because I wanted to play with my dog, so I went. Now, Casper is a happy dog, always running around and always happy to see any of my family. But that night was different. While I was walking towards his doghouse, I realized that I didn't hear him barking or running around so I thought that he was at the back walkway. So I just continued toward the doghouse. It was nighttime, around eight. I stopped halfway through when I noticed that Casper was inside the doghouse. This was worrisome, because he always runs at me when he sees me, so I thought maybe something was wrong, like maybe he was sick or whatever. 
I quickened my pace to get to him. Once I got there, though, he seemed fine. I put down the food and filled up his water bowl. I got no reaction whatsoever. Casper was just staring toward the back walkway. I got curious, so I looked toward where he was looking. And what I saw gives me chills even remembering it. I saw a man standing there just staring at me with a blank expression. He was wearing some kind of military uniform and was holding a rifle. I'm not a gun expert, so I can't tell you what it was. At the tip of the gun rested a bayonet. What got me focused on it was that the bayonet was bloody. At that point, I was just frozen. I remember the fear and thinking, this is it. Someone's here and he's going to kill me. I don't quite remember what made me look away from the bayonet. But when I did, the first thing I noticed about the man was that he was now missing half of his face. Seeing him only have half of a face jolted me out of my frozen state, and I ran for it. I didn't care to look back to see if he was following me or not. I even tackled my uncle, who was coming to check on me. I cried so hard when I realized that I was on top of my uncle. He took me inside and waited for me to stop crying. I ended up crying myself to sleep. The next morning, my uncle talked to me about what happened, and I told him everything. He was genuinely worried when I finished, because he told me that I was out there in the walkway for an hour, and that was the reason that he had come to check on me. He also told me that I wasn't the only one to experience such things in the house. I later found out that the uniform the man was wearing was the standard Japanese military uniform at the time of World War II. I have had several paranormal experiences. Many of them took place in a townhouse that I lived in with my mother brother, and her roommates shortly before going into foster care. There are so many things that took place at this house, but I'll try to summarize some of them here. I can't ask you to believe me. I know that everything I say here probably sounds like a load of crap. It's too unreal. I probably wouldn't believe it either. But it did happen to me. It took a long time to convince my parents that this was happening but then it started happening to them, and now we all know what's really there. I swear on my life that every single word of this is exactly the truth as I remember it. I will never forget this house and our time in it, as it was a very pivotal time period in my life. Everything that I had thought life would be like came there to die. This would be the house where my parents would split up, my mother would pick up a meth addiction, which would later be the reason that we were given to foster care, and where I would develop insomnia due to the multiple paranormal events that would soon begin to take place. I had just turned 10 years old when we moved into this house. It was November of 2003. I remember there being a frost on the ground, but no snow yet. It was dark by the time we finished moving, and our parents told my brother and I to go upstairs and start unpacking our rooms, and that they would order pizza. My brother and I went upstairs to see our rooms, and I could see that my parents had given me the bigger room, and with Travis being the younger one, he got the smaller room. I remember going to my room to unpack, and I don't exactly remember what made me decide to do this, but something must have shook me because I remember deciding that night that I didn't want the bigger room. I told my parents I wanted the smaller room, and although they were confused, they agreed to let us switch. So I went upstairs, and we moved our stuff to the opposite rooms. A little while later, my brother and I went downstairs for dinner, and we explored the rest of the house. In this house, there were three levels. The main floor, which had a kitchen, dining room, living room, half bath, and pantry, as well as a deck. Upstairs, which had three rooms, an office, a linen closet, and a full bathroom. And a basement, 
which had three open rooms and a utility closet. Despite sounding like a pretty big house, it was actually pretty small, outdated, and not in very good condition. We even had a mouse infestation at one point. Anyway, the basement is where we explored after dinner. Our dad went down first, saying that he wanted to show us something creepy. So we followed, and we went down these really creaky old wooden steps. The kind that are open so you can see behind them, if you know what I mean. When we got downstairs, my dad turned on the light in the first room, and we saw that it was mostly concrete, except for the ceiling, which was wood, as the main floor was above us. There were two rooms off of this room. If you were standing on the stairs looking into this first main room, you would see a second room north of it, and a third room east of it. In the first room, however, there was a rope hanging from the ceiling, hung over one of the beams, and there was some questionable staining on the floor that also splattered up the side of the west wall. My dad told us, someone died down here, and so we should never come down there, otherwise we would see a ghost. My brother and I laughed because our dad was the type that would use things like the boogeyman and woozies to keep us from getting out of bed at night. So I think we both figured he was just trying to scare us from going into the basement. In all honesty, to this day, I still have no explanation as to whether or not the claim that someone died down there was true, or what that mysterious stain was. But, after you learn about everything that happened in Unit 53, you can decide for yourself. Fast forward a bit, because I have no recollection of the time between then and this next segment. It was Easter of 2004. My grandma had driven into our town for a yearly visit that she would do every Easter. During her stay, I had asked her to sleep in my room. She slept one night in my room and one night with my brothers. I remember her saying that I should have taken the bigger room because I had much more stuff than my brother and thus making my smaller room seem more uncomfortable for sleepovers. I figured she had a good point and obviously whatever creepy feelings I got on the first night didn't mean anything. After all, it had been months and everything was fine. So, I can't recall how soon after she left, but I did end up moving into that bigger room. And that's when things really kicked in. So by this time, after living in this townhouse complex for a while, my brother had made some friends. I, being the antisocial child, stayed inside doing my own thing most of the time. So one afternoon, my brother was playing outside with his friends. My mother was sleeping in her room and I was doing a paint-by-number of a cat. At this point, my dad had already left us and my mom was on drugs, so she was most likely sleeping after a long night of partying. I really loved doing paint-by-numbers, so it was kind of a relaxing afternoon for me. As I was doing my thing, the closet door behind me made a quick, loud bang noise. This wasn't new for me. It happened frequently at night and would wake me from a sound sleep. When I would tell my mother about it, she would tell me it was just the house settling. So, this time when the closet banged, I thought nothing of it and continued painting. A moment or two passed, maybe less than a minute, and it happened again. But this time, I heard the closet door also slowly slide open. Remembering it now gives me chills. I can still feel the air catch in my lungs as I reminisce of hearing the metal door slide against the metal frame. At this point, I was really reluctant to turn around. I remember trying to convince myself that I was just hearing things, but I turned around anyway, and lo and behold, my closet door was slid open about five inches. I stared at it for a few seconds and forcefully decided that it was nothing. It was probably already open. I'm probably just hearing things. You ever swear you see something move and you find every logical explanation to write it off? I turned back around and picked up my brush to paint again. At that point, 
I kid you not, a child's voice spoke to me and said, Do you want to play a trick? I remember every hair on my body standing up and feeling completely paralyzed. I didn't scream like you see in the movies, I just simply sat there like I'd been petrified. Finally, I got the courage to stand and I ran right into my mother's room. She was sleeping and I was trembling, tears streaming down my face trying to wake her up. I don't know if you've ever tried to wake someone up who's sleeping off a drug hangover, but it's really difficult. Finally, she woke up enough to ask me what was going on. And I remember saying to her, Mom, there's a kid in my room. Please wake up. It's asking me to play tricks. She mumbled that it was just my brother. I pleaded with her, No, Mom, he's outside playing with his friends. But she wasn't listening. And by the time I finished my sentence, she'd passed out again. I was crying so hard. I had never been this scared in my entire life. I peeked out of my mom's door frame and looked down the hallway into my room and I couldn't see anything. I don't know how long I stood there before I booked it down the hall, down the stairs, and ran outside. I ran into the backyard and found my brother. I was crying while telling him what had just happened. He told me that he didn't believe me, that I was just trying to scare him. But then he told me he had a surprise for me. This surprise was a girl my age. Her name was Sarah. And we ended up being the very best of friends. She came over and asked me why I was crying, but I was too embarrassed to tell her because I didn't want another person to tell me I was crazy. So I shook it off and spent the rest of the afternoon playing with her. Sarah and her brothers would end up finding out that my house was haunted though. Later on, after a particularly scary event in my basement, they would refuse to ever come over to my house anymore. When Sarah and her brother were called to go in for dinner, my brother and I made our way back to our house too, and I started to feel really afraid again. I really didn't want to go into the house. My brother, feeling brave, probably because he didn't believe me at the time, told me to wait outside and he would go in and look around. I waited, and eventually he came back out and told me that he'd checked everywhere and that everything was fine. Little did he know that everything would not be fine. And little did I know that all of this was just the beginning. The house that I grew up in and my parents' denial of its haunting is what got me into the paranormal. So many things happened as I was growing up that for the first years of my life that I can remember, I just thought it was normal. Before I get into the activity, I should probably provide some backstory. My father told my mom long before they bought the house that something demonic was attached to him. He said one day while driving, he looked into the rear view mirror and saw what he could only describe as a demon sitting in the car with him. He won't describe what he saw, but he told her that at the time he felt he'd always been running from it. She firmly believes that he brought this entity into our house and that she and I were both targets of it. Growing up, even my friends knew that my house was haunted. Numerous people I had over would witness doors opening and closing and every single one of them would feel immensely uncomfortable in the basement. I remember that my former best friend and I would tell my parents about a skeleton that lived in the basement. They would play this off as our imagination until they also started to become victims to whatever lived in our home. My mom regularly experienced sleep paralysis, which in and of itself can be debunked but not when coupled with the almost absurd amount of poltergeist activity and my parents' accounts of what would happen to me in that house. Not long after her first night of sleep paralysis, the alarm clock she kept by her bed flew off the nightstand and slammed into the wall. I remember hearing a woman screaming at the bottom of our stairs one night and neither of my parents heard it. I was fully awake 
and to this day I get chills thinking about it. Once I was sitting next to an unplugged fan, and it turned on full blast. I would later learn as an adult that an old man had died in my parents' bedroom, which was a hot spot for this type of activity. Hearing footsteps upstairs while my friends and I were in the basement became so real and routine that we called the police at least twice, believing the house was being robbed. I saw an apparition of a little girl and a cat sitting at my kitchen table one day. I don't know how, but I somehow became instantly aware that the cat's name was Moonbeam. From that day forward, I regularly felt the cat jump up on the bed and rest at my feet. I would always feel at peace during these occurrences. Once, while I was home alone, I felt a sharp sting as though I had been shot with a paintball, and one of my dog's bouncy balls bounced away from me. Something had actually thrown it full speed toward my head. Later that same night, I was watching TV, and it turned to white static, and then a big black X was across the screen. I still believe it's possible that this was a cable glitch of some kind, but I've never experienced it before or since. At this time, my parents had refused to believe me for my own protection. In reality, they were fully aware and were having their own experiences, but they didn't want to scare me. In protest, I set up my webcam to take pictures every few seconds while I went to school. While nobody was home, it captured a large red human-shaped figure standing in the center of my room, facing the camera. Even then, they refused to acknowledge it, but to this day they remember that incident. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, suddenly hyper aware that someone was about to enter my bedroom. I would feel all the hair on my body stand on end, and I would hide under the covers until I felt this presence leave. This became a regular occurrence as I got older. As I became a teen and really started finding all of this fascinating, I bought ghost hunting equipment and started using an old version of today's ghost box. Clear as day in the basement, I heard a deep voice call me by my first and last name. I later caught an EVP in my bedroom of two female voices talking about me as if they were wondering if I could hear them. I had indeed heard these voices before, but I couldn't place them. A lot of this probably sounds too intense to be true, and that's okay. But after reading some experiences, I thought I wanted to share mine. I still actively ghost hunt, and now I live very far from the house in which I grew up, but I will never forget it. This all took place six years ago when I was 14. The backstory of this house is quite odd. The official report of the incident that took place here was coincidentally lost. I know that sounds fake and unreal, but I swear on my life that it's true. Nobody has found the incident report. Although the story of the house was known by most kids, grandparents, and parents who lived near the house at the time the incident occurred back in the late 80s and early 90s, no official report can be uncovered. The house was occupied by a family of four. The father of the household took the lives of his two children and his wife as they slept, and then he himself went into the basement and took his own life. The neighbor immediately reported the incident after hearing a gunshot from the house. The cops arrived, asked questions, took statements, and removed the bodies. Some of the residents who used to live in the area told the cops that the father of the family wasn't a violent man, and that he wouldn't go and kill his family like he did, and that he must have been possessed. From then up until the day that the building was torn down, after my visit of course, it was reported to be very haunted. My friend, let's call him Mike, invited me over for a sleepover at his parents' rental, which was this house. 
At the time, I loved ghosts and the paranormal, but he didn't tell me that the house was haunted until I arrived at the house. I was a bit skeptical, but his parents backed him up with the backstory that I had just told you. I arrived at his house and he had everything packed up, from his Xbox 360 to snacks and drinks. All I had was my backpack full of games and my go-to box from the Waffle House, which contained two chocolate chip waffles. We started to head down to the rental, which was in the same neighborhood as Mike's house. We arrived at around 3 in the afternoon. The house looked quite nice in its simple layout, with a separated two-car garage. Just to give you a feel and an insight of the house's layout, when you walk in the front door, immediately to your left was the living room. Behind that was the kitchen. Next to the kitchen, across from where the front door was in the foyer, was the dining room. And behind the dining room was the back door to the back porch. As you walk toward the dining room, the hallway was to your right. On the left of that hallway is first the door to the basement. Next to it is a small closet and next to that was the first bedroom, across from which was the second bedroom. And to your immediate right in the hallway was the full hall bathroom. The master bedroom was located directly in the back. When you enter the master bedroom, the bathroom is on your immediate right. To the left of the bathroom is a medium walk-in closet. Across from where you're standing is the bed against the wall with no footboard. We walk in, Mike set up his Xbox, and I put all the food in the fridge. We immediately started playing video games after we got the system up and running. After about an hour or so, there was no paranormal activity whatsoever. I eventually got up to go get my waffles because I was tired of Doritos. When I opened the fridge, I noticed that my to-go box was open and that one of the waffles was missing. I knew that Mike couldn't have been the one that took it because he'd been in the living room with me the entire time. So I grabbed the to-go box and brought it back into the living room. I told him what I encountered and he thought it was kind of odd, but then he joked saying maybe the ghost wanted some real food. After about 20 minutes of more video games, we hear a door slam shut. We just looked at each other for a minute, and Mike told me to stop smiling so much because it looked creepy, but I was excited to finally catch some paranormal activity. Mike told me to go check on it, and without much hesitation, I did. I slowly walked down the hall, checking each room, nothing out of the ordinary. When I reached the master bedroom, nothing was out of place, nothing on the bed. I then heard the water running which I didn't hear when I entered the room, and the door to the bathroom was open, not closed. The same was with the closet door as well, so I couldn't figure out what had slammed shut. I called Mike in to show him the running water. We entered the bathroom, turned the water off, and started looking around to see if anything had fallen or was out of place, but nothing was out of the ordinary. It wasn't until we started to leave when Mike stopped dead in his tracks. I asked him what was wrong, and all he did was point to the bed. I kid you not, the waffle that had disappeared was on the bottom right corner of the bed on a styrofoam plate. I told Mike to go to the end of the hall and asked if he could see it, and he said that he could. But he swears up and down when he walked into the room to check out my find, he didn't see it on the bed, and I hadn't seen it either. He told me that if it was on the bed, you could have seen it as clear as day. We both thought it was spooky, but personally, I loved it. We returned to the living room and played some more while discussing what we'd seen. After about 40 minutes, we get the jump of our lives. All of the cupboards and drawers in the kitchen opened and slammed simultaneously. We both jumped out of our skin. I went to check it out, but it was just crazy to think that all the cupboards and all the drawers opened and slammed at the same time. A few minutes later, we hear a small clang coming from the basement. We both ruled out the heater since it was midsummer, and the AC because the AC was already on. It was at this point that Mike decided to bounce because he was officially creeped out. I, on the other hand, decided to stay for the rest of the night. He let me keep the Xbox with me so I would have something to do. About 20 minutes later, Mike calls me. I put him on speakerphone so I could play my game. He asked if anything had happened since he left, and 
As soon as I said no, a loud bang came from the basement. It sounded like somebody took a crowbar and hit a barrel with it. I immediately rushed to the basement door. I am a bit hesitant at first, but I open the door and flick on the light and run down the stairs with my phone. Mike is dead silent on the other end, and then he breaks his silence as I'm searching for the source of the bang. He asks if there's anything down there, and I told him no. The basement is finished and it's quite big and fully furnished. I see and hear nothing, so I go to leave. I was halfway up the stairs when I hear what sounds like a man moaning in pain at the bottom of the steps. I take off up the steps and slam the door and lock it. I asked Mike if he had heard it on his end and he said he did, and that truly scared the crap out of me. I reluctantly regained my composure and told Mike that I was still going to stay the night. He told me I was crazy for wanting to stay. The true reason I stayed was because I had always wanted to be a paranormal investigator and this was my chance to prove myself. I ended up staying the whole night, playing video games. The paranormal activity did not stop. It was frequent. Every few minutes I would hear one of the doors slam or one of the sinks would start running. At one point all of the doors shut at once, except for the basement, front and back door of course, since they were already closed. The second creepy incident was when I heard the shower in the master bedroom come on. I went to check it out and turned it off. By this point, I was more annoyed than intrigued, because the only thing these ghosts seemed to want to do was mess with me. So anyway, I'm leaving the bathroom, and I scan the master bedroom for anything out of place. And sure enough, I see it. It was small at first, but then it got bigger. It was on the bed. It looked like someone or something was sitting on the edge of the bed, and then started to lay on the bed, but nothing was visible except for the large indent that they were making. I quickly called Mike and told him what I saw. He flipped out and told me I should leave. I told him to relax and said that I was going to be fine. For the rest of the night, the door slamming continued, along with random drawers and cabinets being opened when I knew they were closed. Also, water was running from random sinks, like I said, and those ghostly things went as far as to dump the trash all over the kitchen. Unnecessary. Finally, the sun came up, and I hadn't even gotten a single moment of sleep. I packed up and went to Mike's house and told his parents that I had to keep the house tidy because the ghost really loved trashing the place. This part is the third creepiest thing that happened. When I got back to my house, Mike called me. He sounded completely frantic. I told him to calm down and just tell me what was wrong. He said a little bit after I left his house, his parents went back with him to the rental. He and his parents entered the house, only to see that the entire thing was upside down. The furniture was flipped over. The kitchen was a disaster, with water running. Utensils were on the floor. Silverware was everywhere. Trash was on the floor, as well as the contents of the fridge. But there was no sign of forced entry or a break-in and I know that I made sure all the doors and windows were locked before I left. The fourth incident is the one that really made me crap myself. Mike told me that when they opened the basement door, the inside of the door had long, large, deep scratches carved into it. Obviously this scared me and my friend because whatever did that to the door could probably have done that to me while I was in the basement the night before if it really wanted to. The house was demolished a year later and the ground it stood on was blessed by a local Catholic priest. A new home stands there now, but nobody has ever witnessed anything paranormal, yet. A couple of years ago, I was working at a job with somebody who told me, pretty much from the point that I met her, that she was psychic. Now, I'm a believer in the paranormal, in psychics, in energy, all that jazz. It wasn't a stretch for me to believe that she might be telling the truth, but I can assure you now that I very much believe she's the real deal. When the activity started, it was just one very small thing. I had a little arctic fox plushie that I kept on my bed. 
I would come home to find it being dead center on my bed. It was only ever this one plushie, always right in the middle of my bed. I have a dog, and even though she had never moved any of my plushies around before, I kind of shrugged it off and decided that it was probably her moving it each day while I was at work. For days in a row, I would come home to this little fox just sitting there. I'd move it back to its proper spot every day, only to find it in the middle of the bed yet again when I came home from work the next evening. It was weird, but again, I had just shrugged it off as my dog doing these things. The next thing was a bit weirder. I would have vivid dreams, or at least I think they were dreams, where I would be laying in bed in the dark, and suddenly I would feel spiders crawling on my exposed skin. Anything over my blanket would have the sensation of spiders running across it. I would jump out of bed fully awake at that point and turn my light on to investigate. I never found a single spider or bug anywhere. The third thing I experienced was the very last thing I could try to explain away. I was laying in bed one night, kind of drifting off as I listened to a horror narrator on YouTube, something I had accredited to what I saw. I was laying on my back, facing the ceiling and the top of my headboard. My headboard is incredibly high. I have one of those bed dresser headboard combo things. It's hard to explain, but basically my headboard is a tall dresser with cabinets and drawers surrounding my actual mattress. And the part above my bed is this alcove with mirrors and two built-in lights that sit inside of it, with the top of the headboard slash dresser thing being what the lights were fixed into. Anyway, I had a light on the headboard turned on, so as I was blinking in and out of sleep while listening to these stories, I opened my eyes only to see a small black shadow quickly duck behind the ridge of the top of my headboard. I blinked a few times, but I didn't see the shadow again. However, I passed it off by telling myself that it was probably just my imagination from being so tired and listening to scary stories. I turned off my light and went to sleep. The fourth and final experience leading up to the end of this story is the one that made me stop denying that something was definitely happening. One night, I was doing my routine of listening to scary stories and relaxing in bed, and I went to plug in my cell phone. The place where I plug in my phone is right next to where I used to keep my chunky rubber bracelets, you know, the ones you would get from Hot Topic or something. So I go to plug in my phone, and as I turn over to put the charger in the outlet, I see, not a foot in front of my face, one of my rubber bracelets move at least an inch to the right, directly in front of me. It didn't roll, it slid across the wooden surface. I sat straight up, surprised. I knew what I saw. There was no explaining that away. I just kind of sat there for a few minutes in a what-the-hell kind of shock, and eventually I plugged in my phone and went to bed. At this point in the story, I should tell you that I not once mentioned these experiences to anybody. Not my family, not my boyfriend, not my co-workers, nobody. This is important, because the next day after I saw that bracelet move, I went into work. As I sat down at the break room table, only one other person was in the room at the time. You guessed it, it was my psychic coworker. The moment my butt hit the chair, she casually asks me, so what's going on in your room? Stunned, I took a moment to compose myself and then explained, I thought there was something, but I, I wasn't sure. She nodded. Oh yeah, you have a trickster in your room. It probably got in through your mirrors. I was shocked, because to my knowledge, she'd never seen my bedroom. She never even saw pictures that I can remember. There's a chance looking back that I may have showed her a picture of my Halloween setup in my room before, but I honestly can't remember, and I don't think I did. Either way, her words shocked me. 
I asked her what she thought I should do about it, and she told me to sage my room, especially the mirrors, and to tell it to leave. When I went home that night, I did just that. I actually grow sage in my backyard, and I make bundles to smudge my house on occasion, so getting my hands on some sage was not an issue. I went around my room, smudging my closet, the whole room, and the mirrors, ending at the window that I had open on the far side of my bedroom. As soon as I got to the window to finish my smudging, the whole freaking thing burst into flame. I had to immediately put the smudge stick out because it just freaking ignited the second I got to the window. Immediately, I texted my coworker and told her what happened. She explained that the sage bursting into flames was the entity leaving, a final trick as it went away. I closed the window and put the sage away, and that was the end of that. I never had anything like what had occurred in the weeks prior happen again. But I have to say, after the whole thing was said and done, I got curious and I looked up tricksters. And what came up kind of cemented that this was, in fact, very real for me. One of the ones listed was a spider trickster, and another was a fox. I'm not sure which one it was, but considering it kept moving my fox plushie, I figure maybe that's why. I just thought I would share this experience and see if anybody else has had any experiences with the tricksters. For a little backstory, I have never experienced sleep paralysis before in my life. This is my first experience ever with it. I have three little girls, four years old, two years old, and four months old. Yesterday afternoon, I had been having battery and cold air intake issues with my car, and I needed to work on it in order to be able to get into work on Monday morning. Therefore. My retired grandmother kept the girls overnight to assist me in getting everything that I needed to get done done for work. Let's start with Saturday. Have you ever heard of the creepy fact that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason at all, it means that somebody was staring at or watching you? This is because it was instinctively bred into us as a protective instinct. Our senses are heightened in this moment to protect us from a possible threat that had been eyeing us down while we were asleep. Well, this happened to me Saturday at 3 a.m. As I awoke, I heard an eerie whistling in my ear. I quickly checked my surroundings, bobbing and weaving my eyes through every crevice that whoever or whatever was watching me could be hiding. I found nothing and heard nothing else, and I was able to doze back off fairly quickly. Sunday night came along, last night, I had trouble falling asleep, a lot more than usual, and I wasn't stressed or anything like that. My sleep schedule hasn't changed more than an hour, more or less, and I'm used to getting about six and a half to seven hours of sleep at night, so absolutely nothing was different. I had been tossing and turning from midnight to 1.30 in the morning, going in and out of catnap mode. I couldn't seem to get my brain to have a reasonable reboot. Once I had become comfortable for the last time, I hadn't even noticed that I had finally shut down for a sleep restoration. The first thing I remember is my grandmother's house. It had a dark blue tint that blanketed the whole house. Every room, wall, everything was hued in blue. I remember walking through and checking in each room. I guess I was unintentionally checking on my girls that were sleeping over at my grandmother's house. I felt like I was astral projecting. I knew that I was consciously awake and walking around her house. I knew each room that I was walking into. Whatever my subconscious was worried about, everything was fine. My grandparents and baby girls were all sound asleep, peaceful. I watched them for a couple of minutes, checking their breathing, and then I started to walk home. 
In a matter of seconds, I was walking through my door, my husband still asleep on the couch, but something didn't feel right. The ominous blue light was still blanketing every room, every corner. Imagine putting a blue light bulb in every fixture and then turning them all on. It was like that. I sat at my dining room table to meditate and clear my head before returning my body back to the couch. I needed my conscience to stop wandering and rest. As I sat there, I heard a voice that had multiple tones working together in harmony to create the most demonic and ominous voice I've ever heard. I felt my mind, my body, and my voice lose control. I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. I couldn't think for myself. He took control. The voices got louder. A female voice and a deep male voice harmonized to create a legion-like sound. They kept repeating, you are everything, you are everything, until I began to say it in harmony with them. I had no control. My mind didn't want to repeat it, but I had no choice. I felt like I was being possessed. Anyone could take over what felt like an empty shell I used to call my body at this point. What they were saying changed. The woman's voice disappeared, and it was just the deep and demonic male voice I heard now. He said, I am everything, I am everything, repeating and repeating. At this point, I felt my body and mind fighting back. I was fully conscious and awake now, fighting as hard as I could to keep my shell of a body contained by its rightful owner. I was screaming my husband's name, but I knew he couldn't hear me. Not yet. I had to keep screaming to wake my body up. I felt my brain's confusion. It was fighting me while I was fighting my demon. We weren't working together and I could sense it all. I started to communicate, trying to move my body. I knew I couldn't. I knew that I was caught. My ribs, my hips, my thighs were glued where I lie on my left side, unmovable. I could only move my head. My screams for my husband became muffled, which is much more than I could say just moments before. I turned my head and looked behind me. I needed to be released. I had to be let go. As I whipped my head to my rear, a tall and skinny shadow towered over me, enjoying my struggle, gluing me where I lie. Large, skinny hands with slender, rigid fingers pushed me deeper into my couch, held my body in a trance. There were no features, just a black and haunting silhouette that had been forcing me to say everything I had earlier. He was the one. I was finally able to communicate to my brain to move, anything, just move. Still a fight that I had to put up, but at least I knew I was finally winning. Finally, my screams were no longer muffled. My husband finally heard me, as a relief had washed over me, and it was gone. I was able to sit up, patting myself with shaking hands to make myself aware that I was back. I was me again, and I finally had control once more. I went out and had a cigarette to calm my nerves. I felt the smoke hit me, and the nicotine soothe my mind, but I still felt and knew the pain, the struggle, and the torture that I had gone through and I wonder if it will happen again. I don't know who these voices were. I don't know what the demon was that calls himself everything. Will he come back for me again, even when I fought back so hard and won? I can't find the answers that I need, but I know this wasn't just a nightmare or some freak accident. There was a reason this happened to me, and I need to know what it was. When I was around 16 years old, my friends and I decided it would be fun to go out to an old abandoned farmhouse that was rumored to be haunted. We didn't really believe in ghosts at the time, but we were fascinated by the thrill of potentially experiencing something paranormal. 
So, on a hot summer night in July, we decided to take two cars out to this abandoned farmhouse. There were six of us in total. It took about 45 minutes to drive to this place, so we left at around 2.15 a.m. because we wanted to arrive at this place by 3, ghosting hour. To get to the house, we drove down a dark, winding rural road with houses few and far between. There weren't any street lights, so although it was a warm summer night, it still felt scary as we drove through the unfamiliar place in the pitch black. As we arrived at the house, I felt nearly sick to my stomach. I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal at the time, but something in my gut just felt wrong. It all felt wrong. The house was situated at the bottom of two hills and there was no driveway in front of it. So we had to park at the top of the hill where there was an area off to the side of the road covered with crushed rock. We got there just in time to fulfill our plan of arriving at ghosting hour. As we walked down the hill, we saw the house. It basically looked exactly how you would picture an old abandoned farmhouse, exposed gray wood, pieces of siding falling off, and overgrown plants around the entrance. There were two levels to the house. The first level had two windows on either side of the door, and the top had three windows, one to the left, one to the right, and one immediately above the door. As we walked closer to the house, we saw that the door was open, so we dared each other to go inside. We formed a line to enter the house. Two of my friends, who were guys, went in front of me, and I was the third in line to enter the house. The first guy is friend number one, and the second is friend number two. As we enter the house, I immediately felt ice cold. I have never felt that kind of cold in my life. I felt it in my bones. As soon as I felt the cold, I heard friend number one scream at the top of his lungs. It all happened so fast that I could barely make out what it looked like inside. I mostly remember an uninviting couch laid across the stairs with the living room to the left of the stairs and the kitchen to the right. It was like walking back in time. Old floral wallpaper peeling off the walls. In the seconds after friend number one screams, we all run out of the house immediately. As I look back toward the entrance, I notice that only friend number two exited the house behind me and friend number one was still screaming inside the house, like blood-curdling, fearful screams. Everything happened so fast. Friend number two ran back inside the house, grabbed the first friend, and pulled him out. My first friend was so scared that he ran out from the house screaming that something was holding him up in the air by his shirt. He rips off his shirt while he's running, and all I see are three big tears in the back of it. It kind of looked like three prongs from a pitchfork that had been ripped through it, but it didn't end there. As my second friend stepped foot outside the door, he starts yelling in pain. I looked back and he had blood dripping all over his face onto his shirt. I literally felt like I was in a horror movie. He came toward me and I was in full instinct mode. I took my sweater off and gave it to him to try to stop the bleeding. He just tells me that something hit him in the nose and he needs to get to the hospital. So we run back up the hill, which felt like it took a thousand years, and we finally get to the car. When we get in, I handed friend number two a tissue to clean up his nose, and I shined my light on it to see what was bleeding. His right nostril had a clean cut all the way through it. It looked like someone took scissors or shears and cut all the way through, and it got worse. As we're driving away, my friend and I both look back at the house, and there's a candle lit in the top left window. Then, as I looked to the other side of the road, there's this old trailer with a light on, and the silhouette of a man with a hat in the window. 
I am 100% convinced that this man was an evil spirit. Just the feeling I got off of him, staring at me, watching me as I drove by. I still feel chills when I think about it. I felt like it was a warning to never come back to this property. It felt like he was the spirit that hurt both of my friends, and he was sending me a message. On the drive back, we ended up bringing my friend to the nearest ER, where they stopped the bleeding and stitched up his nose. He still has a scar from it, and his right nostril still looks dog-eared from where it split apart, and from the stitches where they healed. I will never mess around with the paranormal again. I'm 26 now, and I will never go near a haunted house or any building rumored to be haunted. I did some research about the house, and it turns out that two people died in the left top room of the house. One was by suicide, and another was a woman in childbirth. So it makes sense that there was a couch blocking the path up the stairs. I come from the county where Ireland's most haunted house, Loftus Hall, is located. If you want to know the history of Loftus Hall and the original story to it, I'm sure you'll find it on Google. People that have visited all have their own stories of experiences at the house, and I'm going to share with you some of my experiences that I've had over the years. I lived about 30 minutes drive away from here, so it was a destination that we visited a lot over the years. I remember the first time I visited the grounds of the house. I was maybe five or six years old and was visiting it with my uncle. As we drove up the long lane leading to the house, I remember looking at all of the windows and getting a shiver as we approached. We parked up and got out of the car. I stood and stared at the house as we walked around the grounds. We walked around to the side of it where, at the time, there were apple trees. The apples were red and juicy. We picked some and put them in a bag to bring home with us. When we got home, we got the apples out of the bag, and every single apple had a rotten part on one side. I mean a big, green, gooey lump on all of them, and they'd been perfectly fine when we picked them. Another time when I was around 14, I'd gone to Loftus Hall with my friend and his mom. There's a nearby lighthouse that's open for people to visit, and we visited there first. When we got to the house, there were a few people around, and there was a young American family there, a mom, a dad, and two girls aged around five and nine. The two girls were running around and playing on the grounds of the house when they ran up to their parents laughing. The nine-year-old said, Mommy, Mommy, Anne wants to show us something. Can we go to her room? Now, this may seem like normal childhood behavior, except Anne is the name of the girl in the original haunting story of Loftus Hall. If you research it, You'll find out everything about the history of the house, including Anne. I must also mention that the actual house was not open to guests to go in and out as they pleased at this time. You had to book a tour, and there were only three to four tours a day. When I was 16, that was my first time going into the house. We booked a tour on Halloween night. There were some ghost hunters who did an overnight stay. They did it every Halloween and a certain number of guests could stay there with them for the night. We arrived and went in, and we set up our sleeping bags while the ghost hunter crew set up their equipment. We took the tour of the house at night in groups of five. The tour guide led us around. We visited each room with the guide giving a story to each of the rooms. We got to a room called the Tapestry Room. This is the most famous and apparently the most haunted room in the building. It's said that Anne was locked in this room, and that she died in the room as she stared out the window, 
waiting for some mysterious stranger to return. Again, the details of this story are online. She was locked in here and sat with her knees to her chin, and when she died her body couldn't be straightened. Anyway, we entered this room and it was freezing. One of the guests in our group, and I don't know if they were paid actors or what, but they collapsed and went into a fit, arms and legs flailing everywhere. An ambulance was called and he was sent to the hospital, which makes me think he wasn't an actor. I don't know why they would go to that length. Apparently it happens often that people go into that room, collapse, and then have seizures. The house is situated on a cliff with the sea in the background. About four years ago, we went for a drive down there on a foggy, cloudy evening. We were looking out to sea and we saw the outline of a ship. It looked like something out of Pirates of the Caribbean, but it floated through the fog and then vanished. There have been hundreds of encounters regarding this house that are noted everywhere on the internet. Everyone has their own stories of visiting, from feeling queasy in certain parts of the house, to seeing full-on apparitions in the windows, to meeting people while on tours that nobody else who was on the same tour remembers. There is also a hole in the ceiling that goes through the roof, and this is where the devil or demon flew through to escape from the house, according to legend. Over the centuries, the hole has been repaired multiple times, but each time it's repaired, it lasts only a few days, and the hole will come again in the exact same place. Eventually, they stopped fixing it. I lived in this particular house from ages 10 to 17, and in that time, the paranormal activity was the worst I have ever experienced in my life. I hope to never live in a place that haunted ever again. I am a strong believer in God, so my idea of the paranormal is that they are demons, not just your average ghost. As I said, this house was messed up. I experienced too many uncomfortable situations there, but this was by far the worst one. This happened roughly 10 years ago, when I was about 13 or so. My parents and sister were out of town about three hours away, leaving me home alone for the entire weekend. I was in my bedroom getting ready for bed when I heard boom 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 on my bedroom door. Figuring my parents were home early and I hadn't heard them call my name, I opened my door to find nobody there. Confused, I searched the entirety of my house and called my family, only to learn that all of them were still three hours away. Totally creeped out by this, I went back into my room and this time locked and closed my door. I went back to getting ready for bed, and not more than five minutes later, I hear the same boom 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 on my bedroom door. I ran over to my door and this time the door was wide open with the handle still locked. I slammed my door shut, got into bed and kept all of the lights on. I don't think I slept at all that night. The next morning my family came home and I never had that door pounding incident happen again, thankfully. I watched a movie a few years later that indicated something about three knocks meaning that a demon was around, because they're mocking the Holy Trinity. That kind of scared the heck out of me, even if it was in retrospect. It might not sound as scary to some as it will to others, but to experience that at 13 years old, in an empty house, so close to me, was completely terrifying especially since I had experienced other strange occurrences in the house before. The other night, I couldn't get back to sleep after my husband woke me up, 
and told me that he saw a woman in a white nightgown at the foot of our bed. The woman was standing on my side of the bed, just looking, not my husband's side. I would have written it off as sleep paralysis, but about seven years ago, I might have seen the same figure. I was house-sitting at a friend's house and saw this lady in a white nightgown floating above me, looking straight at me. I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't move my body. Suddenly, she just went away. I wonder if this woman that my husband saw is the same woman that I saw seven years ago. However, I don't live in the same place where I saw this figure when I was younger. I used to live in Hawaii, but about four months ago we moved to Missouri into our new home that was built about 15 years ago. My husband and I get the feeling that our place may be haunted, but I'm not sure. I wonder if it's just our imagination. So far, we have experienced the security alarms going off for no reason. I've seen all of the lights shut completely off for like five seconds. Both my husband and I have seen our walk-in closet door open on its own when it was completely shut, which we think could possibly be due to the temperature of the room. I'm not sure though. I have felt a poke in my back, but I'm not sure if I'm just imagining things. I'm thinking about getting the house blessed because I'm really freaked out. I don't know if something followed me from Hawaii or if this is a completely different entity altogether. Tonight I was having dinner at the Manalani Golf Course on the Big Island of Hawaii. I had to use the restroom pretty badly, so I had my husband hold my things as I rushed into the women's restroom around the corner. Normally I get a creepy vibe from public restrooms anyway, but this time it was a lot more than that. I had a tight feeling in my chest as soon as I walked in. There were four stalls and only the second one was closed. I quickly glanced underneath that second stall to check if it was occupied, and it was empty. All of a sudden, I started hearing this wailing sound that progressively got louder as I got closer to the third stall, which I had decided to use. The sound got so loud and terrifying that I just couldn't do it and decided to bolt out of there. As soon as I turned around and started to run, I heard something coming after me. I fumbled with the door a bit because I forgot that it was a pull instead of a push. Once I finally turned out of the corner, the footsteps behind me stopped. There was still nobody there. I saw my husband and said, fuck that. He looked confused. I still had to go pretty badly though, so I decided to just make him come with me. I forced him to enter the women's restroom. At this point, I didn't really care if anybody walked in. As I expected, the noise was gone. I entered the third stall just like I had planned initially, and while I was hanging up my purse, a few charms from my bracelet got caught and broke off. In an effort to make myself feel better, I thought, maybe that sound was just from the toilet flushing or filling back up. Maybe it was the vents. I flushed the toilet hoping that I was right, but it did not make that wailing sound. I washed my hands as quickly as I could and rushed the hell out of there. If you've ever been to use the women's restroom at the Mount Alani golf course next to Shiono, and you've had a similar experience, please let me know. I'm terrified about what the hell just happened, and I'm wondering if I was just imagining things. So, I've got about three possible glitch in the matrix experiences, but this one is the major one. I was living with my brother on the island of Lanai in Hawaii doing construction on a hotel. This must have happened maybe a month or so into the job. When I got home from work one day, I noticed that I had a notification on my phone from Facebook. It was a reply to a message I had made. I didn't remember responding to anyone's post recently, so I was confused. When I checked the Facebook post, I was flabbergasted to discover that I had indeed replied to somebody. 
The post was a picture of a pillow with coordinates on it. They were for the city of Kihei, Maui. Someone made a comment saying that they had a dog named Kihei. My comment in reply to this was, was it an ugly dog? And the reply to that was something like, are you saying that Kihei is ugly? So my brother and I had lived in Kihei for about eight months before moving to Lanai. I had some good and bad times there, but that was mostly due to issues with my brother and being an alcoholic. So when we moved to Lanai, my brother and I made it a commitment not to drink. And there was only one bar in town that we lived in, which closed at 11. So you would think that the reason that I don't remember writing would be that I must have been blackout drunk the night before. But I know for sure that this was not the case. The reason I think it might be an alternate personality coming out was because the post was very mean, and I'm not a mean person. I kind of go out of my way in my mind to be too nice sometimes, maybe as a way to avoid conflict or just be more likable, I'm not really sure. But that was the only time in my life that something like that had happened, and nothing like it has ever happened since. Needless to say, I was freaked out. The person who posted the pillow picture, I didn't even know that well. I had her number because she was a neighbor of ours in Maui, and we got some substances from her once in a while. I messaged her to apologize as best I could and then proceeded to delete Facebook, which I regret because there were still some pictures on there that I wish I had today. But anyway, that's the story. Definitely one of the freakiest experiences of my life. I used to live on a military base in Hawaii. My father was in the Navy, and there wasn't much to do there. I don't know exactly what my age was at the time, maybe around kindergarten? Hawaii didn't require kindergarten at the time, so I wasn't in school yet. I know that, at least. Outside of our house, there was a covered car park that people in the community used, because the houses didn't have garages, and there were various storm drains that were around the car park. I would always play there since it was right outside of our house. Not the brightest, but kids are dumb, right? So one day I was playing there and I thought it would be fun to drop things down the storm drain to see how far they went. I had dropped a couple of rocks and some small sticks, and eventually I ran out of things to throw, so I started saying, hello, to hear my echo. I didn't expect to hear anything other than my own voice, so I was surprised when I got a response. A little girl called back to me. I wasn't scared, I was just confused. I asked her what she was doing down there, and she said that she and her family lived down there. I remember that I kept trying to look closer in, but it was so dark you couldn't see the bottom at all. The storm drain went straight down and was covered by a grate, not like the drain that Pennywise used. We sat for a while and talked. I don't remember the whole conversation, but it went on for a while. I vividly remember the last part of it though, because I felt so guilty and hurt. Years later, I still do, even though I'm not sure this even happened. She wanted to play with me, and I said that I could invite her in for dinner, and she got really excited by that idea. So I ran inside and asked my mom if my friend could come over for dinner. She said no, and she wouldn't let me go back out to tell her. The next day, I went out to explain to my friend what had happened, but she wasn't there. I never heard from the little girl in the drain ever again. I remember crying that day. I blamed my mom for losing the only friend that I had made there. I would like to write this off, saying that it was just my imagination considering how young I was. But my mom still remembers this happening and how upset I was, and that I told her that she made me lose a friend. So maybe it did. I moved into an old inn up by the University of Hawaii, Manoa campus. Real creepy area. For a college area, you would think that there would be more people out and about, but if I ever drove down into the Manoa Valley at night, it just felt abandoned. 
barely a light on in any of the houses. Anyway, I was dating a local, and one day at work, my buddies and I got to talking about ghosts and things that we felt while on patrol at night. Obviously, there's a lot of energy surrounding Pearl Harbor. So when I got home, I messaged her and we started talking about my day. No ghosts yet. One of the questions that I asked her was basically, how come she never came to my apartment? Why did I always have to go to her place to visit? In the most serious tone she's ever had, she says, do you really want to know? It's because I can see things. Of course I want to know more, so I'm like, define things. And she proceeds to tell me that after her father passed away, she was able to see spirits or whatever, and because the Manoa Valley had a violent history, I guess an old Hawaiian tribal history, she didn't like going down there because it was overwhelming. Needless to say, this didn't make me feel comfortable at all living in my old ass little studio apartment in this creepy old mansion that was turned into an inn by the owners. So now our conversation moves to what I talked about at work, about how I was super weirded out now, because before it was just guys talking, but now my girlfriend's telling me she can see dead people, and things are taking a turn for the strange, and I'm not liking it. I tell her that I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight because I'm officially creeped the hell out. She proceeds to tell me not to worry. She's going to send her grandmother over to keep me company, which she explains won't be her grandmother's ghost, but her grandmother's spirit, and that this sweet old lady spirit is going to protect me. Yeah, that didn't help me any, but she reassured me that everything would be fine. Grandma would sing me to sleep and comfort me. Don't worry. <laughs> no way that I'm sleeping that night. No way in hell. Well, guess who passed out shortly after we hung up the phone and slept like a damn baby? This guy, supposedly because of her grandmother. But there was this one thing that woke me up. Around 3 a.m., a beer bottle I had in my sink fell over, woke me up for a fraction of a second. I didn't think twice and I went back to sleep. Go to work, come home, call the girlfriend. And she has a smart ass tone in her voice and says, so how did you sleep last night? Proceeded to do the whole I told you so thing about her grandma comforting me and keeping me safe. And then she goes, I'm really sorry about the beer bottle. My grandma didn't mean to disturb you and wake you, but uh, she did make sure you went back to sleep. Yeah, I was creeped out about that for the longest time. Nothing major ever happened after that. I broke up with the girl a couple of months later, but I'll tell you what, crazy couple of months, that's for sure. I rented a condo in Hawaii at the Hilton Turtle Bay on the north shore of Oahu. FYI, I can get a condo for a week on the hotel grounds for cheaper than a two-day stay at the hotel, so that's what I did. I arrived from California, put my stuff down, and headed out for the beach. After dark, I came back and eventually went to bed. The main bedroom was upstairs. As I'm trying to go to sleep, a woman screams at me from a couple of feet away, telling me to leave. It was really more like, get the fuck out. I'm shocked and rattled a bit. I say to myself, this is just a hypnagogic hallucination, and I try to make myself go back to sleep. I fall asleep and get screamed at again a few minutes later. I got out of bed and I remember actually saying out loud to myself, shit, rented a haunted condo. Then I said, I'm not leaving. I paid for a week. Leave me alone and I won't sleep in your bedroom, but I'm not leaving. The next day my good friend shows up. I tell him he can sleep in the main bedroom and he gives me a calculating look. So that night after some fun adventures he heads upstairs to go to sleep. I sit on the couch awaiting the news. He comes down 30 minutes later and says that I'm a total dick for not warning him about my bedroom. I innocently asked, what are you talking about? He said that some lady was screaming at him upstairs. I cracked up and told him that he's gonna have to sleep on the couch.
I'm not sure where exactly the story fits or even how to explain what happened that night, but I would love some feedback or insight. I was living in Hawaii temporarily on the big island. I was working on an organic farm in the Hawaiian jungle for a witch doctor and shaman. He was such a wonderful guy. I had no cell service in that part of the island unless I climbed this huge hill for one bar. This hill was made of cinder and lava rock and was created by a lava flow back in the 60s. It was about 100 feet high, maybe taller. The climb was difficult but feasible. One night I was very distraught because somebody that I had been traveling with and had trusted became extremely abusive and controlling. I had been keeping my husband informed back on the mainland and frequently checked in with him. I had suspicions that this friend was trying to trap me on the island with him and break up my husband and I. He had been trying to gaslight me and wipe out my self-esteem. The other people that I was traveling with were too scared to stand up to the guy. We got in a huge screaming match that day where I basically put him in his place and told him that I wanted nothing to do with him. I started making plans to ditch him and go work on a different farm. The witch doctor agreed. After dark, I go to the room that I was renting, laid down, and tried to calm myself to sleep. I woke up to realize that I had dozens of little fire ants in bed with me and had gotten stung all over. If you're not familiar, little fire ant stings suck. That was really the coup de grace of an already crappy few days. Against my better judgment, I slid out of bed, shook the fire ants off, grabbed my headlight, and began to trek up the treacherous hill to go talk to my husband. It was pitch black, and when I looked up, I could see the Milky Way. I took the meandering path to the base of the hill and climbed it. When I got there, I dialed my husband. Hawaii was six hours behind my hometown, so it was in the early morning hours for him. During the day, people mine the lava rock there and sell it to customers to decorate their yards. While I was talking to him, I suddenly got the horrible sensation that I was being watched from afar. I got the feeling that someone, or something, was up there with me. Something felt very wrong, and my intuition screamed that I was in danger. At first I thought it was somebody living up there that was just investigating me. I listened for footfalls. Nothing. I had been up there during the day and had gotten a really bad vibe before that I had just brushed off as the unknown. The hill was like a narrow cliff, and it was easy to slip off either side because of the unstable lava rock. The feelings I got were unusual because I felt like it hated me and wanted me dead. Almost like it wanted to scare me or even push me off the cliff. I was no stranger to this feeling because I've had other experiences in my hometown that gave me similar sensations. This is where it gets really odd. The air became very heavy and thick. It was suffocating. The insects went silent. The frogs stopped chirping. I could have heard a leaf fall, it was so silent. My breath caught in my chest as I froze. It was like the normal sounds of the outside all went silent at once. The feeling of being watched felt closer and more intense. My headlight dimmed, and this massive black thing engulfed me. It not only engulfed me, but my surroundings as well. I couldn't see the trees or the stars. The only thing that I could see was a few feet in front of my face from the feeble light coming from my headlamp. I was totally surrounded. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. It was terror unlike anything I have ever felt before. My light got dimmer and dimmer, and this thing felt like it was closing in, gradually, closer and closer. I got the feeling that it was going to push me off the precipice I was standing on. The anxiety I felt was pure fight or flight. I felt a wave after wave of adrenaline surge through my body. I began to shake all over and my knees became weak. I was totally surrounded and engulfed by this black thing. It was the blackest black I've ever experienced. The blackness looked alive somehow. I had never seen anything this dark in my entire life. It felt sentient, like it knew what it was doing. 
I could barely think. It felt as though I was being embraced by death. If I so much as breathed, I would die. Finally, it was just too close for comfort. I whipped around in circles and snarled. Leave me alone. Now. Get away from me. In my most aggressive, bigger than I felt tone. I tried to sound as mean and as threatening as possible. I know the sound of my voice had to carry on for miles in each direction. In a split second, I felt the heaviness and suffocating sensation disappear. My light was no longer dim. I could see the trees and the stars again. The frogs and the insects gradually started chirping again. Whatever had been there had gone. I hauled ass down that hill, slipping and sliding most of the way. I went back up there during the day over the next few days, and in some parts, it still had a bad vibe. I've given it a lot of thought, and I can't make sense of it. Can anyone tell me what I experienced that night? My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boars and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there you'd have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road, then drive about an hour up the mountain, off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin, and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding glass door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room. No doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot, not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling very vulnerable. At some point during that trip, my cousin, sister, and I started to wander around the outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing in small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but small, hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flow and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and can tell that it's a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say, be careful what you wish for, because one lava tube in particular had something in it. We smashed one, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones, sitting on long, brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but some kind of animal. Maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to it. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was really no physical way that a person could have put those there. Why didn't it get destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it. The only explanation we could think of was that it was an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we probably shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asked us if anybody had gone to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, weird, he said. I woke up and saw someone standing at the sliding door. I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other horrified, like, 
What if it was the person that left the offerings and we totally disturbed it and were screwed? We asked for more details. He said it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and that they were mad at me. It could have been a human, but given our location, it seems really unlikely. There were no other cabins or homes built on those hunting grounds, and you'd have to know exactly where it was if you went up there to camp. It's not somewhere that people would just stumble upon. Either way, I have never stayed there again. So the house my grandparents owned when I was younger had a lady in the basement. At least that's what I called her. My older sister called her the lady on the landing because she only ever saw her on the landing to the basement. Either way, basement. I haven't correlated any of my personal stories with my cousins or siblings except my own. My aunt used to live down there and I haven't dared try to ask her about it because she had an experience when she was younger where she was physically lifted out of bed by her ankles. And because of that, you can't even mention ghosts or paranormal things because she literally covers her ears and walks away. But that's another story for another day. Anyway, these are my personal stories and I'll try to keep them short and sweet. The first time I can recall seeing her, my aunt, a different one than the one I just mentioned, was over at my house with her son. We were all hanging out while my mom was working and my grandparents were in Hawaii. Now, for some reason, she chose to bathe me in the basement bathroom, which was weird because there was another fully functional bathroom with a bathtub on the second floor of the house, as well as a shower in my grandparents' room. My cousin was expecting his friends to come over and play, and the doorbell rang, so my aunt ran up to answer it, but had my cousin stay with me. I was maybe three or four at the time, and he was about nine so she wanted him to keep an eye on me so I didn't drown or anything. She called him up to go play with his friends, and as soon as he left the bathroom and was halfway up the stairs, they were pretty creaky so you could hear where he was, the door slammed shut and the lights turned off. All of a sudden, I see this woman literally in the mirror facing me, but it looked like she was getting ready to walk out of it because she was getting closer. Of course, I started screaming, my cousins on the other side of the door desperately trying to get in. My aunt comes flying down the stairs and couldn't get the door open either. She kept telling me to unlock the door, but hello, I'm stuck in terror and I'm also like four years old. Finally, she gets the door open and sees nothing. She flips on the switch and gets me out and nothing was ever really said about it. Later that week, I was again with my aunt as my mother was working. I asked if I could sleep in my grandma's bed since they weren't there, and at the time, at my little tiny size, that bed seemed humongous. She called them in Hawaii to ask their permission and they said that was fine. So I'm asleep in their bed and I'm not exactly positive if this was a dream or an actual experience that took place, but this is how it went. I was in the center of the bed. From there, you could see straight into their bathroom on the right side of the room and then straight down the hallway into the computer room. Mind you, this is on the second floor now, not the basement. In this experience, the bathroom light flipped on and I could see her again, coming out of the mirror. It was like I was locked in place, but I could see down the hall in the computer room, my mom sitting at my grandma's computer. I tried calling to her, but it came out as just a dull whisper. I tried over and over. Mommy, mommy. Mom, but the sounds wouldn't come out. The woman actually made it out of the mirror this time and got just a step out of the bathroom when I was able to get unlocked and I ran down the hallway into the room that my mother was in. Again, nothing was ever said about this. Another time, maybe two years later, my mom and I were sleeping in the basement bedroom and the closet doors were those full floor to ceiling mirrors. I saw her again, but my mother was in reaching distance and I woke her up. 
and she saw this woman too, grabbed me, and ran upstairs. I guess a more adequate name for her would be the lady in the mirror, but I've been calling her the lady in the basement for what seems like forever. Even though I've never personally verified this, I know for a fact from other people that my cousin has seen her on a number of occasions. My sister saw her, my brother saw her, and a couple of other cousins did when they would visit from out of state. But it really only affected us kids. Over the past couple of years, I have asked my mother about it and asked if she remembers it. My sister, my aunt that would watch me, and her son, and everyone else is pretty much on the same page of this was real. My mother's theory is that she was a family member from the past that just stuck with the family and didn't mean to be scary. She just was scary because we weren't used to seeing that sort of thing. I asked my grandpa about it last week over text if he recalls me ever saying anything about her. He replied back, no, and I'd prefer it if you didn't. Now here's the kicker. My grandma passed in December of 2018. I hadn't seen the lady in the basement since that particular house. They moved houses, hell they even moved states, and I never saw her in any of the other houses. Not once. But after my grandma died, I saw her in the house I was living in that wasn't even close to the original house that I had first seen her in. So I'm wondering if my mom's theory on her being a relative that passed and was just attached to us is true, and that when my grandma passed, she followed her but made her rounds to say goodbye or something. I'm wondering this because right after I saw her at my own house, I called my sister immediately and she freaked out because she had seen her at her house the day before. I haven't seen her since, and I pray to God that I never see her again. The location for this story is Iao Valley Road in Maui, Hawaii. There was a full moon, and we were in our teens. It was four guy friends and I, and we were told to park our car under a tree where somebody had apparently hung themselves, and the spirit would push your car uphill as long as you didn't look back. The first time we tried this, it was extremely slow, barely inching uphill, then stopped a little way up the hill. I drove back around to the spot where we were at to try it again. They all kept saying, don't look back or the spirit will stop pushing us so we didn't look back. The car moved faster, like the pace of someone walking. The car had the same jerking movements, like somebody was pushing it. There were a few moments that the car would completely stop, and then it moved some more. We made it a little farther down the road this time. We were getting really excited. My friends wanted to do it again, but with proof that I was not pushing the gas pedal. So while I was in the driver's seat, I parked under the tree, the gear was in neutral, and I had my feet hanging out the car window as proof that I was not pushing the gas pedal. The car started moving. My friends were laughing, pointing at my feet, saying, hey, who knows, maybe we'll go faster this time. I saw the car accelerating quickly on its own, climbing 30, 40, 50 miles per hour. We were flying up the hill, and now we were all screaming with pure terror. I tried to get my feet out of the window back in the car as quickly as I could so that I could apply the brakes. Easier said than done. I felt all tangled up and a bit stuck in that awkward position while steering the car. We had sharp turns that you just shouldn't be doing at that speed. By the time I got my feet to the brakes and applied them, we were all the way up the hill where the stop sign was. I could have easily hit oncoming traffic if I hadn't been that lucky. My friends told me that they were so scared that they wanted to go to church and never do that again. Urban legend says there was a guy who climbed on top of his car to hang himself, so that's why he pushes other people's cars away, so that they won't do the same thing. I would like to preface this by saying that I am a Roman Catholic who has experienced paranormal phenomena since I was five. 
My late grandmother had experienced similar phenomena, and my mother and sisters, but to a much lesser degree. As I get older, I notice the experiences are slightly darker in nature. I know very little of demonology, other than what has been referenced in the Bible. I try to stay away from anything referencing demons, the devil, things like that, which is why this experience was so difficult, and I was not prepared. In October of 2018, I was admitted to the hospital due to a severe electrolyte imbalance. I was in a room with three other female patients. On my second night, my arms were finally free of the IV, so I was able to move around and assist the other women, who weren't as mobile, in getting ready for bed. One of the women was much older and cranky. She seemed to take an instant dislike to me when I first moved into the room, but she warmed up to me after I helped her. When the lights went out, I decided to lay on my stomach and say my silent prayers. To the casual observer, it would have looked like I was asleep. During this time, I could hear the woman that I had helped argue with herself about me. She stated that I was nice. The conversation was a little bit Gollum Smeagolish. It was, she's nice. Then she replied to herself, stating, no, she's not what she seems. It went back and forth like that for the entirety of my prayers. Shortly after, the room started getting really cold, fast. I silently prayed to God to watch over her and to free her from any negative influences. It was then that she addressed me by name and said, I don't know the Lord's Prayer. I freaked out, processing quickly what had just happened. The woman knew that I was praying over her, even though there was no way she could have known that. In my mind, I knew instinctively that I was not up for this confrontation. I was weak and still recovering. I got up from my bed and with my back to her, I said something like, there's no way I can stay here now. To which she answered, yes, go, I won, and laughed hard. I was amazed that the other two women had slept through this. It was around 10 p.m. when this happened. The room was stiflingly cold at this point, and I ran to reception and asked them to be discharged, but the nurse said that I couldn't leave without my doctor discharging me. I begged again to be discharged, but was denied. The nurses tried to call me as they got a hold of my doctor, who said that he would be in at 7 a.m. and I needed to stay put. I asked to be relocated to another room in the interim, but the only available room was directly next door, and that was way too close for my liking. So they put me in the day room with a blanket and a pillow. I used my phone to call my sister to get me out of the hospital. She works at another hospital and told me the car wasn't home and to catch an Uber to her place. The ward was locked down for the evening, so I couldn't leave anyway and I stayed in the day room. The TV was on standby, but I could hear voices coming from it, even though the screen was blank. The voices talked about a shooting at the hospital that I was in with thousands of fatalities. It then talked about my baby nephew being in a plane that was shot down. But then I was truly hysterical as fear for my family took root and everything that I learned went out the window. Throughout this time, the voices from the TV continued, calling me a slut and a whore and other words. I couldn't stay any longer in the day room, and the nurses had me on a stretcher right in front of the main desk where the charge nurse could see me. It felt like a really bad dream, and I was hysterical and paranoid. I laid down on the stretcher, and that's when I noticed it. Hanging overhead was a sign that indicated the ward number was 66. It also happened to be on the sixth floor. I wondered if that was perhaps why there was so much activity there. Not long after, I started hearing other voices coming from different rooms of the ward, asking about me. They seemed to be communicating to each other and laughing. I started silently praying again, this time with more conviction. A male patient in the ward nearest my stretcher started crying out for help, 
claiming that I was hurting him. I prayed even harder, citing the Lord's Prayer. He asked the nurse for the name of the, quote, lady outside who was hurting him, and for some reason she gave him my first name. He started crying again, joined by another voice two doors down. I prayed to know who they were in Jesus' name, and all these voices talked at once, but the one name that I could clearly make out was Beelzebub. I continued to pray throughout the night as they taunted, laughed, and cackled and cried. At this point, the light in the man's hospital room was turned on as a nurse was with him, trying to calm him down. I had been sitting up on my stretcher bed whilst praying and watched his silhouette as he tried to inch his way to the open doorway. It was then that I noticed the odd shadow he cast. It was so strange. It looked like a spiky-headed being with a dog. It was almost cartoonish in a way, like Bart Simpson. It continued until morning, and I was finally moved to a small private room to await the doctor. The voices were still there, verbally attacking and threatening me, but my hysteria was long gone by that point. I was just determined to leave. I ended up discharging myself before the doctor arrived, but I had to return, as I still had the IV catheter in my arm. On my return, they had placed me in another ward. I refused to go back to Ward 66, and I was able to recover in peace, and eventually the demonic taunting stopped. I had a course of bad luck following that event. Basically all of 2019 was a series of misfortunes and bad luck that still hasn't turned out right. I don't know what to do other than keep on keeping on. I went to a psychiatrist last December who said other than the trauma that I would need their help with, I was in good mental health. Any guidance would be very much appreciated because this still rattles me to this day. It was a sunny day in Hawaii. I was in my bedroom watching TV when suddenly the loudest knocking on my bedroom door happened. Bam, bam, bam. It was like there was a SWAT team ready to break down my door. I was a teenager and home alone. It was in the afternoon. I jumped up, pissed, thinking that it was my older sister. I was ready to kick her butt if I needed to. I went to the door to see that no one was there. I quickly looked at each room. Each door was open, showing me that nobody was there. I went outside and ran around the house looking for her in pure rage, but I saw no one. I returned to my bedroom and I heard mumbled voices like someone was talking in the other room. So I checked every room again and ran outside just to return and only hear those mumbled voices in my room. I checked again in the other rooms and there was no noise. It was only happening in my room. Talk about driving me insane. It made no sense to only hear these mumbled voices in my room and nowhere else. My high school sweetheart came over that day and I told him what happened. His mom had just passed away a week prior. I had never met her, but he confessed to me that he had hidden her engagement ring in my room. I told him that I didn't want that ring in my house. He said okay and asked to be in my room alone so he could talk to his mom. I said, okay, that's fine, but you still have to store her ring somewhere else, not in my house. I feared that his recently passed mom might not have liked me from number one, not knowing who I was before she died, and here I am with her personal belongings. And number two, she might not have liked my relationship with her son for some other reasons. She was a bit of a bigot. So you know, I was scared at this point thinking these things and now knowing that what happened was supernatural. I guess whatever my high school sweetheart said to his mom worked because the mumbling voices stopped and nothing weird ever happened again.
My buddy and I went to the G. Pierce Wood Memorial Hospital in Arcadia, Florida, looking to do some urban exploration, and we saw something that we can't quite explain. We had to park about a mile away from the hospital because it was fenced in and it's pretty far out in the countryside. We walked down the road and ended up outside the front gates. We decided to sit down and figure out the best way to get inside the grounds when I heard a woman sobbing in the distance. At the same time, my buddy heard a whistling noise coming from beyond the gate. It was a long, high-pitched whistle, like you do to get somebody's attention. I got a weird feeling, and my buddy grabbed my arm and asked, what animals make a whistling sound around here? I was feeling pretty sketched out at that point, so I told him, none as I know, maybe we should head out. As I said that, his gaze shifted from the gate he'd been looking inside and directly to me. He said, run. After he said that, we took off and ran, but we both looked back. My buddy says he saw a shadow crouching on the corner of the road that we had ran off of. Once we slowed down, my buddy explained that he had seen a figure about 25 feet past the gate that wasn't being illuminated by the flashlight. He saw what he described as the outline of a mask, but almost like someone used a sparkle moving really fast to outline it over this shadow. He described the mask as having the shape of the one from the original Snow White, but not the same face. That was when he told me to run. After getting maybe 90% of the way back to the car, I stopped, because I noticed a shadow being cast onto the street behind us, with no one there to make it. I asked my buddy if it looked weird to him. It looked like a shadow of a person standing under a street light, but like I said, there was nobody there to make the shadow. I started walking toward the car again, and that's when my buddy once more told me to run. So we did. We ran back to the car and got in. We drove past the place with my brights on, and there was nothing where he'd seen the shadow figure. As we drove past, I got this really bad feeling looking into the windows of the building though. We drove home without anything else happening. I asked him why he had said to run the second time. He said that the shadow had started to get smaller, like whatever it was had started walking toward us. As a side note, when I first heard that woman's voice, I got this gut feeling to run stronger than I ever have before. Also, this facility has in the past been a mental care facility and a juvenile correction facility as well. The mental facility got shut down following a bunch of patients dying from staff abuse. There were sides that happened on the property all the time too. Does anybody know what this could have been? I work the night shift at a 1920s mental hospital. Obviously, countless people have died here for various reasons. Hangings, electroshock therapy, accidental overdose, suicide, beatings, etc. There are four floors, with the fourth floor being the well-known hotspot for paranormal activity. Me being security, I have to check it out every once in a while. The fourth floor is essentially an extremely long hallway, approximately 1,800 steps, with housing units on both sides throughout. Each unit has a five inch thick steel door, and there's a window at the very end of the hall. They don't house patients due to the fact that the county took over a while before I started, and it's completely empty by the time third shift rolls around. The fourth floor is also the only floor in the entire complex that is completely off the ground due to the complex being built into a hill. It is also where the electroshock therapy took place a long time ago. This occurrence happened last week, Wednesday, on third shift. I wanted to do a walkthrough of the fourth floor that night around 3am 
for no other reason than I was feeling brave. I walked all the way down the fourth floor to the window. Eventually, as I got closer, I started seeing that the window obviously needs cleaning. When I got about five feet away, all of a sudden there was a handprint that would have been extremely noticeable from even 15 feet away. It had not been there until I was about there to the window. I looked at that handprint, turned around, said nope, and walked back down the hall. On my way back from the window, I peek into a side office area with my flashlight, just to check. Nothing. Kept going. After a couple of seconds, it sounded like someone was running up behind me. So I walked even faster, because everything in my body told me not to turn around. As I kept walking, I passed by a unit, and as I passed, I heard what sounded like someone punching the door. Put it up to paranoia due to the running that I had heard prior. That is, until I passed another unit. Another loud thud, as if somebody had punched the door. So at this point, I start speed walking down the hall. And while I am, I hear footsteps following mine. Mind you, these units aren't connected at all, and the entire floor is completely empty. This was just one of my experiences. I have also been having dreams of a white, skinny woman in a hospital gown that has black hair with bangs in her face. I always thought she was just a recurring person in my dreams, until I talked with one of the CNAs that worked tonight in the kids' unit. I never brought her up to the CNA, we were just talking about ghosts and she said that numerous people have said that they've seen the exact woman I just explained to you. I explained to the CNA in detail about how she looked in my dreams, and she just went pale, with her mouth hung open. Supposedly, this ghost is extremely well known throughout the hospital by various people. People have seen her in mirrors, have been locked into bathrooms, and have seen her just walking around, but in my dreams, she always just appears or runs up to me, grabs me, and screams in my face. There was this one dream in particular where I woke up from a dream to wake up in my duplex's stairway. I walk down the stairs because that's where my bedroom is, and I walk into my bedroom. Once in my bedroom, I see my bed and my fiance sleeping on her side of the bed and myself sleeping next to her. In front of my closet, which is on the side of my bed, I see that same woman standing next to my body, just staring at me. I walk up to her, and I get the courage to ask her who she is. She looks up at me, grabs me, screams in my face, and then shoves me onto the bed, which is when I officially actually woke up at 3.15 in the morning. I have no clue who this woman is at all, but I still dream about her every now and then. Every single dream is in a different place, but she's just there. And this has been going on since I started working at my job. I used to work security at an old hospital the old BAMC, also a historical site if you're interested. It was turned into office buildings. When I first started working there, people always told me that the part of the building that I would spend the most time in, and apparently the one that used to be the morgue, was haunted. But skeptical me never thought it was true. My job was to make sure that only the people with the right ID were able to come into the building. This story takes place in the wee hours of the day. Typically, the overnight crew stay over, and these people are in a part of the building that you 99% of the time never see. I was doing my morning rounds, making sure that nobody was on that floor, ending by checking the restroom. It was totally empty, and there were no signs of use while we had been away. I had left, but just as I was about to go back to my office and the door had already closed behind me, I heard it slam again. Surprised, thinking that somebody had walked by me without me noticing, I went back to see who it was. The bathroom was empty. 
Then, as I was about to leave, thinking that maybe I had just made a mistake, the motion sensor toilet in one of the stalls flushed itself. I turned around to look further into the restroom, and still, I was the only one inside. I leave to go back to my desk, thinking that maybe the toilet was faulty, and just trying to brush everything off as a coincidence or something else, when I start to hear a slight crackling. Just a slight tick-tick from my radio, and that never happens. Then I feel a cold chill up my spine, and this area only has two doors, neither of which I was next to. Then I hear my name being whispered just around the corner. I ran to try and catch who was messing with me. The hallway dead ends, so I could easily catch them. I wheeled around the corner, and nobody. There was nobody there. My colleague radios down and calls me on the office line at this point, and at first I can barely hear him. His voice is low, the audio is garbled, and it doesn't even sound like his voice. He's got a very distinctive old man's voice. The call clears up and he's asking me if I'm okay. He said he was watching the cameras the whole time and saw me running around looking crazy. I asked if he'd been watching the cameras long, and he says he always does because it's a scary building. Still very dark out and he wants to pay extra attention while I'm doing the rounds since I'm a somewhat petite female. He's a sweet old guy. He said that he didn't see anybody else down there. At no point had anybody come in, and he never saw the door slam. I told some other people this story at work, and apparently my main hub was what used to be the morgue, like I said. A few people had apparently committed suicide in the maintenance basement right below us. I used to think that these things couldn't happen to people, and that the stories were just made up. But the Brook Army Medical Center on Fort Sam Houston is definitely haunted. Many years ago in the 1980s, my grandfather had a heart attack and needed a quadruple bypass surgery. His surgery took place at a now defunct hospital near downtown Los Angeles. The layout of the hospital grounds is as such. The underground parking garage is floors C to L. There was no level A or B. The first and second floors were underground. The third floor was the actual ground level where visitors entered. Floors four through eight were the hospital proper and looked nearly identical and the ninth floor was a penthouse floor that served as a long-term waiting room for the family members of patients who have undergone major surgery. Two of the three guest elevators go from parking level L to the eighth floor. The third elevator has the same range, plus it goes to the ninth floor. The ninth floor is where the story takes place. My cousins and I would play in the penthouse with my parents or aunts and uncles keeping watch over us, None of us kids were allowed to visit my grandfather for some reason, so the adults took turns visiting him. It took my grandfather a month to recover from surgery, making the penthouse a home away from home for my cousins and I, until the day that he was discharged from the hospital. There were a number of incidents that took place that I can't explain. It seemed like the adults would choose at random when to visit my grandfather, so when they did, my eight-year-old self felt that it was my responsibility to press the elevator button for them. I did this for them several times, but one time I didn't get the chance to. As I was about to press the button, the elevator door opened right in front of me, but nobody emerged from the elevator. I peered inside without stepping in, but there was nobody there. My aunts and uncles, or parents, I forgot which combination of adults had gone, proceeded to enter the elevator and go down to my grandfather's floor without further incident. This also occurred when we were about to head to the second floor cafeteria for a snack, or were leaving the hospital for the day, with the same results. Someone, or something, clearly wanted to take away my perceived responsibility 
and sent the elevator to our floor before I could. One incident was very compelling. The very elevator that we needed to take to the penthouse was out of service. We were advised by the front desk to take one of the remaining elevators to the eighth floor and then take the stairs one flight up to the ninth floor. If we wanted to go to lunch, we should go down the same stairs to the eighth floor and take the elevator to the cafeteria. Except for the cardiovascular detour, our day went on without incident, until we were about to head home in the evening when visiting hours ended. We had gathered our things and headed for the stairs, when I noticed the door had closed shut, as though someone had just walked through. I ran through the door and stood at the top of the stairs, looking at the handrails through the center of the stairwell and listening for footsteps. Nothing. I did not hear any footsteps or any doors open or close. One of my cousins joined me and looked down the stairwell with me, while one of the adults asked me why I had run into the stairwell like that. I tried to explain that I thought I had seen somebody enter the stairwell. Before I could be interrogated further, the rest of my family entered the stairwell and we made our way to the elevators just one floor down. I'm not sure what this entity or thing was, but... It was definitely a strange experience. A couple of years ago, I worked at a hospital as security. Part of the security duties for the second shift was to lock all the doors downstairs in the basement of the hospital. The types of things we had down there ranged from offices to supply rooms, bathrooms, and the morgue. We would also have to check the refrigeration temperature inside the morgue just to make sure that it was running properly. So one night I go down to the basement, which is basically a large rectangle, locked all of the doors, and just as I was going to make a right to take the stairs up, I noticed somebody walk out of the corner in what looked like blue scrubs and take about five steps into one of the doors that I had locked. They didn't open the door, they just walked straight through it. As security, I couldn't just brush this off because we recently had people steal from the supply room, so I had to check it out, especially since it was after hours. As I walked up to the door, I immediately got goosebumps because this specific door was one, an automatic locking door that can only be accessed by ID clearance. Two, I didn't see the individual pull out an ID, which you would have to do to get in. You pull out your ID, scan, wait for the green light to pop up and then open the door. I didn't see any of that. I literally just saw somebody take about five steps into and through the door as though it was wide open, but it wasn't. This door automatically locks and closes itself. So I think to myself, well, if somehow someone accessed the door after hours, they aren't allowed. So this might be the same person that's stealing things. If a nurse or someone needs to go to the supply room, they call security and security escorts them because of these incidents of theft. So I pull out my ID, scan it and open the door. I walked in and of course I saw nobody. Then I opened all the closet doors just to confirm that nobody was hiding. And then I immediately got out of there because I was 100% sure I had just seen a ghost. Later that night, I got a call from the ER department to escort a nurse down to the supply room. I escorted her down to the basement into the supply room and told her what I'd seen. She then shuffled through some boxes in the supply room and pulled out the same exact light blue scrubs that I had seen the ghost wearing. Except they weren't scrubs. They were the blue gowns that patients wear inside the hospital. So what I really saw that night was a patient's ghost walking around in the basement. After this experience, I definitely believe in ghosts and the afterlife. Till this day, I kick myself for not checking the cameras that night.
I've worked at my local hospital for about four years now, and have had more paranormal experiences than I can count. I never believed in anything paranormal before I started working there. But after all of the unexplainable things I have heard or seen, it's hard to remain a skeptic. I've had many minor, but two major experiences that I would like to share. My first job there was working as a security guard. One night, while I was working night shift, I was doing my normal rounds, checking each and every area of the hospital. It was around 3 or 4 in the morning, and was in an area where there are no other people at that time of night. The doors are locked, and unless you're a security guard, you can't get in there. I was walking past a locked door, and I see a grey figure, just like a shadow person, walking past the window and disappearing into a wall. I was in total shock. Still, I opened the door, walked inside, and checked the entire area. No one. Not a single soul. I still can't believe it. There was nothing there that could make something like that appear, nothing to create an illusion. I always get chills every time I walk past there at night. My second major experience was when I was working at the switchboard. I had an evening shift, and I'm all alone in a big room. Once I sat there watching something on the computer, when all of a sudden I hear the sounds of something clattering to the floor. I turn around, and I see a poster, which had been hanging on the wall with the help of magnets, on the floor, but far away from the whiteboard where it was hanging. The two magnets were scattered around. I get that something could fall down, but this thing was flung. It was like something tore it off of where it was with tremendous power. It's just something that to this day, I can't explain. I was a fresh grad nurse working in an old geriatric psychiatric ward a decade ago. Hallucinations, confusion, and delusions from patients in the population are not at all uncommon due to the fact that most of our patients were advanced dementia cases. One room on the unit, which I'll call room 212, had had multiple individuals pass away in it over the years, all from natural causes. All of them were DNR, or do not resuscitate, orders from the nursing home. I had a sweet old lady in room 212, and during med pass, I had forgotten to get bandage supplies, so I told her that I would be right back. I left the room for 30 seconds, and I came back to her facing right looking at an empty hospital bed. She asks, where's the lady that was with you? There were no ladies on the unit that night, just me and a male CNA and five other ladies who were sleeping with their doors shut. I told her, I don't think I've seen any women here, but we can take care of each other just fine, can't we? I figured it was hallucinations or just confusion, but that room always seemed to have patients behave bizarrely and out of character when they stayed there. No sooner had I spoken to the woman that the room went completely dark. All of the lights turned off. I didn't think anything of it and figured the bulbs blew. There were budget issues at the facility constantly. To my surprise, I found every light switch, three including one in the bathroom behind a closed door, turned off manually, as in moved to the off position. I turned them back on, finished care, and tucked her in for the night. I was creeped out to the max. My CNA wasn't even on the unit, so I asked him when he came if he'd been down to check the patients on that wing. He said he'd been gone for an hour flirting with the med surge nurses. Later, my coworker nurse came back the next night, who had been there for many years, and told me that many people who stayed in that room wouldn't sleep in the beds, stay in the room, or wouldn't sleep and were up all night talking to someone. Their excuse was always that woman. 
That place is officially closed now, but to this day I still have eerie feelings. The hair raises on the back of my neck just thinking about it, just like when the lights went out and nobody was there. I never really believed much in the paranormal, until that day. I tried to ask some other co-workers if they had experienced anything. Only my night shift co-workers could confirm the out-of-character behaviors in the patients, and one of them made fun and said that the room had electrical problems. She was the manager and stayed in her office looking for jobs and doing scheduling exclusively, so I'm not really sure what she would know. The staff were the only workers that called maintenance. I still just can't help but find the strange coincidence in it all. Something was up with that room. I just don't know what. Anyone experienced things of this nature? I have a story from about two years ago that really captivates me to this day. When I've told this story to close friends, they tell me that it's straight out of a movie. I can't really disagree with that. This starts off when I finished my first year of college in the Bay Area. I worked my ass off in school, and I just wanted to have a wild summer and I would do just about anything to get out of the house. My cousin was and is my best friend, and we basically did anything and everything together. When there wasn't anything to do, we would take walks together around my rural neighborhood. I always lived near this old hospital, which used to operate as the biggest trauma unit in the area. Sometime when I was in high school, they shut the hospital down for unknown reasons. It basically just sat there, rotting for a few years, before we found it. One day, my cousin and I were drinking a cold one and taking one of our routine walks and ventured away from our usual route through this peaceful, random field. We stumbled across this huge parking lot after making it out of the field, but it didn't hit me that this was the old hospital's parking lot. We made our way through the lot until we saw this massively grand building standing outside of the lot. The deteriorated banner said, Emergency Room and this is when we knew that we had struck gold and stumbled across a back route to this abandoned hospital. We knew of the place, but we'd never been there. We hadn't heard any weird outlandish urban legends, nor had anybody we knew been there before us. We pushed forward and checked the perimeter. To our surprise, the first door we walked up to had a rock jammed in between the door frame so we could waltz right in. This is when we realized this could potentially be a really bad idea if we got caught. We could probably suffer some consequences. So we agreed that we would be quiet and respectful and make it a quick trip. This is where things take a turn, or a few turns. We entered the building and it was the most deafening quiet I've ever heard. The sound of the door closing behind us sounded like a literal bomb. Once the echo stopped from the door, it dawned on us that this place was really creepy. We walked slowly, but the floor was covered in glass, which made even the smallest step sound like Bigfoot lumbering around a library. We find a patient room, which still has a bed inside. We stop at the doorway to look in because the floor looks a little sketchy. Out of nowhere, from around the corner, we hear the faintest, slowest, drawn out whistling I've ever heard in my life. It stopped us in our tracks and we just stared wide-eyed at each other. Even that whisper sounded like a yell in this place. We both have our feet planted to the ground because if we move at all, we'll make ourselves known. At this point, we both assumed there was probably a squatter or a guard of some kind. My cousin hand gestures to me that we have to leave and we can't just stand here, because the whistling was obviously not going to stop at that point. We turn toward the opposite side of the building that the whistling is at, and we tiptoe out. And then, the whistling just stops. We freeze. And then we hear glass crunching from around the corner. 
At that point, we just start running. Once we get to the door, we come to the realization that we didn't put a rock in the door frame when we came in, and the door is completely stuck. As we're trying to get this door open, the glass is crunching now and going faster. Whoever's behind us is running at us. We hear the glass crunching until it sounds like it's dangerously close. I'm horrified. We turn around to try another door, and the noise of the glass is literally right in front of us. Yet no one is there. No one. We book it to a door that says pharmacy and peel it open. The pharmacy is completely empty, except for a single perfectly placed and aligned landline phone plugged into the wall. The phone is off the hook and making a dial tone. The whole thing was perfectly lined up and centered with the whole room. I've never seen anything like it. The dial tone was so loud in such an empty place. There was no power throughout the hospital, so I'm not really sure how it was working. I was in shock. We left and never went back. I had heard of some other kids going there at night. They told me that they heard whistling and thought that somebody was lurking in the shadows the whole time. It's a freaky world out there. I was in a nearby abandoned Navy hospital with several friends. We'd been there many times before and never had anything odd happen. We were on the top floor, which was the third floor, and there were many broken windows, allowing the rain and the wilderness in. There was a lot of mold and even moss growing in the old ceiling tiles that covered the floor at this point. One of our group, prone to asthma and respiratory issues, didn't take it too well. We all decided it was best to leave and began our descent into the basement, which was the route to the exit. This is when things got weird. I broke ahead of the group, something generally against our rules of exploring. But in my mind, I had to get out. I was far enough ahead, around corners and such, that I couldn't even see their flashlights behind me anymore. My heart was racing, and I still don't know why. I finally got to that last door that led to the room we would exit from. It was a heavier door that closed by itself. I reached for the doorknob, but something stopped me. I couldn't do it. Something in my mind wasn't letting me put my hand on the doorknob. I felt fear. I'm not sure how long I stood there, shaking with my hand no more than three inches from the knob, before I saw the flashlights of my friends at the end of the hallway. Finally, I wrenched the door open and immediately went outside, hyperventilating with panic. My friends soon joined me, also saying that something felt a little weird in there to them. We were gathering outside of the door when the friend with breathing issues felt something on her shoulder. We pulled down her shirt and there was a noticeable and quite obvious handprint. Nobody had touched her, especially not hard enough to leave a full handprint through clothing. We've been back several times and haven't had another experience in any way, which makes it even more odd if you ask me. This happened with my mom when she gave birth to my young sister. She was at the hospital, sharing the room with another woman and her newborn. My mom was placed at the side near the washroom. So, two days after giving birth, my mom was sleeping and it was pretty late, 1 a.m. to be precise. She was woken up by a nurse who had curly hair tied back, well-defined features, she gave my mom an immediate negative vibe, those feelings where you just know something is wrong. The nurse started asking my mom to get up and come with her. She told her this repeatedly. 
My mom felt the air change and instantly knew this was not a nurse. She held on to the rods of the bed, started praying and shook her head, rebelling at the request. The nurse then looked at my mom, gave her a huge creepy smile, laughed, pinched her, and then disappeared into thin air. My mom was super paranoid the whole night. Since each ward has their own group of nurses, my mom was well aware who was her appointed nurse. She instantly knew that that nurse didn't belong there. My mom spent the whole night praying. The next morning, she convinced my dad that no matter what, she was not going to spend another night there. Usually, C-section mothers wouldn't be discharged there after the third day, but my mom got herself discharged on the third day. Over the years, I've thought about it. I thought it was probably just the results of medication or something. But my mom swears to have felt each moment as real as it could be. Also, my mom is quite sensitive to these entities, or jinn. She can always sense their presence, and has had her share of experiences with the paranormal side, which makes me think that maybe she did in fact encounter something strange that night. I live in Madagascar, that island on the east of Africa. A lot of people here still believe in magic, sorcery, and all that stuff, despite being a largely Christian country. My dad died in 2002, and he lived and experienced a lot of things in his life. He was a Christian and did not believe in witchcraft and magic, although he experienced a very strange thing back in the 80s. My mom and an aunt confirmed this story. In 1985, even before I was born, my dad caught pneumonia and was rushed to the hospital. My mom and an auntie were there to look after him, buying meds and stuff like that. My uncle, that aunt's husband, knew things about black magic and traditional Malagasy witchcraft. When he once visited my dad on the fourth or fifth day in the hospital, he told him something. He gave him a piece of ginger and asked him to keep it in his hand for the next two days. My dad asked why, and my uncle told him that on the next two days, an evil person who wanted to hurt him would come to visit him in the hospital. Holding that piece of ginger would keep the evil person away. My dad did not believe a single word of what he said, but my mom insisted he do it out of respect because she knew my uncle was really serious about it. So my dad kept the ginger in his hand for two days. The very next day, while he and my mom were in the room, someone knocked at the door. My mom opened it and one of my dad's co-workers and a friend was there with some flowers. My mom told him to enter, but the guy stayed right there. And finally he said that he just would not enter the room. My dad saw him and told him to come in but he was standing in the threshold, looking like he wanted to move, but couldn't come over the threshold. Finally, he just turned back and walked away quickly without even saying goodbye. Later, when my dad was back to work, his coworker and friend wasn't working there anymore, and my dad never saw him again. About a year ago, my girlfriend at the time and I, now fiance, decided to visit an old abandoned sanatorium, which is now a state park. It was a facility from the 1930s, developed for the treatment of tuberculosis patients and eventually patients with mental illnesses. In the 70s, cases of abuse and an unusual increase in death rate led to the closing of the facility in the 1990s. Today, it's open to the public and considered to be a beautiful place for seaside recreation. The grounds are well kept, and people are free to walk around. The structure itself is abandoned and off-limits to the public. My fiancé loves abandoned places, 
and as we walked the perimeter of the fence surrounding the building, we were both taking pictures with our phones. As we reached the other side from where we'd begun, my fiancé's phone began to shut off or reset itself whenever she attempted to take a picture from that side of the building. My phone was still working just fine, but hers shut off about four times in a row before she was ever able to get the picture she wanted. She eventually gave up and we kept walking. As we circled back to where we'd begun, she noticed her phone was working again. She'd had no prior issues with the phone, and hasn't since. We believe that something did not want its picture taken, or somehow interfered with her phone. It was pretty creepy. I work at a small 48-bed hospital. These experiences happen in or near the decommissioned psych wing. IT, in which I work, was moved to this wing, into old patient rooms. At first, I'd hear my name called, often from down the hall or from empty rooms. Thinking someone needed tech support, I would try to locate the caller, but there was never anyone there. Many times I would see people in empty rooms, a patient on a bed, a doctor in a white lab coat next to them. As this was a decommissioned wing, it made me turn around to investigate, only to find the rooms empty. Frequently, there was a male and a female walking together, apparently talking to each other, and they would turn into the room next to mine. I would follow them, only to find that they had entered a room through a closed door, and no one was inside. It was always the same room, too. One afternoon, on a Saturday, I got called in while my four-year-old daughter and I were downtown. I headed over, but was unable to unlock the notoriously problematic back door to our wing. However, I saw a man coming down the hallway toward me, and I knocked on the door and motioned that I was locked out. He appeared to look right at me, but instead of coming to my aid, made a right-hand turn into the office next to mine. I quickly leaned forward to better see, and hurriedly knocked on the door, thinking he hadn't seen or heard me, only to realize the door to that office was closed. Confused. I thought maybe I had just seen a reflection in the window from behind me, and turned, asked my daughter if anyone had walked up behind us, and she said no. I was able to get the door open finally, and the office was empty. Another time, our wing was fully occupied due to a remodel which displaced some staff. I heard what I thought was a metal cart coming down the hall, and then a tremendous crash like a dozen pots and pans hitting a tile floor. I jumped up and ran into the hallway, partly to assist, and partly to make sure nobody was hurt. No one on our floor had heard anything. There was no cart, and no disaster. Next, I was called in on New Year's Eve, before midnight. The issue took about 20 minutes to resolve, and since I was going to miss the festivities anyway, I thought I would document my time and head home. Upon entering my office, I noticed the bathroom door was open several inches, which I always keep closed. This wasn't a big deal. Housekeeping had probably left it open while cleaning up. For some reason, I did not close it as I normally would have during the day. As I typed up the incident, a man exited my bathroom. At first, I thought perhaps my boss had come to investigate as well, but then why would he have been in my office? As I looked up, the man, just over six feet tall and thin, looked over at me in shock, as I must have been doing to him, and then he disappeared. Considering the hour, I noped out of there without finishing my report. The old TVs in the rooms of this wing would sometimes turn on by themselves, just static 
as they had no feeds, but I had to unlock empty patient rooms and turn off the televisions occasionally, always with the volume turned up to the max. One other co-worker has told me that he has heard his name called when no one is there, has seen the woman walking down the hall but without the man, and the doctor by the bedside, but that's all. Many people will report hearing things they can't explain, but no one else has told me that they can see anything. The rest of the hospital has no abnormal activity that we know of. I'm not really sure what I'm looking for by telling this story, but I feel the need to share it. In my hometown in South Texas, there is a hospital that is abandoned. It has an extremely demonic presence. I've had friends who have gone inside and ventured down to the basement level. There they've heard growling and seen glowing red eyes. That was eight or nine years ago. My little brother, who's 17, has had friends go into the basement there and encountered the same thing. It's also sprawling. The stairs that leave the basement are an entirely different spot than where they entered. At night, if you get close, it feels like your heart is being tightly clenched. It's hard to catch your breath. It's like something is sucking the air out of your lungs. The feeling of despair and panic just engulfs you. You just feel the need to get away from there as soon as possible. And that's just coming into the parking lot at night after around 8 p.m. I haven't ventured inside, but the feelings I described are what I have felt along with my wife. The presence is intense and extremely powerful. My wife is something of an oculus. She said that she saw an old lady shift and take the form of a young child dragging a dirty, ragged teddy bear with a murderous smile and black eyes. I have deemed the building and the property a no-go after sundown. A couple of years back, I was struggling, and constantly in and out of mental hospitals. Don't let this make you question my credibility, though. It was just for depression and anxiety stuff. I was never prone to hallucinations or anything like that. But anyway, I was in a hospital that was really, really old. Used to be a farm like a hundred years ago. My roommate decided to make a makeshift Ouija board with a piece of paper and a bottle cap. I was like 15 and didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so I went with it, thinking that nothing would happen. I was very wrong. So the two of us sat in our room and we were asking questions. I had had some odd and possibly supernatural experiences at this hospital before, but I still didn't believe before this happened. I was getting exasperated, and I told my roommate to stop messing around and stop moving the bottle cap. Well, she took her hands off, so I was the only one with my hands on it. Then I asked another question. The cap shook a little, but I thought it was just me, because my hands shook. Then I asked a question, and the cap started shooting around and went off the paper. It was just going nuts. Needless to say, I said goodbye. I was completely shocked, and I've been a believer ever since. For years, my mom worked in a hospital that had been abandoned and recently torn down. She worked there for a long time, and it's the reason that she believes in the paranormal. Nothing too scary happened to her, 
but the events definitely stuck, because they're always her go-to ghost stories when reconnecting with past co-workers. The first one is one night while cleaning. She was organizing papers in what they called the kitty psych. It wasn't necessarily used as a psych ward, just where they put the kids so that they weren't near the actual ward for inmates. Only her and another nurse were on that floor, and she could hear her in the kitchen doing dishes. Mom was in a small room, so there was no way that she would not have seen somebody enter. She felt the heaviness of a person walking past, and knew that it wasn't the other nurse, because, as I said, she could still hear her in the kitchen. The second incident has a little backstory. When the original owner fell ill, she was in a hospital room in her own hospital, and had to pass ownership to her sons. She was unhappy with a lot of what they did to her hospital, and sadly passed knowing that the building she loved so much was going to go to crap. Well, when she passed, the door to her hospital room would slam repeatedly any time her sons made a decision she didn't like. It went from being terrifying to sort of a joke. When the door would slam, you'd almost always hear a nurse respond with, Mama Mansoor is unhappy with her boys. You could also hear people running in the wards, despite the doors being heavy and unable to be opened without a key. You could stand in the hall and feel the heaviness of people running around you. Maybe not the scariest, but everybody I know loves hearing my mom's haunted hospital stories, so I figured I would share them with you. So, I was working at this hospital called Warren General, in Warren, Pennsylvania about 90 minutes east of Erie. I worked the night shift. I'm a travel RN, so this was one of the hospitals that I traveled to. One night, my floor was so slow that I got pulled down to the CCU to work. Well, that night, my patient rang her call bell at 3 o'clock in the morning. She asked me, what does she want? I said, what do you mean? She said, the nurse that keeps coming in here and standing there in that corner. She pointed to the corner behind the door. I said, who? Ashley? The nurse that I was working with, and I pointed to her, sitting in the nurse's station. She says, no, the other one. Well, there was no other one. It was just the two of us. The patient was a woman in her fifties with no history of mental illness and she wasn't taking any medication that would make her hallucinate. So I kind of laughed and I said, it's just us. She just stares at me, so I say, okay, well if she does it again, just yell for me and I'll come right in. Her room was eight feet in front of the nurse's station. So about a half hour goes by and she yells, see, there you go again. I got up, started walking, and I heard the bathroom door shut. It had been cracked open just a little bit, to give her dark room a little bit of light. I walked in and I said, See, you're dreaming. No one else is here. She says, No, she's here. She went into the bathroom. So I opened the door, light still on, and there's no one there. Looking confused, I say, Um, well, what does she look like? I thought maybe somebody was messing around. It's too dark to tell. I can tell it's a woman, but she's so dark, I can't really make out her face. So when she says that, I get a little weirded out, but the night ends and I forget about it. Three months go by, I get pulled back down to the same unit. I have the same room as before. This time, it's a man in his early 60s. He's a nice guy, alert, oriented, and very polite. The night's going really well. It's about 3 a.m. and his call light goes off, which of course means that he needs something. So I walk in and he says, you are my nurse, right? And I shook my head yes. He said, 
Well, then why does that lady keep coming in here and standing in the corner? What is she doing? What? I almost shit myself instantly. This was three months later, in the same room. The same thing. I said to him, Honestly, I think it's a ghost, sir. And he laughs. I said, No, really, you're not the first one to say that. I started telling everybody about it then, and I found out that the entire second floor has a nurse that's seen every once in a while. I guess in the 1990s, a nurse who worked up there killed herself. In fact, she shot herself in the second floor bathroom. This happened to my mother, who had been admitted to hospital in the summer of 2018, after she was suffering from pain in her abdomen, caused by ulcers in her stomach which were later removed. In her ward, there was one other patient, a very elderly lady, who seemed to be out of it to be perfectly honest. Her ward had four hospital beds, two beds facing the other two beds across the room with two windows to the far side. One night, my mother remembers a chair which was used by visitors of the patients being opposite her bed. She awoke the next morning to find that exact chair right by her bedside, as if somebody had visited her in the night and left it there in its position. Even if it was a doctor checking up on her, they wouldn't sit down on the chair or leave it there in that position. My grandfather passed away in 1994 and didn't get to see any of his grandchildren. I wonder sometimes, was this my grandfather showing a sign? A friend of mine worked in a hospital. She called me up one day to talk about strange things that were happening. She worked night security, and during this time, an older part of the hospital was being renovated. She would notice things, like the sound of someone walking behind her, equipment being moved around, the doors opening and closing, doors to patient rooms would jerk open, she was getting scared and asked me to come with her one night. I got permission to walk with her. I saw the doors open and close, and I even heard someone talking in one of the patient rooms. This side of the hospital was closed off. She, I, and one other security guard were the only people there that night. I took a ton of photos and videos. On one of the videos, you can hear footsteps. And, on one video, you could see a door creak open a bit, all on its own. All of that was alright, but this scared the hell out of me. During one of the videos, I could plainly see a figure of a woman walk out from a room. She stood next to the nurse's desk. It was very quick. I was moving my phone from side to side. I didn't see her with my naked eyes, so... I didn't know to pause. She had a bluish tint to her. She had a jacket, a skirt, and kind of a beehive hairdo, and glasses. My friend showed the picture to some of the nurses. A few of the older nurses said it looked like a girl who used to work there, and also died at the hospital. One nurse jumped up. Oh my gosh, that looks just like Maggie. She said that Maggie worked in the hospital in the early 70s and died there from cancer. I wish I still had the pictures and the videos, but my phone was stolen before I could upload them. But my phone was stolen before I could get all the footage off. Either way, it was a pretty terrifying experience, but kind of cool too.
Everything that will be written here is true. It could be misinterpreted, but I'll explain everything as it is. I'm 21. When the events that I will tell you here happened, I was around 15 or 16. I was fascinated by abandoned buildings at that time, and the first one that I found that was close to my house was an abandoned hospital. This hospital was firstly built in the early 1900s as a sanatorium, then was bought in the late 1980s by the regional hospital to become a palliative care center. My first visit was the one that started all of the curiosity that I had about this place. In the beginning of the summer, I came to this three-floor hospital. Our first goal was to take pictures of this beautifully decayed place. Everything was fine, until we arrived on the third floor. My friend suddenly started to panic, and, being a bit aggressive, yelled, Let me go out! Let me go out! I first thought that he was doing a joke, but he looked really scared of something. Since I didn't want to leave, I accompanied my friend outside, and then came back inside, alone. I wanted to take pictures of the empty corridors of the third floor. The weird thing is that when I asked him about this a few minutes later, he didn't remember being aggressive or scared. All he knew was that we went outside together, and I went back in. I didn't have any particular feeling about the place during the visit. I was just excited, because it was my first time in an abandoned building. My second visit was with a different friend. I didn't tell her anything that happened during the last visit. Like the last time, things started to become weird when we arrived on the third floor. I started to feel a little bad, like something was preventing me from breathing correctly. My friend told me a few minutes later that she was having the same weird feeling. We felt scared and didn't want to continue with this oppressive sensation. So we left. The third time, I went to the hospital with a camcorder. I probably did the worst thing ever. Before our second visit together, we watched some paranormal videos on YouTube, and we wanted to get some answers about the third floor. During the whole visit, we asked some questions to the supposed entities that lived in the hospital. We got what we interpreted as an answer in the basement. Since our last visit, things were moved and destroyed, probably by vandals. I asked, did you move anything here? On the video, I could clearly hear, it's not us. The other voice that I recorded was in the church part of the sanatorium. It happened just at the moment we were leaving, a voice whispering, it's the death. The last thing we did this day was to go to one room of the third floor and ask multiple questions and wait for answers while recording everything with a voice recorder, trying to get EVPs. After a few minutes, we saw a shadow moving really fast, and we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps running on broken glass just behind us in the dead end corridor. I immediately ran to the direction of the noise. My friend and I looked everywhere in the hospital, but nobody was there. We ran out and left the area, promising that we would not try to get in contact with those entities again. The following night, I had sleep paralysis, and I don't often experience that. There was a black silhouette staring at me in front of my bed. This might have been a coincidence, but it was quite weird that it happened just after this scary episode. After all those experiences, I returned to the hospital alone after that, a few times actually. Sometimes I didn't have any bad feeling in any part of the hospital and was able to capture every picture that I wanted. Some other times, I had the feeling that I was not welcomed, was oppressed, and didn't have the courage to take the pictures that I had initially planned. As I told you, I was 15 or 16 when all of this happened. 
now the building is sold and under security. If I had the same experience today, my judgment about the events would probably be different. My theory is the following. The voices we heard on the recordings were probably interpreted because we wanted them to be there. My friend's behavior in the third floor could have just been a strong case of panic. The bad feeling that I had on this floor might be because of the memories of my friend's reaction. My friend having the same feeling that I did is a little weirder. I first thought about something in the air like asbestos, dust, or cracked paint, maybe even mold. But this theory doesn't work, as it was not happening every time I went there. The noises of the person running on cracked glass is still impossible for me to explain. Where did this person or animal go if it was one? All the rooms were opened. The noise was behind us in a dead-end corridor. We saw nobody running, and the noise only lasted a few seconds. What was that shadow behind us then? It wasn't ours. The sleep paralysis that I had after that, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. But maybe it was more. What do you think? Do you think that we encountered something that day? So, my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here, and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos. We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is. Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, come in. Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again, Come on in! She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there, as she was putting her clothes back on, and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me, that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it. So that was it. She quickly opened it, and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. 
For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom, when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there, just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her co-workers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think. This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I have been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet, and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays, and as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work, so I turned to ask him, but when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down, and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned, and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out. Leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door, I went more slowly this time. And yes, holy crap, he was still there. Now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About 10 minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she's walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, oh, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very, I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while. This is my experience from Jekyll Island Beach Club a hotel that I now know is quite infamous for being haunted and frequented by ghost hunters. I've lived in Georgia my entire life. We traveled all around the state growing up, going to conferences that my mother attended for her job. 
I was around nine years old on this particular trip, so it was about 2003. It was just me, my father, and my mother. We still like to share these stories at family gatherings, and I figured that somebody else might appreciate them too. I will preface this by saying that I was an extremely independent and resourceful child, so my parents let me do my thing on these types of trips and make friends with the other kids also in attendance. So don't get your panties in a bunch about me being left alone in the hotel room for a couple of hours or being allowed to run around the resort with my buds. When we arrived at the hotel, our room immediately creeped us out. Upon opening the door, there was a staircase leading up to our suite. It was spacious, with a dining room, king-sized bed, and wall partially separating the bedroom from a living room area with a pull-out couch. We were just chilling, exhausted from our drive, when we heard the sound of a door creaking open. We looked to our right, and the door to what we assumed was the closet was ajar. It wasn't a closet. It was a brick wall. My family and I are Diet Coke fanatics. I used to pound them, even if they were room temperature. Disgusting, I know. After the door incident, I figured I needed a little caffeine, so I went to open a Diet Coke from a 12-pack that we'd bought coming in. Completely flat. Well, that's weird. I tried to open another. Completely flat. Curious. The next day, we tried to open one from the 12-pack we'd left in the car, and it was totally fine. Something had been draining the energy, in this case I guess the carbonation, from all of our belongings. My mom had a sweet blackberry at the time. I used to play that little game where you bounce the ball off that little bar that goes back and forth. You know what I'm talking about. Her blackberry had been charging since we got there and was all the way charged. After the door and the unsuccessful attempt at having a Diet Coke, I figured I would just play a little of that game. I unplugged it, plopped down on the couch, and as soon as I opened the damn game, I watched the battery completely drain and die. No electronics that we brought on that trip would hold a charge. Everything would die as soon as we came into the suite. Later on, sunburned and reminiscing on my day boogie boarding, my parents left me in the suite to go hit up the conference's reception. I whipped out my markers and started drawing when I heard the toilet, which was on the other side of the wall separating my pull-out couch from the master, flush. All right, that's weird. I decided to lay in my parents' bed and watch the toilet to see what the hell was going on. About 15 minutes later, I watched, wide-eyed, as the handle on the toilet went down and it happened again. My nine-year-old brain was trying to make logical sense of this. I was freaked out, but not frightened. I do believe to this day that they were friendly ghosts. I decided to migrate back to my pull-out bed. Another 30 minutes go by and I've chalked it up to being nothing. And then it does it again, followed by the laughter of what sounded like children my age. I rolled over and covered my head until my parents got back. The next night, I was on my pull-out bed playing possum and pretending to sleep whilst pondering all the strange shit that had gone down. It was about 11.30 p.m. That's when I started hearing footsteps above us. It sounded like several people were running above the room. Problem was, we were on the top floor. My parents, who think I'm asleep, start freaking out and whispering, Holy shit! back and forth. Then, there was a knock at our door. My dad yelps and my mom bursts out laughing at his reaction. They go down the staircase together to answer the door like two teenagers. They still think I'm asleep. It was a hotel security dude who says, we've received several complaints about kids playing up here. Can you please tell your children to keep it down as our guests are trying to sleep? My parents respond with, we only have one kid and she's asleep upstairs. He responds with, oh. Listen, I'm going to be honest, I can't say this is the first time something like this has happened. The next day, my mom was in some workshops, and I wanted to hit up the pool and chill with some of my friends. The same group of kids always showed up to these conferences. Our parents are all judges, senators, legislators, or lobbyists. While I was at the pool, my dad decided to play a round of golf. At one point, I tried to go back to the room real quick to get something. I whipped out my room key, which was a literal key, but I couldn't get the door open. 
I went to the front desk and an employee walked me back to the room to try to let me in. It turned out the deadbolt, the ones in hotel rooms that can only be locked from the inside, had somehow been placed. Not exaggerating, they ended up having to take the door off the hinges so my family and I could get back in. Up until this point, all of these occurrences were just weird, and none of them were particularly frightening. There were only two days left of the trip. I fell asleep that night with no issue, but I woke up to what felt like somebody was getting onto the pull-out bed. I thought it was just my mom or dad, so I rolled over. But no one was there. Alright, now I'm actually feeling trepidation. I slam my eyes shut, but I have a distinct feeling that somebody is watching me. I laid motionless for probably an hour, afraid to move or call out to my parents, who were asleep on the other side of the wall. Then, a loud bang. One of those noises that jolts you and reflexively forces your eyes open. There was a tall figure, probably at least eight feet, at the foot of my bed in a black hood. I couldn't see its face. I started screaming and hid under the covers. My parents rushed over, comforting me as I'm crying and terrified. We then all three heard a laugh, this time of an adult, followed by loud footsteps overhead. I was done after this, and so were my parents. We packed up our stuff and left in the middle of the night, and my mom missed the last day of the conference. I still see some of the friends that I made on those trips, and they all have their own stories from that particular conference at Jekyll Island Beach Club. One of them, a judge's son, had lucked out and gotten to stay out in the lighthouse suite. He and his father had taken us to see it, and it was incredible. Spiral staircase leading up to the top where the actual suite was. His stories of our time spent at the resort are the most terrifying. Needless to say, I will never go back. My mom recently had a conference there and refused to stay on the resort grounds, opting to stay at another hotel down the road. Back in 2018, I met a sweet girl at my church. I'm going to call her Lily for the sake of this story, as I don't want to reveal her personal information. We became pretty good friends. We would sit with each other or nearby every service. We attended canned food drives to help others around Thanksgiving. And we sat together with a few older couples at church during lunches. But outside of being close church friends, we weren't really that close outside of that context. At one point, we had each other's Snapchats before I deleted it. The week before my birthday, I went to church as normal, ate breakfast with another friend of mine and her kids, and I made my way to the sanctuary. I saw Lily sitting on the right-hand side of the aisle, and I sat next to her. We talked for a bit, and then service began. However, halfway through, she got a phone call and left the church. She didn't come back, so I figured that maybe she had a family emergency or had to go to work early. I finished up at church, talked to my pastor and his family, and I headed home to give a couple piano lessons. Nothing else odd or weird crossed my mind, though. I just carried on with my week until next Sunday. The following Sunday was my birthday. I was excited because it was my golden birthday, the year of 25. I don't usually like celebrating my birthday, but this was going to be a good one. I'm a newlywed, spending the day with my husband, having my favorite coconut cream pie instead of cake. I still wanted to go to church that morning though. I love my church and church family and spending time with them. From the minute the church doors opened, everything was off. I walked down to the basement and had a cup of cold coffee, a bagel, and I noticed a few people around me were just pale, cold. I can't even properly describe the sadness on their faces. I'm a pretty introverted person, so I didn't ask any questions. I just went back upstairs to the sanctuary and waited for the service to start. My pastor walked up to the podium with tears in his eyes. He began to tell us about how there was a tragedy within the church. Lily had taken her own life the weekend prior, Friday night to be specific. 
I started crying uncontrollably. I had no idea she was dealing with that, and I felt like an awful friend. We had a beautiful service dedicated to her before her funeral. We all sang songs that she loved, prayed for her mother and family, and prayed for her. I left right after church, and I went straight home. I didn't think about the details of her death because it was just too much. A few hours later, though, I remembered. The Sunday before, I saw her at church. How is that possible, though? She passed away Friday night, but I somehow saw her on Sunday. I sat right next to her. I had a conversation with her before services. I watched her answer her phone and walk out. I became angry, scared, disappointed, depressed. Every emotion that comes with losing a friend at such a young age. I fell into a hole. After I had grieved and prayed for a couple of days, something came to me. My church does live streams, and there would be a clear view of our service and us sitting next to each other. I logged on to my Facebook, found my church's page, and started searching for the date that I had last seen her. The strangest part of everything is that every live stream is in chronological order, so I figured it would be pretty easy to find. But to this day, I still haven't found it. I asked the person in charge of recording and uploading the sermons on Facebook where it was, and he said that somehow there were technical difficulties that day and they were unable to stream the service or even capture any of the audio. I've racked my brain for months. To this day, I feel as if she was at church Sunday to say goodbye to me. I asked other members if they had seen her the week before and all have said that they couldn't remember if they had, or they'll just correct me, saying, Honey, she passed away last Friday night. There's no way she would have been here. My church is fairly small, and we only have a morning Sunday service, so there's no possible way that I could have gotten the days mixed up. I've had many ghost encounters in my life, way too many to count. But this one hits the hardest. I wish I had more answers than I do, or some kind of proof, but I don't. I didn't have any eerie feeling when I last talked to her. She didn't feel like a ghost or an apparition. It felt like every other time, like she was really there, without a doubt. I hope that one day I can find some answers, an explanation of some sort. But for now, I have to keep telling myself that this is how Lily decided to say goodbye to me, and I have to learn to be okay with that. When I was in high school in the 80s, there was this story about a local church in the country, long abandoned, that there were satanic gatherings every Sunday at midnight. The front door was painted red. There was a long dirt drive to the right of the church that led to an abandoned farmhouse. Legend had it that the farmer had killed his entire family one night. So an old stone church, no parking lot, cemetery directly in front of the church, and the dirt path on the right leading to the farm three miles away, on an unlit blacktop five miles away from any houses or main roads. I was 17 and my friends were 18. It was the summer after graduation. My friend Darla and I were driving around with her annoying friend Betsy who was sitting in the back seat. I was driving Darla's car and she was the passenger. It was around 11.30 p.m. when Darla and I decided that we should drive to the church just to see if the stories were true. Betsy freaked out in the back seat the entire way, and being young and immature, I wanted to either smack her or laugh the entire way there. Around 11.50, I pulled up and decided to scare Betsy by pulling onto the dirt lane. I was about a quarter of a mile in. Betsy freaked out. I was laughing, Darla was high. Two minutes later, I kid you not, a station wagon pulls into the drive behind us. At 11.53, on a Sunday night, it was two elderly people, around 80 years old. 
dressed in their Sunday best, both frail and white-haired. They stayed, and we discussed. Betsy said, oh my gosh, get us out of here. I said, there's no way out except backward. I wasn't going any further down the drive, and there was a cemetery to my left, a stone church at the upper left, and a thatch of trees to my right. We were effectively trapped. Darla said, do you think they're devil worshippers? No, I said. They're too old. Betsy screamed, haven't you seen Rosemary's baby? They were old. I'm trying to stay calm when another car pulls behind the station wagon. It's now 11.57 p.m. It's a brown Dodge. A young kid gets out, walks up to the old couple, and talks to them for a while. Okay, they know each other. Now I'm getting freaked out. I call out to the old man, can you please back up? Can you ask the guy behind you two? We'd like to leave. Thank you. Darla says the kid came to my window and threatened to stab me with a knife that he showed me. I don't remember that. The old man unleashed a torrent of curse words that I still don't understand. He called me all kinds of derogatory names, everything you can think of, telling me he didn't know the kid, so he couldn't be rude and ask the guy to move. His wife just sat there. I yelled, yes, you do know him. He just walked up to your car and talked to you. Then, suddenly, they both left. I peeled out and took off down the road. I didn't see their cars or lights, and it's a fairly straight road. Twenty seconds later, the kid jumps out of the bushes on the side of the road, right in front of the car. We screamed, I swerved, and we never went there again. Looking back, Darla and I must have been traumatized. I don't remember peeling backwards and getting us out of there. She doesn't remember the kid jumping in front of my car, and I don't remember the kid coming to my window with a knife. But between all of us in the car, we put the story together. Needless to say, it was the most bizarre and scary moment of my life. This is another story from my friend, the church custodian, and from the church that we both attend. My friend David and I were at his graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, so we decided to take him to the church that night when we knew that nobody else would be there. We get to the church around 9 p.m., unlock the doors, and go in. All the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we all hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear the footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person. At this point, our friend had decided that he'd gotten enough proof to believe our stories and was ready to leave. We're standing in the parking lot, facing the door, arguing over who's going to have to go back in and turn all the lights off, when all of a sudden there are three very distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery is on the second floor and on the side of the building that we were facing. That made the decision about turning the lights out a little bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, who's the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated having to go into the nursery while she was alone due to the feelings she got in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up.
My friend is a church custodian, and he's told me a lot of paranormal stories. While I was talking to him about an experience we had, I realized that I had seen an embodiment of one of the spirits from our church, something I had previously thought that I hadn't experienced. I saw it when I was very young, so I never put it together, until I was talking to my friend about something he had seen. He was talking about the time we'd been lured into the church by a dark figure in the window, which proceeded to lead us on a wild goose chase through the church. He described the figure he had seen as an average-sized male with no features, just all black. After hearing this, I remembered a time where I was waiting on my parents, who were talking to some people after evening service. Mostly everybody had gone home at this point, and the lights were all turned off on every floor except the ground floor. Being the adventurous little kid I was, and not really believing in ghosts at the time, I decided to go to the third floor with all the lights off. As I rounded the steps to the third floor, I saw, thanks to the light in the parking lot coming through the window, the silhouette of an all-black man. The entire shadow was black, and I couldn't make out any features. I immediately ran back to my parents and told them, but as any good Baptist parents would do, they told me it was just somebody from the church. This occurred in the same spot that my friend said he had seen the figure. So my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, and the baptistry, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel into an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell you occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had the key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person, was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I would be interested in joining them. I was. I arrived a few minutes later and went inside. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these were very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and he sits it in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path we had just taken over and over. On our second go-round is when we noticed something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, which is when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continued on this path maybe three to four more times. Each time, the broom had been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it's been long enough, so we go to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording, when we finally realized how stupid of an idea it was, because there was no way to tell what was us and what wasn't. 
That is, until we hear a loud tap that was coming from just a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, and then one more tap even closer. Finally, we hear a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway altogether. And two, there's a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us. And that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway is a wet paper towel. This is one of my many experiences at St. Thomas Church. This one was about eight years ago, probably not that scary compared to other things that I've experienced, but it was the first one that popped into my head. I went to a graveyard that had a church with four of my friends. One of my friends knew about it as he had come once before. The rest of us had never been. Now, my intention was to go there to see if I could genuinely talk to any spirits because of past experiences. Two of my friends, however, were the usual let's have a laugh and mock the dead type, while the other two were shitting themselves, as you do. We walked around for about 15 minutes and I was asking questions like, is anyone here that wants to talk? But it was hard with my two friends acting like idiots. So I just thought, okay, this is silly. I'll just stop. Now, just to be clear, Two of the cars we took were right next to each other, about half a meter apart, with the big gates to the right of the cars, which is where you enter straight into the graveyard. We walked back to the cars, and I leaned against one car, and one friend next to me, on my left, and the other three leaned against the other car. Now we're all facing each other, just talking, when suddenly from the right of us, we hear this voice, almost like a child's voice, say, help me. I am not kidding. My friends and I all looked right in the same direction at the same time. All of our heads just turned, and we all went silent, giving each other that look like, what's going on? I said quietly to all of them, you heard that, right? Their faces said it all. Then about 30 seconds later, we heard it again. Help me but it was a little bit fainter. My friends started to panic, and I was a little scared, but more curious. They opened their car doors so fast it wasn't funny. I don't blame them. I hopped in the back of my mate's car, the one that I was leaning on, and her car wouldn't start straight away. I looked out the window, and my two mates in the other car had already sped off. I was trying to calm my friends down, who I was in the car with, but after about a minute, the car started, and my friend who was driving sped off screaming, I'm never coming back here again, while my friend in the passenger seat agreed. When we were off the road that leads to the graveyard, she slowed down, and I pulled my phone out to see if I could find anything about this graveyard, as I had never been before. I found out that there were two young twin brothers who used to play around there at the church and attend with their family. One day they were playing and tried to play a prank. Something went wrong and they both caught fire and burned to death. I swear that voice we heard sounded exactly like a young boy's voice. It creeped me out. I told my friends and they agreed. They also said that they would never go back there and I can't blame them. Personally, I've been back four times now and something has happened every time.
A few friends and I decided to book a small getaway up north for a week or so. We settled on a lovely converted church in the middle of nowhere, next to a small river near the sea. After a couple hours of driving to the place, we finally arrived and were faced with a small converted old church. It was beautiful, and we were sure we were going to have a great time. We opened the door and started to settle in. There was a log stove in the corner, and with it being September in Scotland, it was kind of chilly. I made sure that it was lit consistently. We cracked open some drinks and put on some music. Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast to be exact, but we never thought of the connection to the church. So we had our drinks and a great night. I had fallen asleep on the sofa, and I woke up through the night, but had this strange feeling of somebody watching me. I shrugged it off, thinking that it was just because of the strange surroundings, and that I was probably just uncomfortable in a new place. The next morning I woke up and decided to do all the dishes. While I was washing up, my friend came through and sat on the sofa. I had a dinner plate and a side plate in my hands and turned around to put them on the counter. As I turned away, I saw the plates slide along the counter and nearly fall off. As you would expect, I grabbed them, but as I did, I felt some kind of energy push back at me. It was the weirdest feeling, kind of like being electrocuted but without the pain. I dropped the plates and stepped back in panic as my friend said, Are you okay? I just said, Yeah, I'm fine, because I didn't want to seem silly. What I realized, though, after it happened, was that I was wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Most of the things that happened seemed to happen in connection with that band or something similar. My other friend came through then and remarked how cold it was in the room, which was strange because, as I mentioned before, I had the log burner stove going all the time. Again, I said nothing. A few days passed, and on the last night, my friend was tidying up as we were all in bed. We heard footsteps upstairs, but we thought it was just him, until we realized that he was washing dishes and hadn't been upstairs all night. It was a crazy week, and some other things happened, but those were the most serious. I grew up in the countryside, literally in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. The house was originally a small cottage. My parents bought it before I was born, and they renovated it and added an extension. There were five other houses on our country road, the closest being a large field away. I don't know much about the history of our house, the land that it was built on, or the history of the area, other than an elderly lady lived in the cottage before my parents bought it, and she passed away in a nursing home. The only info that I have about the area is that it was old, and it was a civil parish. Civil parishes are units of territory in the island of Ireland that have their origins in the old Gaelic territorial divisions. Some other things worth noting before I get into the experiences. Behind our house, across a newly built road, was an old graveyard and the ruins of an old church enclosed in a stone wall. When I say old, I mean the gravestones were tipping over, sinking into the ground, and you couldn't read the writing on them anymore. You could see the graveyard from my window and my brother's window. On top of that, when they built that road, they built it when I was a kid as a new main road into town, archeologists discovered signs of an early medieval monastery, the site dating back between the sixth and ninth century. They also found some old signs of medieval settlements, some artifacts like tools and things like that relating to the time period as well as undated burial activity, that's how they put it. Some scattered human bones and the remains of bones of a boy that they think was probably around seven years old were also found. In the field right next to our house, there were also the ruins of what looked like a small cluster of old stone houses. And there was something similar further down the road. 
Whenever we get together as a family, we always end up talking about the house and what we experienced. We moved out six years ago. I don't know who or what it was, but there was definitely more than one ghost or spirit. It seemed like there were a lot. I don't know if it has anything to do with the graveyard or what they found or the house or the land itself. I really don't feel like it was the woman that lived there before us either. My mom, dad, two brothers, myself, obviously, and friends that stayed over all experienced something or just got a weird vibe. Funny enough, almost everything that happened happened in the new or built on part of the house rather than in the old part and stuff happened outside too. I would often feel like there was someone in my room and I don't know why, but I felt like it was a man. I would never chill in my room alone and I would dread nighttime coming to go to sleep. I just felt like somebody was there. I heard what sounded like someone walking around. Not footsteps, but just like the movement of someone. I often felt like I was being watched, inside and outside. Fair enough that it could have just been my imagination or me freaking myself out as a kid, but on multiple occasions I heard what sounded like children talking and playing, but then nobody would be there. On one occasion, I heard what sounded like a choir singing in the direction of the graveyard and church. And on another occasion, I heard what sounded like drums being played. Like this weird, repetitive rhythm, almost like a chant. It's hard to describe. Another time, I was outside playing near the side of the house. I was kneeling down, and it was as if somebody had thrown a small stone or pebble. Not at me, but in my direction from behind. We had stone clippings in our garden, so I figured it was that. I heard the stone land as if somebody had thrown it, and it happened three times within like 20 seconds of each other. I turned around to see who might want my attention, but nobody was there. Another time, I went to bed really early when it was still bright out. I remember this so vividly, I can even remember the duvet cover that I had on. So I was laying down, wide awake, and it felt as if somebody poked me pretty hard. It was like a strong index finger poking in my lower back. I kind of froze, felt freaked out, didn't turn around and just convinced myself that it was the paw of one of my teddy bears. I didn't think about it again until years later. From the living room window, my brother saw a man in a hat smoking a cigarette, standing outside leaning against the wall near the front door he got up like, who the hell is that? Went outside, but nobody was anywhere near us and he didn't hear anybody run away. You could hear people move even the slightest bit on the stone chippings. Which brings me to my next point. A couple of times, my mom heard someone knock on the back door, but when we went to answer it, nobody was there. She never heard them walk or run away. Another time, she saw the silhouette of someone, again smoking, through the window of the back door as if they were standing just outside the door. As usual though, nobody was there. On a couple of occasions, she felt as though somebody was sitting in the back of the car with her when she left our house to go to the shop in the late evenings. The feeling was so strong that she would keep looking in the mirror. A couple of times she even stopped the car and looked under the seats just to make sure nobody was there. My dad, who was a full-on skeptic, saw a black shadow down the end of the hall go from one side to the other. My brother felt like somebody had touched his foot in bed, and on a couple of occasions heard what sounded like somebody walking down the hallway and stopping outside his door, as though they were going to come in, but hesitated. He would call out to see who it was, but nobody ever answered, so it wasn't any of us. He would also see the hallway lights being turned on and off. And when he was outside around the back garden, he would get this sudden urge or feeling like he should go inside and he would run in like there was imminent danger. This is weird because I used to feel that way too. Our dog stared and barked at nothing a few times and a friend of mine that stayed over hated when she had to wake up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because she said she felt like somebody was watching her from the end of the hallway. I would love to hear any of your thoughts as to what might have been going on in my house. I've been wanting to tell this story for a while.
When my niece was really young, she was in a bouncer at my sister's house. I was house and babysitting. I had left her to go to the kitchen to grab some water. My sister's chocolate labs were probably sniffing and licking her head because I could hear her giggling like she was having a blast. I hadn't noticed how cold it had gotten. And then I heard it. A loud wooden snap like a thick piece of wood had been snapped in half suddenly or a tree was knocked over. I ran into the room and what I saw and smelled freaked me out. The dogs were huddled in the corner whimpering. My niece was just staring at the ceiling corner with wide eyes and it was cold and smelled like Stetson. I took her and we decided to go to a different room. When my sister finally came home, I told her what happened. She just rolled her eyes and said, Oh, that's just Hugh. I was so confused. She said that Hugh was the previous owner of the house who had died 10 years before his wife sold it. She said he likes to follow my niece around and you can tell it's him because the dogs freak out, it gets cold, and it smells like cheap cologne. I don't believe in that shit, but I do believe that feeling you get in your gut when something just doesn't feel right. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live on the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug there for my laptop. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30, and it was perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village really. Just to set the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when all of a sudden I see this bright light just over the fields. It was multicolored, and it kind of blooms and grows larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough late in March in the middle of the pandemic lockdown. Except that it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I would say it was two acres or more away, and larger than a family car, hanging maybe... 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually it faded and disappeared, again not behaving anything like a firework, and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment that I looked at it. This light was maybe a third the size of the original, and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much farther away, and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we would have heard it. A drone still strikes me as the most likely, we wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with really powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful, so I don't know, and the size still throws me off. I've never ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think I might have seen a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media though, and I haven't seen anything since. I have always been open-minded about the supernatural, and I enjoy a good ghost story as much as the next person. 
The following is an account of something that I experienced a little over 20 years ago in County Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. I've had very little experience with what could be called supernatural phenomena, but this one has stayed with me and left me wondering about what I experienced. The girl that I was seeing at the time gave me a call to let me know that her parents would be out of town for the weekend and that I was more than welcome to spend the weekend alone with her in her parents' house. Now, being a teenage boy, I naturally didn't need to be asked twice, and before I knew it, we were cuddling away in her bedroom. It wasn't long, however, until our passion was interrupted by the distinct sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. On hearing the footsteps, I immediately leapt up and said something along the lines of, What the fuck? I thought your parents were gone for the weekend. She assured me that they were indeed gone for the weekend, and seemed to brush off the fact that we had both clearly heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. Strange things continued to happen throughout the day, such as once when walking by a room to get to the bathroom, I couldn't help but notice that all the windows had been opened, and that the curtains were blowing around like they were in a hurricane. The thing is, I could have sworn that those windows had been shut the first time I passed them, but who knows, maybe I was mistaken. In fact, I wasn't really feeling spooked by any of this, and I just told myself that what I'd witnessed could have been the result of any number of things. It wasn't long until I actually was freaked out, though. At some time in the middle of the night, both myself and my girlfriend woke up, and I remember asking what the hell was going on. I had a feeling that I can't quite describe, sort of a mixture of dread and despair, with a hint of curiosity, if that makes any sense. I could hear movement downstairs, and I had the distinct feeling that there was a crowd of God knows what below in the kitchen. I could also hear conversations, but I couldn't make out what was being said. I again asked my girlfriend what was going on in this house, and to my surprise, she calmly said, Eh, oh, this kind of thing is always happening. This didn't exactly reassure me, but I managed to get back to sleep without any further incident. Now, one more thing I'd like to add is that the house in question was a terraced house, and the house next door had not been too long before the scene of a murder. From what I remember in the news, a woman had been pretty brutally killed, but no one had ever been convicted. Everybody was convinced that it was the husband, but I think he got off on a technicality. I've always wondered if this had anything to do with some of the strange things I experienced there. Here are some of my family stories from Ireland. I was about 17 years old, living at my mom's house. I was just finishing secondary school for my trade in painting. A few of my friends and I from school decided to go out and celebrate our upcoming graduation with drinks. I said, haven't we been celebrating graduation all year? And I got a laugh from the boys. We went out to the pub and did what we did every night, drink. Now, on school and work nights, I kept my wits about me, knowing that I had to get up in the morning. Not only that, but the bars back home didn't stay open until 2 or 4 a.m. They'd put you out at about 12, and maybe you'd get lucky and get a crowd in on a Friday or Saturday, and they'd keep you there to make a bit of money. The night went as usual, and I watched the first two of the group say their goodbyes, grab their jackets and hats, and then head out into the dark. Now, you have to remember, Ireland is still a poor country by the standards of the EU and was even worse off than today when I was a teenager in the 70s. Some of the people I grew up with had no plumbing. Most used fireplaces to heat the house. And a couple had no electricity. So when I say they headed into the dark, there were no street lights for miles and there was very limited artificial light. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was 10.30. About 20 minutes passed since the pair had left, and I asked my friend Jerry if he was coming home, since he lived only a few minutes up the road from me. He replied, I'm having a good crack, I'll see you tomorrow. So I left him and headed out myself. The walk from the pub to my house was about two miles or about a 40 minute walk. I said my goodbyes and started out. For some reason, I felt uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong. But walking the dark roads, I walked every night, every day, my whole life, 
put a knot in my stomach on this night. I got halfway up the road, looked back, and thought about waiting for Jerry to head home with me. I knew Jerry was the kind to stay until closing, and I didn't have the money or the energy to keep up with him until payday. So I turned around, reassured myself, and kept walking. About ten minutes into my walk, I heard rustling in the bushes along the road. It sounded big, and I assumed it was a deer. I kept on, and about halfway home, I heard the rustling in the bushes behind me again, followed by a stone hitting me in the head. I turned quickly and said, Quit it, guys, now. Come out. I don't want to be walking the whole way alone. My heart sank. My friends, who I expected to come out of the bushes, didn't. I was met instead with an eerie silence. I turned around, told myself I'd just had a bit too much to drink, and kept walking. Five minutes later, I heard footsteps behind me. They were keeping pace with my own. This time I darted around and yelled, The joke's gone on long enough. Come out now. Again, where I expected to see or hear my friends, I was met with an eerie silence. I turned and picked up the pace, then immediately heard the footsteps, still keeping pace with my own. I stopped dead in my tracks, and so did the footsteps. And then, I ran as fast as I could, and again, the footsteps kept pace, only this time they were getting closer and closer to me instead of keeping the same distance like they had before. My heart was racing, and I finally saw the bridge to the brook and ran across. Then the footsteps stopped, but I didn't. I ran all the way home. When I got home, my mother was sitting by the fire. I sat down next to her out of breath and shaking, and she asked me what happened. I told her, and she replied, You're lucky you got to the brook. Ghosts can't cross water. The ghost never even crossed my mind until she said that. I even asked my friends at school the next day if it was them and said, You really had me going. But I was met with puzzled faces. Later I found out the last three of the group didn't even leave until closing, almost an hour after I started out home. It may not have been a ghost, but what's scarier is truly not knowing what it was at all. This is what I believe to be the truth. I'm totally open to the possibility that it was a hallucination or a trick of the eye or anything else. I'm honestly just looking for some ideas. For some background, I have had some experiences seeing shadow people as a child, but in the past 10 to 12 years, I haven't really experienced anything other than a weird shape in my peripheral vision or a strange feeling of being watched, nothing too major. That was until the night of the 23rd of December. I couldn't really sleep that night because I'd been working a late shift and was still kind of in an energetic mood. Weirdly though, that afternoon when I was sitting on my bed putting my shoes on, I could have sworn that I felt something touch my foot from under the bed. I didn't really pay much notice to it. I just remember thinking, oh, that's weird. But it was the middle of the day and I was running late. Anyway. That night, once I did finally get to sleep, I kept being awoken by scratching noises. Now that sounds a lot scarier than it is because we always get mice in our attic at winter, so it really wasn't anything new or scary. However, the third or fourth time it woke me up, it startled me because it sounded different. This time it sounded like, I guess I would say it sounded like someone really lightly running their finger along the wall not scratching at it or anything, just like when someone very lightly runs a finger along a wall. I also noticed that my wardrobe door was open. In my culture, there's a lot of superstition surrounding specifically wardrobe doors being open. I actually have a string keeping it closed, which would have to have been untied in order to open the wardrobe. This immediately made me think that something spooky was afoot, but I was so tired that I was just happy to ignore it. Anyway, I turned on the light and of course there was nothing to be seen, so I got a drink, took a few breaths and went back to sleep. I then woke at about 7 o'clock, lying on my side facing the wall. For some reason I got this overwhelming urge to turn around, 
and before I knew it, I was already rolling over. I noticed that there was what looked to be a shadow man, standing about one meter away from the side of my bed. I got the feeling that it was facing me, but peculiarly, it had no head. It wasn't like it had been decapitated or anything gruesome like that. It just had an uninterrupted line across from one shoulder to the other. As well as that, I remember it not having any hands, like his arms just ended in a sort of rounded point. I also immediately noticed that it was quite small, maybe five feet tall, possibly less. I'm 5'11", and I could tell it was a decent bit shorter than I. I did not feel threatened at all at the time. I just saw it and thought, oh wow, this is actually happening. And then immediately thought, this isn't what I imagined he would look like. For reference, as a child, I remember frequently seeing a huge shadow figure pretty often. So in my mind, that's what a shadow person was supposed to look like. Anyway, I kind of snapped out of it and dove for the light switch. This meant passing the entity in order to reach the switch. It didn't move or run or anything. It just stood still. When I passed it, though, I did notice a coldness in that area and the air feeling thick or dense. That's really the only word I can think of. As soon as the light was on, it began to fade into like a smoke, but there was still a clear outline of it for a few seconds. The best way I can describe it is like, you know when it's really hot outside and you can see the heat waves rising off the road? Yes, well, it looked exactly like that wavy air, but in the shape of the shadow. I'm from Ireland, and assuming this is one of the Ishi, I asked it to leave in Irish. I then felt the newfound sense of dread momentarily lift. But when I sat back down on my bed to kind of process my thoughts, I felt a rush of cold air come toward me, and I did feel a sense of anger or annoyance, but I can't explain where or what it was coming from. It was almost like the air was angry at me. Naturally, I decided that this was a battle I was not willing to fight, and I left the room. As soon as I closed the door, though, I noticed that my two pet ferrets were both wide awake and had all of their fur standing fully on end. I brought them both into my room then, and they both immediately started hissing and puffing up their fur at something. I've never in my life seen them act this way, so it really did freak me out. I had been hoping to just pass this off as some sort of hallucination, but their actions unfortunately made me feel quite justified in my fears. I initially worried that it was the fear Dorka of Irish folklore a shadow man of the Ishii who acts as a warning of your death. But it doesn't fit any of the descriptions of him from our mythology, which honestly was the best Christmas surprise ever. Fully thought I was a goner there for a while. Anyway, if you made it this far into the story, thank you, and please let me know if you have any ideas as to what this was, if I handled it wrong, or what I should do in the future. I grew up in Ireland, and back in the 90s, my family had a small holiday home in Ballyornan that we shared with a bunch of relatives. The house has long since been sold, but there were a couple of freaky things that happened to me. The house was located in a small, isolated area with a bunch of other holiday homes and families. The entrance had a farmer's field attached where people would always pat and feed the white horse that was always there. Polo mints were his favorite. One year, when I was around six or seven, my younger cousin and I crawled through an opening in a barbed wire fence that we used to do regularly to go pat the horse close up. This was also in the middle of the day, so it was completely bright. We were feeding and patting the horse when I noticed along the top of the field a person running across. But something was strange, markedly that they seemed to be completely translucent. They stopped dead in their tracks and turned to face us, about 50 yards away. At this point, the horse started kicking and neighing and became extremely unsettled. It ran off to the other end of the field. We turned around and this person was still coming at us. We could see a face and I remember it being completely sinister looking with a smile. My cousin and I absolutely bolted back through the barbed wire fence and ran straight home. 
We didn't mention it to any of the adults because we shouldn't have been entering the private property in the first place. So we had a few sleepless nights, but we let it lie. In my adult life, I had recounted this story to a few friends, but sort of at the time I was still convinced myself that I had fabricated it and maybe it was nothing. Until I ran into my cousin at a New Year's party a few years back. We hadn't spoken for some time as he'd been living in America, but over a pint I recalled the story to him and he absolutely recalled every single detail. This gave me the weirdest chilling feeling I've ever had mainly because I assumed that we did see something, but that I had most likely fabricated it. But he even recalled this person's face, and the sinister look, the smile, and the translucent appearance. This may not be the creepiest thing you'll ever read about, but it's always been very personal to me, and I often replay it in my head, over and over. When I was 12, my younger brother and I used to travel up over the border to a small town in Northern Ireland to visit our father, as my parents had divorced. My dad, being a firm Protestant, insisted that we rejoin a Protestant scout group called the Boys' Brigade. We had left it a few years prior, due to moving across the county and there being no installation where we had moved. So now that we could attend it again, we were drafted in and off we went. For anyone wondering, it isn't at all like American Scouts. It's like Sunday school, but you sit around and read scripture, learn marching drills, play football, dodgeball, etc., all inside of a massive church hall, and then every so often you'd go on a day trip to different places. This one particular trip had us going off for an overnight weekend stay in some adventure camping compound way up in the forests adjacent to a coastal town rock climbing, kayaking, orienteering, etc. But much more controlled and set out. It would be less like wild camping, more like show up to this place, get our own dorm rooms with bunk beds in them, wake up and go have breakfast in the cafeteria, then go do some activities, go get dinner, and finally back to the dorms for the night. So upon getting to my dorm room, I picked the top bunk next to the window, and when it came time to sleep, I was laying on my side, looking out, when I noticed that there was an old tree stump directly ahead of me. The stump was directly ahead in a straight line as you exited the dorm complex, so anybody walking out to go get breakfast in the morning would see it. You couldn't not notice it, as it was just there. So the next morning I woke up late and everyone else was already walking down to get breakfast. So I pulled my clothes on and ran down to catch up. As I exited the main doors, I saw a woman in a white dress sitting on the tree stump, just combing her hair. Now this woman had bare feet and she didn't look like she belonged there. Remember this compound was completely empty bar us scout boys and our brigade leaders. So seeing any type of person there would raise some alarm bells. But the fact that it was a woman in a clean white dress with bare feet in the middle of a compound in a forest just combing her hair was unnatural. I rubbed my eyes as I knew that I was seeing things, but nope, still there. So I did what any scared boy would do. I ran the hell out of there back up to my dorm room and nervously looked out the window to see that she was now gone. I waited until a brigade leader came up to tell me to get out to breakfast and I told him what I saw. He didn't buy it for a second and ushered me out the door. The next day we went home, but it has stuck with me all these years. Supernatural or not, it wasn't normal, and it still gives me shivers thinking about it. There was no rhyme or reason, even if it was just a normal woman, to be there. But, in hindsight, given our local lore and culture, I sometimes wonder if I saw a banshee. My grandmother is one of those people who seems to just be naturally susceptible to paranormal activity. She's in her late 70s and has numerous stories about all sorts of spooky and unexplainable encounters she's had throughout her life. 
She used to keep me entertained for hours with me getting her to constantly tell and retell her stories again and again. It's the way she tells them, I think, that really invokes a sense of fear. Hopefully, I can do her justice with my recounts as she's not quite up to speed on Reddit. The house she grew up in throughout the 50s was haunted, undoubtedly. We'll start with the time that she was walking home from school as a 10-year-old girl. She grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland in a typical city-style terraced house, maybe 50 houses joined together on a long, narrow street. There was no one immediately around her as she walked home from school one brisk January afternoon, except for one gentleman walking maybe 20 yards in front of her. He was wearing a long black overcoat with a bowler hat, not something that would raise any eyebrows at the time. Suddenly, my grandmother noticed the man stop in front of her house, open the little gate at the front of the small garden, walk the five yards down the path to her front door, open it, and enter the house. Still, she thought nothing of this, simply assuming the man was a friend of her parents, or a colleague of her father's of some kind. Oddly, however, when she got to the front door and went to open it not moments after the man, the door was locked. She thought this strange, as the man had just pushed it open and walked in. Not too weird, though, right? Someone may have just locked the door behind him. What was strange, however, was that upon entering the house not 45 seconds after the man in black did, she found herself to be the only one in the house. No parents, no man in black, nobody. My grandmother often speaks of the noises she used to hear lying in her bed at night. And by noises, I mean a horrible, blood-curdling wheeze, coming from, of all places, directly under her bed. She described it as the long, drawn-out breaths that you would imagine coming from a 90-year-old, 40-a-day smoker on their deathbed. This would happen night after night after night. She used to run downstairs to tell her mother about the man under her bed, but her mother was a stern Christian woman and would have nothing to do with it often scolding her and sending her back to bed for telling the devil's tales. She explains how she used to just cover her head with blankets and pray for the wheeze to stop, crying herself to sleep most nights. The last story that I'll mention for now again takes place in the same house. My great-grandfather was a policeman and often worked in a regular shift pattern. The house had a small hallway upon entering the front door around five by five foot, just large enough for a coat rack and the stairs to begin. Immediately to your right when entering the front door was the living room. Most evenings after dinner, my grandmother would sit in the living room and listen to the radio with her sister while her mother knitted or sewed. Rather regularly, they would hear the front door unlock, open and close, the hall light switch flick on, and the rustle and knock of a coat being removed and thrown on the coat rack. My great-grandmother would say, Oh, that must be your father home, or something of the sort, before going to greet him in the hallway. On numerous occasions, though, they wouldn't be able to find him immediately, and they would assume that he'd gone upstairs. They would go upstairs to welcome him home, but to no avail. There would also be no coat on the rack. And then, 15 or 20 minutes later, her father would arrive home. It just so happens that my grandmother found out years after moving out of that house, that a single man had lived there alone for years and died in the very room that she slept in as a child. Apparently, he had some kind of respiratory condition. This happened early, around five or six in the morning, and I was fast asleep. I was about 10 years of age. So I was sleeping and gradually woke up in a nice, relaxing way. I didn't jump up or startle or anything like that. I rolled over to face the wall. I always go to sleep in this position. And as I rolled over, there was a man dressed in all white with a white glow around him. In his hands he had rosary beads, and he was praying with his head bent down toward the ground. At this point I was literally frozen solid with fear and stuck in the spot I was in. I pulled the covers up over my head for a split second, 
and then realized that I could move, and I ran downstairs to my parents' room. I've seen a ghost. There's a ghost in my room, I said. Son, there's not. You've had a nightmare. Go back to bed. I refused to go back to my room. I fell asleep in their bed. A couple of hours later, the house phone rang, probably at around 7 or 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which is highly unusual. My dad answered the phone. Hello? What? How? Right, okay, I'm up. I'll be over as soon as I can. Is everything okay? My mom asked. No, my brother Tony has died. I never met my uncle Tony. He lived in England and we live in Ireland. He was only 30 and died peacefully in his sleep. My dad brought some photos to show me who he was and to tell me about him. And that's when I realized this was the man who had been kneeling beside my bed praying. There was an old stone mill where I lived. It takes a while to walk to the mill, and on a number of occasions in my life, I would enjoy walking there. A lot of weird things happened, and this is one of those times. Basically, I live in a town that used to be the capital of Ireland during the medieval ages. The town has a castle in the center and a canal that runs along one side that in turn leads to the mill in question. I only say this because it's important later on. One day, two of my friends and I decided to go for a walk down to the mill to see if anything would happen. Ten minutes into our long journey, and it started. A groaning. It was the oddest thing. It was so loud that I thought it was one of the other lads, but it really wasn't. It just sounded so fake. Literally sounded like anyone pretending to be a zombie. I mean, it was so fake sounding, I genuinely wasn't even scared. The canal was to our left and the wall of the castle to our right. The castle is closed at night and security patrols the castle grounds. I genuinely just thought that someone was in the castle grounds on the opposite side of the wall and was just trying to freak us out. It didn't work though, I thought. It was so random at the start. One of the guys was getting some sort of panic attack. He claimed he had a dream the night before, about a girl dressed in white, roaming around his house, and that she had caused his grandfather to pass away. He was convinced the dream was connected to what was happening, but we continued on anyway. The groaning continued the entire way until we reached the halfway point of our journey to the mill. The halfway point is just a car park. The trees open up to reveal the sky. It's one of the only places during this walk where trees aren't covering your head. At this point, one of the lads wanted to have a cigarette, so we stopped. And then, it happened. I don't really know how to explain this, but it's almost like there was a flash of black over the sky. Even though it was dark, it was like in a split second, the sky just flashed black. Blink and you'll miss it, but we didn't miss it. Right after this, the groaning got so loud, like it was all around us, but there was nothing there yet yet the sounds were so loud and so real. The friend who'd had the panic attack let out a noise of pain, and then everything stopped. No groaning, no rushing water from the canal, no nature, just him groaning in pain. He begged us to look at his back because it was burning, and sure enough, he had three scratches the length of his back from the base of his neck all the way down to his lower back. We used the road that leads to the car park to get out of there. I never really knew how to explain this, as some people just claim it's all explainable, but honestly, to this day, I've never seen the sky flash black like that. I've never heard groaning like that, especially when there's nothing and nobody around to do it. A few weeks later, a friend of mine, Scott, told us of an old legend of a headless horseman who would ride up and down the canal looking for his head. Apparently, the groaning is his decapitated head. I guess it was just lucky for us that we didn't meet the rest of him.
I have a weird, ominous topic that I wanted to talk about. I grew up on a small island chain off of the Texas Gulf Coast. Never really experienced anything out of the ordinary until I moved to another island in the chain, North Padre. I don't live there anymore, but when I come to visit, there's this little thing that bothers me every time, and I've heard it ever since I've moved. There's this constant mechanical sounding ring that I can hear. It's always there. It's hard to describe, but I know exactly what direction it's coming from. The ocean. I have no idea what's making it. I always hear it coming from a certain point on the island. Ships tend to stay far away from this point, so I don't think it's a horn, especially since it's very rhythmic. The sound is very low. I always hear it in the back of my head. Sometimes I won't hear it for an hour or so, and I feel fine when it stops. When it starts up again, I get a really bad headache, and sometimes I can get confused or dizzy. I was told by my boyfriend that I'm most likely hearing the hum of the earth, but to me it's more like a ringing. I don't hear it anywhere else other than Padre. When I stand on the beach, I can point directly to where it's coming from. It makes it really hard to sleep, and I always feel on edge, like something awful is going to happen. I don't know if anyone else experiences this where they live, or if they've been to North Padre and have heard this noise, but I just thought it was an interesting story. For the longest time, when I actually lived on the island and wasn't just visiting my parents, I assumed it was the lighthouse. I'm not sure why I assumed this, but it seemed to make sense in my mind. It turns out the island does not and has not ever had a lighthouse. When I learned that, that's when I started getting that awful feeling from the sound. Before, it would bother me, but I just brushed it off, thinking that it could be reasonably explained and that I was being irrational. Anyone I've ever talked to about it says that I have hearing problems, or that I'm being overdramatic, other than my boyfriend, who has tried to hear it with me but can't. I've always had sensitive hearing, and over the years I've been clinically diagnosed with PTSD, and I have developed a trigger for alarms and rings especially fire alarms, even though I've never been in a fire. I've gotten a whole lot better at picking out individual sounds and where they're coming from. I use this to calm myself and figure out why something is going off so I can rationalize it and not have a panic attack. So far, I haven't found an explanation that quite fits for this sound, and I think that's what bothers me the most about it. I can't rationalize it because every time I do, somebody disproves my thinking. Like the lighthouse, the ships, the military base, church bells. We have one teeny tiny airport. The military base is all the way on the other side of Corpus, and out of the four churches on the island, only one has a bell, but it's broken. I'm always on edge and anxious, as I have no idea where it's coming from. I mean, the actual source. I just know the direction. Maybe I am just a crazy person whose PTSD has taken over, but I sincerely believe this sound is real and coming from the ocean. I've seen some really strange things in the Navy. This is one of the two strangest things that I've seen during my career at sea. We were in the South Atlantic Ocean at the time, northwest bound on a course for what ultimately would be the U.S. Gulf, coming from the Cape of Good Hope. It was February 1995. I was on duty on the bridge at the time, and I remember going inside the chart room to fix the ship's position. We had Omega, Lawrence C, SatNav, and some early GPS models. I don't have the exact position, but I do remember that the nearest land was the island of St. Helena, and using the dividers, I remember that I reckoned we were about a thousand nautical miles or less broadly south-southwest off of the island. People need to understand 
that what I saw was not bioluminescent worms or other marine organisms. This light that I saw was very different. I've seen plenty of all that, more than anybody would ever want to see when I was serving aboard ships in the Persian Gulf. This was like a lit marine floodlight inside the sea that produced a green light. It seemed stationary to an observer aboard my vessel because whatever it was was moving at exactly the same speed with my vessel, on exactly the same course, submerged and abeam. The phenomenon lasted for about 10 minutes. No entry was made in the log. We did not report this to a senior officer or the skipper, and I just cracked some jokes with the remainder of the bridge team, trying to convince them that it was bioluminescent marine organisms. One of the personnel on duty that night on the bridge had also convinced himself that it was worms, and he tried to help me convince the others. The US Navy and the US Coast Guard never got to hear about this. I was young, my career was just starting, and I didn't want anything to do with anomalous phenomena. I definitely did not want to be interviewed by senior officers ashore, trying to prove to them that I'm not Fox Mulder, nor did I want to get any odd remarks on my personnel file. As far as I know, US Navy subs do not have floodlights that work when they're submerged. I have no freaking idea what this was. I suppose it could have been Russians or something or someone else entirely. Were someone to ask me today about this, I would still deny everything, and I've never spoken to anyone in the US Navy or US military or US Coast Guard about this nor do I want to. I'm pretty sure that they have a pretty good idea what it is in the US Navy, and I'm sure plenty of other officers and NCOs have seen the same thing. I'm sure they have all filed reports, and I'm really not curious of ever finding out what this is. As I write this, the Islamic holiday Eid al-Adha just recently ended. I would like to share with you a story that I heard based on my experience helping out at the mosque for last year's celebration. I was there as a journalist, working on a small island off the coast of Singapore. One of the islands has a small mosque, but they were organizing the lamb slaughtering event to give out to the poor. Many villagers, consisting mainly of Muslims and Christians, received free meat on that day, which also contributed to the next event, which was a large feast especially made for the villagers. I got the chance to aid in that and get free food as well. However, one must understand that with a lot of goats, there will be the foul stench all over and constant blood coming from the butchering area. By nightfall, things would have been kept clean, of course. This story is told by one of the staff there that mentions of a tale that will disturb me forever. There is this story that revolves around the mosque being used by an unknown cult to summon the goat woman. They would use the praying hall in the middle of the night and do some sort of satanic ritual before sacrificing a woman, most of the time a villager to summon the goat woman. Usually the sacrificed is a young girl in her 20s, a virgin, and she was stripped of all her clothing before she was killed. An axe is placed on the sacrificial table and several red candles light up before some chanting goes on. And then the spirit of a demon would enter into the deceased's body and rise, placing the decapitated goat head still fresh on hers. Blood would drip all over her as she picked up the axe and went after the villagers that killed all the goats. When coming after young virgins, their bodies would be crucified, cut, open by the axe and left on the roads to allow all the villagers to see. According to an old man that lived on that island, the cult consists of satanic worshippers that suddenly came to the island and began performing their demonic rituals one day in the forest. Ever since then, there will always be strange noises coming from the forest. The sound of a goat, 
the screaming of a woman, or the stomping of a large creature. Many people did go missing, but no investigations conducted were able to find them, and so their cases all went cold. The villagers managed to, of course, stop the demon with their exorcism and their guns. They summoned a religious teacher to stop the demon, while a priest from the nearby church also aided the villagers. However, this account varies, as some say that she escaped into the forest with her cult, coming out each night to kill young girls. This could be the reason why most girls are given curfews, to protect them from the goat woman. I worked at a state park for a number of years on a 30-acre island that was mostly taken up by a 20-acre granite star-shaped fort from the 1820s. It was actively used through World War II. During the Civil War, it was used as a prison for Confederate maritime officers and political prisoners. Sounds creepy, right? It was. Only a few staff would stay overnight, and some nights I was there alone. The staff stayed in the upstairs of a brick building that was built about 1900. The upstairs had been converted into staff housing sometime in the 1960s, with five or six bedrooms, a kitchen, a small living room, and a big storage area. Two of the bedrooms were original to the place. The back stairs that led to the living quarters were wooden and old and loud when you walked up them. It was a big building, but when someone was walking up the stairs, you could basically hear it through the entire place. Back in 2006, another coworker and I were hanging out in the workshop downstairs at night, having a couple of drinks and listening to the stereo until bedtime. We were the only two people on the island. I woke up at about 2 a.m. and I could hear my partner walking down the stairs. I didn't think much of it, because sometimes we would forget to lock the main door before bed, and one of us would get up in the night to do it. In the morning, when we were making coffee, I said, Hey, did we forget to lock the door? I heard you going downstairs in the night. He looked at me and said, I thought that was you. That was our introduction to the stair ghost. It actually became so common that it wasn't even spooky anymore. It was just kind of like, oh, there's the stair ghost again. Also, when I brought it up to a woman who had worked there for many years, she was like, oh yeah, the stair ghost. Like it was nothing. A few years later, I was alone on the island in the off-season, when the park was closed, but it was during the day. I had just woken up and was in the kitchen when I heard someone coming up the stairs. I figured that the labor crew must have arrived for the day and someone was coming to talk to me. So the very clear, loud steps get to the top landing and stop. I'm waiting for the door to open, but it never does. So after a minute, I go over and open it. Nothing. I walk to the front of the building and look out at the pier. No boat. Nobody else was there, and the labor crew never came out that day. I know that was a lot of words for relatively little, so I'll leave you with one more story from this place, though I do have some more. Another of my co-workers was staying out there by herself, but she had her dog with her, a very mellow golden retriever. She said that at about 2 a.m., which was the time that most of the really weird crap would happen, her dog woke up and started barking fervently at the door to the bedroom. This obviously freaked her out, so she figures maybe he has to pee or something. She opens the door and her dog runs out into the hallway. It's one long hallway with bedrooms on one side and a storage area on the other, and the dog is running up and down the hallway peeing and crapping while running and barking like it was completely terrified of something. 
I never did have a good feeling in that place, though I also never heard of anything terrible happening in that particular building. There were deaths on the island, of course. Who knows, it was a farm before the government bought it, and Native Americans used it for thousands of years before that. So, who knows what it could have been. I'm not sure we'll ever know. In every city, there is a place that local residents are aware of. Whether it's a home, an office, an abandoned building, or a park that everyone has heard the rumors about, there is always something haunted. The story begins with a murder, a suicide, or some tragic death, and decades later, tales circulate of the paranormal activity within the area. Some believe while others scoff. But, either way, everybody knows of the place. I want to share with you the haunted history of Paveglia Island. Paveglia is a small, 17-acre island located in the Venetian Lagoon between the cities of Venice and Lido. In the past few decades, the island has taken upon the reputation of being one of the most haunted locations on Earth. Paveglia holds many tales of paranormal activity, going back for centuries. Local residents refused to set foot on the island, believing that they would be cursed by those who haunt it. The history of Paveglia is a dark one, shrouded in death. There are beliefs that the Romans had used it to isolate victims of the plague and the mentally ill. The first recorded settlement on the island was in 460 AD, of people fleeing the invading barbarians on the mainland. Over the centuries, Paveglia was the scene for many battles as people sought to raid or control it. During the Middle Ages, the island was designated as a quarantine area and a burial site for those who contracted the Black Death. Over the next few centuries, Paveglia served as a fort storage of shipment goods, and continued as an isolation station for those infected with the plague. In the 1920s, the island was set up as a hospital for the mentally ill and the elderly. Soon, stories started to emerge of patients encountering ghosts along with accounts of being possessed. There is the legend of a doctor who conducted medical experiments on the hospital's residents that was driven insane by the spirits to committing suicide. In 1968, the facility was closed and abandoned. Today, the island has been deemed as one of the most haunted places on the planet. Historical researchers estimate that more than 100,000 people died on Paveglia in its history and many of those souls are believed to still reside there. Locals won't go there, and the fishermen steer clear of its waters. It's said that a few fishermen had caught human remains in their nets. The few paranormal investigators that braved Paveglia had reported encountering a lot of paranormal activity, with claims of being attacked by unseen forces. In 2014, the Italian government sold the island to a developer in hopes that the island could be made into a resort. Currently, rumors on the internet have said that the workers sent to survey the island had an experience and refused to return. I come from a remote island called Rendova, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another one called Tetepare. The story of Tetepare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like the villagers fled the island to come to neighboring islands such as my own, here we are a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it is known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. 
If you are looking for cool remote places to travel, I highly recommend it. The interesting part of Tetapare for me was why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in those days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals that are easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So, the villagers fled to get away from the sickness. However, the island is known to be very big. So, realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the island. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island Rendova arrived on Tetapare to fight. However, upon arrival, they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetapare people were gone. To leave so hastily, and to not even properly bury your dead, is a really weird thing. Because it was back in those days, the first thought was that a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against better judgment. In due time, they also fled, because the spirit that had decimated the population of the Tetapare people apparently attacked the newly set upon villagers there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologes the tourists come to visit at. Now in the present day, we go to Tetapare to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious because it is believed that the island is still extremely wild, and because of the lack of humans, that spirits run amuck there. I have some weird stories about going hunting there, but in any case, Tetapare is a completely mysterious island. I am located in the twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. There is generally a culture of supernatural entities and folklore that is present in everyone that lives in the country. I've always encountered ghosts periodically in my life, but two days ago I saw something that really disturbed me. I was by myself in my kitchen window at around 2.30 a.m. I live in a three-story apartment building, and I live on the third floor. Located just outside my window, about 150 meters away, is a church that is also three stories, with the bottom level being the church, and the other parascending levels seem like a house. I was looking out of my window, onto the windows of the church, when I saw the silhouette of what seemed to be a man on the top level of the church. I began to peer at this thing, and upon staring at it, it moved from facing west and slowly turned south, staring directly at me. Then, suddenly, it backed up and seemed to materialize into the wall behind it, like it melded into it. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I saw. I have no thoughts on what it might be. I'm also getting nightmares frequently these days. I don't know if they're connected or not. These events took place in British Columbia in the summer of 2018, June and July to be precise. The events that I'm going to describe took place in two different locations. The first occurrence was by Gold River, near the Mawachat First Nation. The second was by Cathedral Grove. My buddy and I were spending the summer on the island. We were staying in Royston, where we both work. We decided to go spend a weekend in the wilderness. We planned to go rock climbing all day by Gold River, and in the evening, find a quiet spot to stargaze. The first part of the day was uneventful, beautiful, and sunny, 
we decided to camp by Gold River Boat Launch. For those unfamiliar, it's at a dead end. The only way to go farther is to take a ferry. There's nothing around except trees, valleys, the sea, and an abandoned little parking lot, which nature has slowly taken over. The only civilization nearby is right across our improvised camping spot, the First Nation of Mawachat. We went to bed at about 2 a.m. It was a perfect night. Not a sound, not a cloud, and a lot of stars. It was beautiful. Now here comes the interesting part. Not long after we went into our sleeping bag in the tent, we heard the distinct noise of monkeys. Literally, it sounded like chimpanzees, like we were at the zoo. We both heard it, and it was loud and distinct. It gave us goosebumps. We knew it was impossible because there's no such thing around there. We tried to rationalize it. Initially, we thought it could have been birds we weren't used to, or some small animals, maybe. The sound repeated itself about three times, and then nothing. Everything returned to its quiet state. We've talked to a few locals who'd been staying on the island for a long time about the incident, and we couldn't get a straight answer. About a month later, we went to Cathedral Grove and spent an afternoon there with friends. By the end of the evening, around 7 p.m., we heard the same weird chimpanzee sounds. It seemed like the sound was following us. It went on a few times again and then went quiet. We got kind of creeped out and we left. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced something similar, but it was certainly interesting. Just to give you an idea of who I am, I am a 13-year-old, able-minded girl. I've never been suspected of any sort of mental illness, and I have no medical problems other than asthma and tinnitus. I was born in Arizona. I currently live on a very small Caribbean island that I will not be sharing the name of for privacy reasons. I am a science-based individual. Last night at about 10 p.m., it got really windy all of a sudden, which was odd considering that it hadn't been stormy at all. When I looked out at the ocean, it was flat, smooth as silk. I decided to ignore what my gut was telling me, and my father and I went outside. What I saw will stick with me for the rest of my life, however much longer that will be, which, due to what I've seen, I don't think will be much longer. We saw three red lights in the sky, at the top of the mountain. Of course, because of how stubborn my father is, he told me that it was probably some kind of military craft, Dutch marines or something. But once we went back inside and told my mother, she believed a portion to each of our stories. My father, who believed it was just the military doing some sort of training, and me, who believed it was a UFO, of the words true nature that is, simply an unidentified flying object. Whether it was from another country or another world, I wasn't sure. And my mother, well, she believes that it was some kind of government spy or experiment sort of thing. I found my mother's estimate more likely than my father's, until about 30 minutes ago. I saw someone, well, something. I'm not sure what it is or was. It was on top of one of the flat points on the mountain. Subsequent to us seeing the lights up on the mountain, I asked my friend if she saw the lights too. She said that she did. We're planning on hiking the trail that goes around the island to check it out. We're thinking about waiting until something more major happens until we investigate the situation in the off chance that my father is correct. Update number one, May 26th of 2020. Today I was hiking for one of my school clubs and I saw some blood on the trail. Maybe goat blood? I'm not sure what the blood was from, but I have a feeling that it's related to that thing I saw in the sky. Update number two, May 27th, 2020. 
I just found out that three goats that are on a Caribbean goat farm sort of thing are missing. I think that something is eating them. Update number three, May 31st, 2020. I spoke to an archeologist here because I wanted another adult's opinion. He told me that there's a certain legend on certain islands that every 177 years, red lights will appear in the sky or mountain and things emerge from the mountain and will eat and drink and do all that they need to do to survive. He said if they're real, they're more like demons or spirits and won't go away until they're stopped. But they can only be stopped and seen and interacted with by certain groups of people of their choice. It seems that they have chosen teenagers to fight them off. I hope this doesn't end bad for us. I can only hope. Update number four, June 1st, 2020. Today at around eight, I was sitting in my room doing homework and I heard a tapping sort of sound, like something was on my roof. All of a sudden, I heard a screeching sound and the tapping was over. I was too scared to go outside and look. Final update, June 2nd, 2020. Today I went hiking for my school group and two of my friends walked up past the part of the trail where we were supposed to stop at. When we were all walking back down, one told me that she saw a dark-skinned woman, like a native or Hispanic woman but on the darker side, hiding in the bushes. She said that she didn't recognize this woman, which they would have if they were a local. Our airport and the ferries are all shut down, so nobody can get on the island. And my other friend told me that when he walked up, he heard a voice speaking almost in a whisper, and what he thought sounded like a native language to the Caribbean. I found a pile and shrine and altar sort of thing slightly off the trail, and we all agreed not to tell anybody just for the sake of convenience. We're keeping in close contact on WhatsApp and Snapchat. If anybody knows what's going on or has any suggestions or ideas, please let me know. My girlfriend and I went camping this summer on Mears Island. We didn't know too much about the island, aside from the fact that it has some of the best old growth forests in British Columbia, and that there's the campground and hostel and a small village there. When we got there, we went exploring and felt fine checking out the abandoned cars and rotting docks, as well as going inland along the waterways. We decided to go check out the lake around dusk since we were told that there was a boardwalk and a boat available for use. As we walked there in high spirits, we listened to the birds. It was a quick walk, only 15 to 20 minutes from the campsite. Once we hit the lake, the atmosphere changed, however. All animal noises ceased. It was complete silence. It was very eerie. At the time, nobody vocalized anything, but my girlfriend and I later discussed the experience and both agreed that we felt uneasy and in danger. We were with a third who I didn't ask the feelings of. I didn't feel comfortable going out on the boat, so I stayed on the dock. My girlfriend and the third person with us went out for a few minutes but felt too creeped out and paddled back quickly. Nighttime had fallen and we decided that it was time to head back to camp since I know silence generally equals predators. We quickly walked back and once we passed the threshold of where we had originally stopped hearing all the noises, animals and birds could be heard in the distance. It was a quiet walk back as we were intent to listen for anything behind us. I know it doesn't sound very scary or eventful. I figured it was probably a black bear or a cougar, but I've encountered those before and I've never felt threatened by one, particularly not in advance. Cougars could definitely be the reason, though. They said that the big cats stay farther away than that. I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that today 
I learned that the island is a Bigfoot sighting hotspot and has a good deal of First Nations lore about wild men and Sasquatch, and the thought creeped me out. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience of not really encountering anything, but feeling like you're on the verge? I live in an old house, about 30 to 40 years old. It was built by my family. At one point after it was finished, there was some kind of conflict between my family and some other people, and someone from the other family basically cursed the heck out of it and wished everybody in my family bad things. At least, that's what I was told. Great start. Over the years, my family members, especially my dad, have been saying how there's a shadow figure in the living room in certain places. It was described as a black shadow with a long tail. My dad said that when we were little, my brother and I were running up the stairs and that he saw the shadow following us. I never saw it, but I can feel when something or someone is in my presence. There are also quite a few things that I've experienced as a child in this house but I'll skip those for now to not make this too long. Recently, a family member died and strange things have been happening. A few days after it was announced that they passed, my family was arguing and a bottle fell over on the table. I don't know if my grandpa accidentally hit it with his elbow or what, but it fell and broke. A few smaller things have also happened, but something that I'll probably remember forever is when we were sitting at the kitchen table, talking. Out of nowhere, the range hood turned on by itself. To turn it on, you have to reach all the way to the top of it and move a little hook thing. It can't turn on by itself. It wasn't a malfunction. Someone or something turned it on. Today, I finished dinner and went to my room and the handle of my window was set straight when it's set straight, the window fully opens, and I never open my window like that. Before I went to eat, I left the window half opened, with the handle facing up. It freaked me out. I asked all of my family members, and nobody had been in there. I checked the whole house, but nobody unfamiliar was there. My room's balcony is also kind of connected to the garden, so anybody who's in the garden can get onto my balcony and into my room. That gets me so paranoid, especially in the summer, when it gets hot in my room and I fully open my windows, that I'm very cognizant about the windows. I know that it wasn't open. Any animal and anybody can enter without me even knowing. So that's why I only ever keep them at half, unless I'm in the room. I believe that more than one bad spirit is in this house. I don't believe all the spirits are bad, or have bad intentions, but at least one is. I don't know what they are or why these things keep happening, but they just keep happening. My story goes back to September 2019, when I visited my girlfriend who lives in Japan. We decided to go to Shizuoka Prefecture, in the countryside, in a hotel that looked like a ryokan. We couldn't have a big bed, so we had to sleep in two single beds. My girlfriend heard a sound like a whisper, coming from the bathroom, and started to feel anxious about it, but didn't tell me, for fear of scaring me. We fall asleep in each single bed after a really long day of bicycling in the surrounding mountains. I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning in full sleep paralysis state. It's not my first time, so I know what I have to do. Calm down and try to wake myself up by talking, or at least trying. For people familiar to sleep paralysis, you often feel looked at by a shadow 
and its presence slowly creeps up on you. My girlfriend, who was already anxious, woke up to see me blabbering some sound and making a scary face as I struggled to speak. She freaked out so much and it took at least a minute before I managed to wake myself up. So I asked her why she didn't try to wake me up. She said that the sound she heard made her so scared that she thought a spirit had possessed me and was trying to reach out to her. I told her where the shadow I saw in my dream came from and she told me that the sound she'd heard earlier came from the same place. We were so convinced it was an actual spirit in the room that we couldn't fall back asleep before sunrise, and we had to share a single bed for the rest of the night. I try to rationalize it and think that the sound came from another room, but no clients were staying close to us, and that she freaked out because I was having sleep paralysis and it's normal to see a shadow when that happens. But something really mysterious happened in that hotel, and we will definitely remember that experience. Back in 2013, I was teaching English in Shukugawa Hyogo, Japan for a year. It was truly a dream come true. Well, my English Center's latest class got out at about 10.30, and with it being Japan, I felt completely safe walking home along the Shukugawa River so late at night. Along my walk, I had to pass under the JR Kobe line and would pass a small Buddhist temple as I came out from under the bridge. Now, I had done this walk dozens of times by now, and nothing scary, let alone mildly unnerving, had ever happened. It was late March, so the weather was cool and comfortable. However, I noticed that as I drew closer to the temple, it got cooler. Cool enough for me to zip up my hoodie and shiver. As I was coming up the path, I heard the distinct sound of someone praying at the altar. The small gong or bell was rung, a 5 yen coin clattered at the altar box, and two claps to announce the prayer's presence to the gods were heard. I stopped for a brief second, thinking it was weird that somebody was out so late to say a prayer, but I shrugged it off and moved on. Turning the corner, I expected to see somebody at the altar, but it was empty. I froze. There was absolutely no way that somebody could have prayed that fast and bolted off without me hearing them along the gravel path. It was then that I noticed how still the night was. No bugs or birds, no sounds of the city, and the river to my left sounded muted. The feeling of being watched and unwelcomed washed over me. Slowly, I began to move, the temple now to my back. I took just a few steps before I heard the bell the coin, and the two claps. Fear gripped me. I broke out into a cold sweat as the shadows of the trees seemed to grow dark and deep. I gathered my nerves and anxiously turned to face the temple. Nothing but a vacant temple. Slowly I turned and started walking again. And then I heard two claps clear as day right in my left ear. Needless to say, I bolted the rest of the way home. After that night, I avoided passing by that temple whenever I worked the later classes and opted to just take the long way home. When I was a little girl of about 10 or so, I would always go shopping with my aunt for my birthday. But this particular time was a little different. She wanted me to stay the night and then go shopping the next day. I agreed to do this because who doesn't love going shopping with your aunt as a kid? I was always creeped out by her house for the longest time before I stayed that night. My dad and brother have had experiences before me 
They always camped out in the backyard in the woods. She had a big place, a house, a barn, a pool, even a pond, and lots of land. Sounds perfect, right? Anyway, they said that they saw a fog surrounding the house. Not the barn or anything else, but just the house. Creepy. And they also heard things in the woods, too. Yes, I am thinking what you're thinking, it was most likely animals. The fog was harder to explain. Either way, I figured that they were just trying to scare me, so I didn't think too much of it when the opportunity to stay there at night came up. Let's get on to that experience. I was up in the bedroom, right at the top of the stairs. If you walked straight up the stairs, you could walk straight into the bedroom. The catch to the bedroom is that it had a baby gate on it, so it was very hard to get in and out quickly. There was a home office to the left of the stairs, and then to the right, there was like another living room area, with an old-time bedroom connected to it with dolls and glass tea sets. Oddly enough, that's the room that I felt the safest in. Off of the living room area was a long hallway that led to my aunt and uncle's room. I was laying in bed watching my favorite movie, Mary Poppins. It was at least 9 p.m. at night. Bedtime for a child like me, right? I fell asleep during the movie. I woke up with the TV off and to a room that was completely pitch black. The door was open and I could barely see the staircase leading down. I tried to close my eyes so that I wouldn't be so scared. But what happened next? I can never forget. I heard footsteps coming up the stairs and they weren't heavy, so I knew that they weren't my aunt or uncle. In fact, it sounded like a child walking up the steps. I hid under the covers and hoped that it would go away. The footsteps came all the way up the stairs, across the room, and stood right next to my bed. I tried very hard to be still and quiet. Finally, the entity turned away and I heard the little steps go back down the stairs. I was really relieved until I heard them ascend the staircase once more. I was so scared I wanted to scream for my aunt, but she was so far away she wouldn't have been able to hear me anyway. It came back into the room again. As I hid under the covers for the second time, it came and stopped by the other side of the bed, closest to me. I felt it tug on my blanket, and then it turned away and walked back down the stairs. So this time I got smart, or stupid. I don't know, you can decide that for yourself. Once I heard that it was far enough away, I jumped out of bed. I opened the baby gate and I ran all the way to my aunt and uncle's room and crawled into bed with them. Let me tell you, I scared the crap out of them. Once they finally made room for me, I got all cozy, but I couldn't sleep. Anyway, it was about a minute after I got into bed with them that I heard the baby gate slam. I was so terrified, but at least I was with my aunt and uncle. The next morning, I woke up in their bed alone upstairs. Now, you might not believe this, but I don't really care if you do or not, but I woke up to three scratches on my chest and they were very painful. To this day, nobody really believes me that it happened, besides my best friend. This event still haunts me. I don't really talk to people about it because nobody ever believes me and I don't want to get ridiculed, but I just had to vent. Whatever it was, I still don't know. A demon posing as a child? Probably. Something evil? That's for sure. But I guess I'll never really know.